so uh, let's start the conference. Uh, I'd love to welcome everyone. Uh, unfortunately, now we're having a bit of issue with the uh, uh, with the projector. So uh, we're going to solve it in a minute. Anyway, I'd love to welcome one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, ten guests online and uh, other 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 five guests uh, in the room. Um, my name is Jan, and uh, I'm the organizer of the conference. Uh, we're going to begin with uh, with a program. According to the program, you might see, you might find on a, on a website, or if you are in the room, you may you may have it also printed. Uh, first of all, I would love to I would love to inform you that the, the conference takes all day, so you're absolutely welcome to join any part. Uh, also, I'd love to ask all presenters. Uh, to be to be to be to be sure to be connected at least ten minutes before beginning of their blocks. If they are pres presenting online, just to test connection, and each presentation should be around fifteen minutes, and then we've got ten minutes for discussion. That is the most or the main reason we are here to share our knowledge and to exchange some ideas. So uh, we're going to start with a welcome welcome uh, speech, welcome word from the from the. Head of the departments and uh, head of the conference, Jakub Vora. and then we're going to start a program. The uh, then we're going to start a program. The uh, keynote speakers and etc. If so, ladies and uh, gentlemen, I would like to open the new PhD conference uh, with the title "People City Transport." We have some technical issues with our projector, so I apologize. Uh, we need some. Uh, random uh, noise here around me. Uh, the conference is intended to support PhD students and young researchers in their initial scientific research activities. I would like to stress that we have active participants from numerous countries, Estonia, Sweden, Italy, United Kingdom, China, Poland, Norway, and even Czech Republic. This indicates that young researchers want to build international cross and cross disciplinary relationships. The teleconferences uh, technology makes such networking easier, of course. About half of, half of the presenters will present via internet. The conference is organized by the Department of Spatial Planning at Faculty of Architecture in Prague. Our department, in our department, we teach students of architecture about urban and regional planning, we are also involved in the study program of Smart Cities, which is run by the Faculty of Transportation Sciences. The department is also involved in a number of research activities in the field of quantitative analysis of urban systems. Now I would like to clarify this topic of the conference. The name of the conference is People City Transport. I will now try to explain what we mean by that. The first term, people, relates to the behavior of individuals and the way their behavior translates into the transportation demand. The transport is typically considered as a special activity which differs from other stationary non-transport activities. The majority of transport models in non-transport activities are considered exogenous and fixed in short term. However, exclusive focus on transport activities does not help in analyzing transport demand. I think, think, think how many considerations we have to make before executing the trip to some activity. We have to First, consider the importance of the activity in terms of benefits and costs of realizing or not realizing the activity, timing of activity, a linkage to other activities and the potential of shifting the activity in time. We also consider using the telecommunication instead of transportation for bodies. Then there are various constraints in decision making, such as duties with respect to other people that results in the need to coordinate our activities with others. The available means of transportation and monetary as well as non-monetary costs related to the trip play also a significant role in our decisions. And then there are also our personal characteristics, such as health, values, preferences, risk perception, and aversion. 
In the end, the transport activity does not necessarily need to be does not necessarily need to connect other activities, but it can be a goal in itself. It can be considered to be just recreational or social activity. Point I want to make is that we have an activity system in which transport and non-transport activities are interdependent and cannot be isolated from each other. A modern activity-based models such as Matsin, developed by Mitte uh, Hans Zürich, TU uh, Berlin, adopted this holistic approach, and you may have some other examples of similar approaches. The second term in the name of the conference is CIDIC. The social, economic, and environmental impacts of urban traffic are unequally distributed across space, time, and society. One of the solutions proposed by runners is the city of short distances, where the proper density and mixed use is expected to decrease our need to be mobile and to choose more sustainable means of transport. However, this ideal model has its economical and social and we also see some political limits. We will have several presentations on this topic today. The urban structure can be conceived to be a physical fixed container for activities. The street became contested space in which the motorized traffic clashed with other activities. Unfortunately, the electrification and automation of the transport does not make the street bigger, and we will need to find additional solutions to traffic congestions in our street. We will hear about this topic in a while from our first guest speaker. The last term in the name of the conference is transport. Here we mean primarily the transport means, infrastructure, and technology. We should critically assess the impacts of new technology on both people and city. Does the autonomous vehicles encourage the urban sprawl, increase the traffic in the streets, increase the social segregation and weaken the territorial communities and place identities, or just the opposite? I am very pleased that following presentations will tackle many of the mentioned topics, mentioned topics, and I'm, I'm looking forward to interesting discussions. At the end, I would like to thank you for joining us, sharing with us your research expertise and time. I would like to thank especially to Jan Pittner here present, because uh, he's the main person behind the conference, and also Veronika schindler and my colleagues in my in, in Department of Spatial Planning, and I hope you will enjoy the conference. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, welcome again to those who just locked in. So sorry again for some technical issues from the beginning. Anyway, now we should be live. We should uh, everyone hopefully do it. The, the speech of Jakubra, the head of the Department of the Conference, and. Uh, now, according to schedule, we could start a bit earlier. More minutes we'll get for the discussion to invite the first keynote speaker, which is uh, Wojciech Nowotny from our Faculty of Transport uh, Engineering. And uh, yeah, hello. <laughs> so uh, good morning, everyone, again. Uh, thank you for having me at this conference and, uh, you know, to be your today morning's keynote speaker. Um, my name is Wojciech Novotny. I work as a uh, freelance uh, transport planner and consultant. I help to the cities and towns uh, uh, on how to solve their transport problems. And, I, I'll, and I'm also an academic here in uh, CTU in Prague, Faculty of Transportation Scientist, focusing on sustainable mobility, uh, public transport, active mobility, and, and street design. And um, I know the title of my, uh, of my speech today is Shared Space and Sustainable Mobility, but I would, like to, I would like to start with the theme of sustainable mobility, because, you know, it's a, it's a really complex issue, but I would like to share some ideas um, mm -hmm. with you. Maybe we can start this. What is what sustainable mobility actually means? Is it this? Well, 
I don't think so, because the sustainable mobility isn't about technology or type of type of engine. I think in, I think it goes down to the spatial efficiency, energy efficiency, and public transport behavior itself. So um, every city, every town, every town, every urbanized environment has a transportation system uh, consists of four basic means of transport. It's public transport, cycling, walking, and uh, and car traffic. And I suppose we can agree that three of these types of transport are both appropriate in terms of uh, city structure and urban environment and sustainable in terms of uh, use of energy, use of space, and uh, ecology. So. Generally speaking, I think that these three types of modes of transport should be preferred in urban environment, and that is implications uh, implications for how we design the city transportation system itself, but how we design the streets and public spaces because it's the infrastructure actually for for public transport system as well. Uh, the key. Uh, the key, for my opinion, is is mode of share. So uh, you know how much each mode each mode is used, and uh, I think that we have to take measures to ensure that the proportion of uh, walking, cycling, and uh, public transport use is as high as possible. For example, Prague, Prague's strategic goal in model share is increasing the aggregate share of public transport and active mobility up to 81%. Uh, so so um, that's it. I think that so, that makes the city transport system really, really sustainable. And this brings us to the question of more choice. Because uh, travel behavior depends on mode choice, of course, and mode choice criteria uh, usually uh, consist of travel speed and travel time, re reliability of uh, the transport mode, price, and something I call pleasantness of the journey. Uh, you know how it's appropriate, how we feel, if it's comfortable, uh, etc. And in the term, in the context of urban and transport planning. Uh, I think we have to understand the principle of induced and reduced demand. Induced demand, the, the principle is used uh, usually in the context of uh, road, road capacity or road planning. And basically it says this, who built roads, harvest cars. In other words, uh, in other words expanding road capacity and parking capacity attracts additional road traffic. But it works at reserve as well. So when improving public transport, it will bring more public transport trips and more public transport users. And designing better streets will get to more people walking and cycling. And of course, you know, using the public transport, you have to walk to the bus stop, uh, etc. So uh, I think that this, this could work. And actually, it turns out that the standard tool for changing the travel transport behavior is combination of reducing the road capacity and reducing of number of public spaces while offering a suitable and sustainable alternation or alternative uh, in form of athletic public transport and uh, quality conditions for pedestrians and cyclists. Um, there are many examples of um, practice uh, of good practice in uh, all around the world. I personally, I like this. This is Bordeaux, France, and um, this is the state before the reconstruction of Garden River embankment. And this is the state after the reconstructions. And as you can see, the, the parking lot disappeared, uh, the many lanes for car traffic disappeared, but, but uh, there was introduced a new tramway line a uh, new, uh, new uh, cyclist infrastructure, and it really unlocked the potential of uh, quality public space. And I think that this is what we have to do, actually. So um, if there is a message for you from me today, uh, the message, uh, this message is this. Implementing 
urban development, street design, and transport system in a way that naturally supports sustainable modes of transport. This is the greatest challenge for contemporary urban planners and transport engineers. This will mean real change towards sustainable, sustainable mobility. So what does it mean in practical level? Uh, in my point of view, it's an urban development oriented towards sustainable mobility. It's about polycentricity of the urban environment and implementing the concept of the 15 minute city uh, in general. Uh, it's uh, quality public transport. Public transport has to be the backbone of the sustainable mobility and uh, backbone of the multimodal transport system when you know, bike sharing, etc., are integrated in the public transport system. And also it's about that the layout of public spaces uh, be, should be such that suitable, sustainable modes are naturally, uh, naturally uh, have a natural priority. In other words, if you can walk, you have to go straight away, uh, quality public, uh, quality walking conditions, etc., etc. But if you take a car, it could be or should be a little bit complicated for you. And of course, attractive, safe, and living streets and public spaces. You know, what street do we want to live on? You, you can choose, of course. So, uh, this brings us to the shared space because I said I think the shared space could be a, a solution for many cases and many many locations. I like to say that shared space is actually a return uh, to the nature perfect uh, not, I'm sorry uh, nature perception of the street as a multifunctional public space, and this would take many forms, but. Uh, yeah, shared space or shared streets is a successful transport and urban planning approach to the street design proven in many number uh, of countries in Europe and around the world. Uh, it's based on integrated use of the street or public space by all types of users. It's a tool for traffic calming and at the same time improving the quality of public spaces and of course promotion pedestrian and cycling traffic, but without need to... I'm very sorry. I just okay. noticed that maybe we are not sharing the screen, oh. <laughs> which is a bit pity. So I'm just gonna make sure we share the screen. So, so again, yes, uh, the, fo the focus of this uh, of the design is on the people, not uh, the vehicles, and this corresponds with a holistic approach uh, on the creation of public spaces. Uh, I think this illustration by Car Free France is really telling. Uh, the shared space minimizes the segregation between. Uh, types of users uh, of the public space, and this is done by removing features such as curbs, road markings, traffic signs, traffic lights, uh, etc. And uh, this, this will naturally, naturally remove the segregation effect of the roadway. Uh, you know, the pedestrians can uh, can walk throughout the area, and um, it calms traffic down, of course, and reduces speed differential and introduces eye contact between uh, between users uh, of the public space. And this is something we call productive chaos. You know, it's a natural way human beings exist, actually, and it brings uh, and brings also a higher uh, safety uh, when you moving in uh, in the space. So. And that is also, uh, you know, uh, friendly to the sustainable modes of transport. So in general, shared space means improving improvement of the quality and architectural level of public spaces, promotion, sustainable mobility, elimination of segregation, effect of road traffic, and increase uh, increase safety. But does so, shared space fit in any street? Well, uh, no. Generally speaking, I think the shared space it, is typically used in the areas where are con this concentration of pedestrians. Uh, we, it's, it's there is a representative function of the public space, and we want the public space to be you know nicer and friendlier and uh, and more so, quality. Uh, let's say, and um, 
at the same time, we cannot or do not want to exclude car traffic. So uh, the typical so, locations could be these. It's uh, major city avenues and commercial streets, you know, with uh, many type of destinations, etc. This is the exhibition road in London. And uh, before it turns up, turns to the into the shared space, there were four lane road, highway, etc. Uh, could be squares and other representative public spaces. This is Brussels, for example, uh, railway station squares and public transport inventory interchange hubs. It's a typical area when there are many pedestrians and they want to go in desired lines. So uh, shared space is suitable of, uh, for these uh, for these areas. Maybe local streets with an active ground floor, of course. This is uh, this is Denmark, Copenhagen. Uh, preschool areas or school uh, campuses uh, or the intersections with the character of a square or maybe uh, narrow streets and small squares in the historic town centers. Uh, the areas are quite or locations are quite different, but uh, the principle stays the same, of course. So these are uh, the locations and it's um, for example, this example of good practice, uh, the Sonnenfels Plaza in Graz, Austria. Austria. It was the first shared space in Austria. Uh, 2010, I think, was realized. And you can see here how far uh, the quality of public spaces could go when uh, you turn it into the shared space. Uh, by the way, this 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 uh, black building is a building of the university. One one. Uh, one of the buildings of the Graz University, so there is a con there is exactly the the concentration of pedestrians, etc. But you can you can compare the state the state before and the state after, and I, I think we can agree that they, there is a huge, you know, uh, um, the, the space is really uh, now in a better quality than it was before. So shared space can many forms, uh, and it's proved differently in different countries. But the main principle still remain, and uh, I'll do it is well established principle in the world, and um, many countries have been applying for it many years. The shared space acquired shared space is quite a hot topic uh, in the Czech Republic because uh, the Road Act, uh, Czech legislation in general, and but especially the Road Act did not allow the design of shared space in Czech cities and municipalities until recently. And uh, so the Czechia has long uh, been deprived of the, this possibility of use of modern approach uh, to public spaces and streets and squares, etc. So together with Karl Hayek, he's uh, associate professor here at St. Ewell in Prague, uh, Faculty of Civil Engineering, uh, we uh, uh, together work on proposal for the implementation of shared space in the Czech uh, legislature and technical standards. Uh, and we started in 2020, and it really took a lot of effort. And you know, uh, uh, we need many partners to discuss it and uh, and foresee this this proposal. But luckily, uh, in the summer this year, uh, the Czech Parliament uh, passed an amendment, an amendment uh, to the Road Act that allows design the shared space in, in Czech Republic. So it will be possible here uh, in Czech Republic design streets in a shared space style uh, from January 1st, 2024. So it is new for Czech Republic, but I think uh, and I'm glad that uh, Czech Republic is among the developed countries in this sense. And I believe that the use of shared space uh, as an urban street design approach will develop in the Czech Republic as good as has already happened in many countries around the world. And uh, this will also support our move towards, towards um, sustainable mobility. So. So that's, that's all from me. Thank you very much.
Okay, thank you very much. And now I think no, you may you may remain there. Okay. I think it's a time we've got nice uh, fifteen minutes, so we can uh, have a discussion. It also applies for those who connected online. Uh, as I mentioned again, I'm sorry that you saw the half of slides uh, Wojtek presented. Anyway, I'm sure that the topic is very uh, very interesting. So anyone uh, can start. Uh, just unmute and say something or here in the room. It's up to you. Cool. Yes, okay. Uh, problems <laughs> and then Lukash. Okay. Um, I think that's a, uh, it's uh, it's really important to, for the Czech Republic to uh, to follow this uh, good practice path. And I'm wondering whether um, this uh, the time of this legislation uh has something to do with the European Union's uh, 655 and this uh, zero emission zones. Is there any connection here? Uh, no, <laughs> there is no connection because uh, the, the, implement, the, the amendment to the Road, Road Food Road Act, it wasn't prepared by government, mm -hmm. but it was the, the initiative of the members of parliament. So it was really independent on the transport policy of, of the state. Do you think uh, these two it, ideas it corresponds, yeah, of course, together? But, uh, you know, the process was really uh, different. Okay, thanks. Okay. Lukash? I do have a question regarding, uh, let, let, let's say, take as an example, the conversion uh, in Bordeaux you have shown mm -hmm. uh, with the refurbishment of the river uh, riverbank. Yeah. Is there an evidence of uh, changing land uses in these areas where there are actually these uh, conversions that take away uh, parking lots. Because I would assume that uh, if these places, they in some way could lose some of the accessibility. So maybe the place in terms of land use might convert, let's say from office use to something that it's now more competitive in the area, let's say like retail. Is there like evidence of this like a uh, consequence of changing uh, uh, transportation networks and subsequent changes yeah. in land use? Uh, well, I, I'm not aware about uh, the changing in the land use. Uh, there is evidence uh, about changing the travel behavior concerning the trips to the city center. So, you know, there is evidence that the, the proportion of uh, public transport use increased and the car traffic use decreased. And it's logical because, you know, when you uh when you don't get to the city center by car so easily and there is no parking lot etc so you you don't use cars and you use tramway and uh in bordeaux there was the case that uh the tramway is new there so it was communicated by by the city council that okay we we uh we cancel the parking lots but you can take tram it's fast and reliable etc so the transport behavior really changed uh, because of the, the refurbishment of the management. And I saw a study of, I, I'm not sure which, which uh, university in France did it, but I saw the study that the, um, uh, in the city center, there was, um, uh, you know, um, the local economy grows. It made coffees and restaurants, etc. thanks to the the shift of in the transport behavior. Yeah, I think these evaluations are nice because because m m maybe in Bordeaux it was successful because I can also imagine alternative scenario that actually you do the refurbishment mm -hmm. and let's say if there are some jobs, they find it not accessible anymore. So they suburbanize to edge cities. So uh, so I think I think these kind of evaluations might be uh, super valuable yeah. actually to to find out if there are contexts where these intervention uh, interventions work and other contexts where where they don't. Yeah. Uh, as I said, I have no evidence in 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 this particular case in Bordeaux. So, but I uh, I understand what you're saying. That you know there is no evidence in in Bordeaux here. Uh, okay. Uh, just reminder for those who are online, if you'd love to ask a question, please raise your hands. It would be the easiest way. Or you can type your question to the to the chat. And now, uh, Veronica. Thank you. Uh, thank you for very complex uh, overview about the sustainable mobility planning. And I am a planner, spatial planner. 
and I have a question to the beginning of your presentation mm -hmm. that you started with the uh, that the the way to the sustainable mobil mo mobility starts uh, in the level of spatial planning, mm -hmm. in the level of the distribution of activities mm -hmm. in the area. Yeah. Uh, do you know or do you think maybe you have your your personal personal uh, personal meaning or you know because you you work in Prague that uh, the city of Prague uh, make or realize very specific steps or ways to implement the basic principles of sustainable mobility planning in, in their instruments of strategic planning because you mentioned for example the the approach to to a polycentric city a 15 minute city uh, do you know that Prague makes some specific steps to implement those those approaches in the real environment uh, yeah. in Prague in this level of of planning well it's a little bit complicated question <laughs> and uh, on many levels I think Prague uh, has a strategic plan and mm -hmm. and a sustainable urban mobility plan and uh, there are quite you know good strategy documents uh, and they put stress on this on this type uh, of uh, you know space planning as and urban planning etc but the executive mm -hmm. of this and about the execution of this is complicated there is a institute of uh, Prague transport uh, sorry uh, urban planning uh, but uh, Prague has also 57 uh, you know um, I would say uh, districts. districts yes, and districts are really autonomous uh, in Prague. So coordination of urban planning and urban development around the Prague is for the central level really complicated. And I think, in my opinion, it's one of big problems of Prague because if the central level of the of the whole city cannot influence the real steps in the in the area or in the urban development we can go anywhere because you know there is no executive instrument to to do this right to do it right actually but the Prague had its metropolitan plan which is pretty the let you plan yes yes but the major you follow the discussion about the metropolitan plan or the, the process of uh not really not not me personally but so what i'm aware that the metropolitan metropolitan plan is like a framework because it's not uh, you know, it's not uh, an urban plan in a, in, in a way that other smaller cities have. So metro there is a metropolitan plan, but there will be a smaller urban plans for each of the city districts. So, okay. Is, could I just uh, continue with this? Yeah. Also a problem that uh, Czech spatial planning is mostly about land use planning or zoning in the US sense. And for instance, like uh, if in the metropolitan plan, you can employ some transport management tools. It would make uh, uh, the plan, let's say, more holistic or integrated. Yeah, I agree with that. And I, and I think that this could be made by a sustainable urban mobility plan, which these two plans have to correspond. That's that's the one uh, the one point. And the second point is that the metropolitan plan or urban planning is based on law. In Czech Republic, but the sustainable urban mobility plan is not. It's not. Uh, you know, there is. A, uh, I would say. Uh, I think. Windings. Yes. Yes. Exactly. So, and I think that's a problem because the public, the sustainable urban mobility plan, in my opinion, has to have the same status as a metropolitan plan or urban plan. Yes. Uh, just a. Uh, would you like to connect because I have one more question from the online. Okay. So okay. would you like to connect or is it a different question? So this thing. Then is it true? All right. Uh, I have a question in the chat here from uh, Zuzana Polakova. She asks, uh, will it be possible to draw anything on the road of shared sp spaces in the Czech Republic? That's yes. right. Will it be possible to draw anything on the roads? If Zuzana is here, you, maybe you can extend your question. Yes, I'm here. Uh, hello. Uh, I'm just asking because uh, in your references uh, there was a nice um, uh, 
colored lines on the shared space and something which is nice for a shared space to slow down the car traffic and so on. But I think that in Czech Republic, it's not possible now uh, on the roads uh, to draw like anything you want. <laughs> well, it's physically possible, at least. <laughs> but from that, yeah, it's uh, it's a complicated and uh, yeah, the, the fact is that uh, on the roadway you can you can't draw anything but the uh, the road markings in the Czech Republic and uh, but I, I think there is you know this um, there is no law about it uh, it's a you know established rule or something like that so I think I know we have to break it sorry <laughs> okay uh... yeah so 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 sorry so so it's, no, no. Uh, it's necessary to uh, do a big uh, transforming of public spaces. Yeah, I, I think Make so. Make a shared space. It's not yeah, possible exactly. to quick. It, 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 there's no quick way to transform the uh, the streets to shared spaces. Uh, no, because you know shared space uh, has to be done by uh, uh, by refurbishment or reconstruction of the the whole uh, street area, because um, it it doesn't work like you just uh, you just uh, install it. Uh, uh, the road sign, shared space, and that's it. Uh, yeah, yeah. But for example, for example, during COVID in Vienna, it was possible. Yeah, it was possible in many cities, and uh, yeah, you are right. But you know, here in Czech Republic, we are a little bit um, not so progressive in the, in that way. Uh, but I think we have, I I think we have to because that's uh, that's the only option to you know to move forward. Good. Uh, we have two more questions. One from Shimon. Okay, three more questions. We have seven minutes. Then we got from Louis online. She's raising uh, her hand. And then uh, then uh, Frederico. Okay. So Shimon. Okay. Um, I can't get to them, but especially two issues came to my mind. Uh, if you could go back to the slide uh, uh, where you've shown four different types of task orders. Let's say and third slides. And. Yeah, you mentioned that the goal is eighty one percent, the the share of uh, yes. uh, of this uh, public transport. Uh, and 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 yeah. So uh, the first question will be why exactly eighty one percent? And it's, it seems ambitious, but why eighty one? So this is the first issue. And uh, one small comment from from me. Uh, you said that public transport, cycling, and walk uh, walking. These are the modes uh, or uh, means of transportation uh, which are sustainable. It, mm -hmm. I totally agree with that. But I would like to say that public transport is as sustainable as sustainable are the sources of electricity. Yes. And, uh, my question is how does it look in the uh, in general public? Because in Poland, uh, it's, uh, we talk about this uh, sustainability, but technically, the electricity comes from the fossil fuels. Yeah. Uh, so it is not so uh, ecological as it should be. Yeah. Uh, in terms of public transport, there is, you know, uh, in Czech Republic, I don't know, I don't know exactly the energetical mix uh, of the Czech Republic, but we have, I think, about one third of uh, atomic uh, energy uh, and uh, about half of uh, fossil fuels right now. So you know, but I think it's. Uh, also, not only about the, the source of energy, and I totally agree with you, but uh, it's also about the efficiency of electro uh, of electro engine. You know, when you yes, uh, and uh, but it's not only about energy. It's also in a in an urban environment. It's also about uh, efficiency in use of space, and there is the public transport is uh, the most effective in this. Yes. So that's it. Eighty-one percent. Yes, I, I really don't know why exactly eighty-one percent uh, today or when the sustainable urban mobility 
plan was created, it was in 1917 or something like that, 2017 or something like that, that uh, the model share of uh, public transport and active mobility was about 70%. So it is 11% increase. I, I think really it's really ambitious. And uh, in my opinion, if city of Prague will not uh, take early board measures uh, to ensure that it's not reachable. <laughs> and I'm afraid the, the political reality in this city, you know, uh, don't really approve such a bold way of, uh, uh, of uh, reaching this, this goals. Okay, let's stop in politics. <laughs> no, no, it's okay. I was just kidding. Louis, your question. We've got three minutes, roughly. Yes, I. it's very much related and it continues with the politics. Um, <laughs> you mentioned <laughs> it continues with also the integration of uh, sustainable mobility plans before, because I think these shared spaces, as you showed them, really rely on actually pushing some cars out of these areas. And in places where there is not a regulatory framework yet, do you have any observations of what political arguments or moves need to be made? Because I think also thinking of the case in Tallinn where we're at, it's very difficult to convince the people who are actually in place to change something like this of moving and making the right moves to towards these shared spaces. So do you have any observations of what works or what arguments need to be made? Uh, I, uh, well, uh... It's, it's quite complicated, but I, I think my, my personal opinion is we have to work, work for politics. They uh, do do not use cars in a way to have to to the city council. You know, um, I, I I have a reservation. For example, in Austria, it really works the argument about safety of the school children and mobility of uh, school kids uh, while going to the school because for example the the Vorarlberg it's uh, one part of Austria the the western part of Austria and uh, Tyrol of course uh, they systemically systematically introduced shared space in the preschool areas and school campuses and the argument is always the same we have to uh, bring more safety for school kids and we would like to encourage school kids to uh, to come to school in a sustainable way by walking or cycling or you know etc. And you know the arguments with kids actually works. Good. Last question, Frederico. Yeah, I, I go very far. It's, uh, it's my question is more about like there are strategies to. Uh, you know, just handle with with the power dynamics of different uh, um, things of transport in the shared space. Uh, um, the example is easy. So car, the car have always, or, or in the majority of cases, uh, there's a difference of power between cars and other cars. But I can do the example of uh, now I live in Amsterdam, for example, and uh, where there are shared uh, streets for cars and bicycles. There's the, uh, for example, if you are cycling, you have the, uh, the, 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 the you are the most important person there because the signs say that. But how to handle it with, with the shared space? So how to deal with power dynamics? How to? I think it goes down to the design itself because you know you have to design the the area that. Uh, naturally calm down the traffic and not allows to uh, the car drivers drive fast or, or in a manner it's not appropriate in, in this space. So I think the key is the the the, the, the design and detail in, in detail of design of uh, streets or given streets, given square, etc. I think this this only only possible tool. You know, to, to design the streets in the way that supports naturally the behavior we want to uh, do uh, by the users of this uh, of the public space. Excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Wojciech, thank you very much for a very interesting presentation. Thank you all for questions and ask nice discussion. If you're in person, of course. You can try to grab Wojciech while he is leaving, I suppose, soon. <laughs>
Uh, anyway, now is the time to start to commence the first block of presentations. We're gonna start with Louis from uh, from I th where Louis, Louis, where you are actually in Tallinn now. I'm currently in Leipzig, but I'm still based officially in Tallinn. Yes, but I'm stuck in Leipzig, and I'm unfortunately <laughs> can't make it in person because of COVID. Right. Yes, Louis was about to join us in person. Unfortunately, she she, she the COVID's still existing, obviously, so <laughs> she's isolated. So never mind. We're gonna see our presentation online. So the floor is yours. Please try to keep 15 minutes and then we will have 10 minutes to, to discuss your presentation. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, all right. I'm sharing the screen and yes. can you just click? Yes. Okay. You can see. Perfect. Um, as I mentioned, my name is Luis. I'm a PhD student at the Tallinn university and the free university in Brussels, the French speaking. And, um, I'm in my fourth year of the PhD and. I started off with the question of what makes public transport as a public space. I think it links very nicely to the keynote that we just heard in the morning about shared spaces. Um, so I would like to present a few insights from this study. Um, so I started off with the question is public transport a public space? Um, there are some authors that argue that it's uh, kind of a mobile agora. It can be seen as almost like a communal public space where a lot of different people, a lot of strangers and a lot of people in the city come together. Um, a public space, however, is also or can be framed from a liberal notion as a space that is open and accessible to all. It has also been framed as a space that is a place where like civic engagement is fostered, where political discourse happened. Um, and it can be also understood more as a common good or a public service. So these are all the different notions that somehow come together when we think of public space. And I was wondering, or I was trying to explore in this thesis, how this relates to public transport. Um, so my main focus or my main aim was to understand what are the tensions that exist between planned and lived public space on the example of public transport. So how is public transport conceived? How is it planned for the users and how is it in contrast actually used and experienced by the users that use it mainly on a daily basis, but just in a more regular sense. I draw for this on the concept of mobility regimes, which is, a, which are kind of is an assemblage of systems that discipline or channel movement, space, behavior, and conduct by way of principle, norms, and rules. So for this thesis in general, I draw kind of on three strands of literature. One is the very broad literature that exists on public space. A second literature is kind of feminist perspective on social justice that highlight more the bodily and level of experiences and practices. And then the third one is the public transport literature and the kind of extension or the new emerging, rather new emerging new mobilities research. I have conducted three case studies uh, in the cities of Tallinn and Brussels, where I'm also based. And these are mostly qualitative research. So I'm not, uh, I don't have an engineering or a planning background, but um, I did these studies in the field of anthropology and geography. And I want to just give a few first insights into each of the case studies to then come back to discuss uh, the question of what makes public transport a public space. So um, the first study or the first research we did was within the research project that I'm based that is called Put Space. And we did a study of the experiences of public transport during the COVID-19 pandemic. There were two rounds of the study, one very much at the beginning of the outbreak in European cities and one about a year later. Um, we did the study in the local languages where the project teams were based. So in English, German, French, Dutch, Estonian, Swedish, and Russian. We had an online survey as well as follow-up interviews, qualitative interviews in each of the cities. So these were several German cities in Tallinn, in Stockholm, and in Brussels. And the important thing about this study is that we actually focused on the qualitative accounts of the personal experiences and the perceived atmospheres. So we wanted to hear how people perceive this space of public transport during 
the outbreak of the COVID pandemic or in the following waves of the pandemic. And we gained some very interesting insights on the atmospheres and the sociality. So the first thing we understood is that there is an increased sensitivity or even a hypersensitivity of the passengers towards their material surroundings, but also towards other passengers. The experience that they described were not only eeriness or fear, but also calm. So the top right one, this is the first word cloud from the first round of the survey, where we can see that actually distancing, tense, suspicious it are very big, but also a lot of people attributed the atmosphere to a quiet, a calm, or an kind of emptiness and a cleanliness. So there is a broad range of experience or atmospheres that people actually perceive. We also observed that there are new norms of what is considered to be appropriate behavior that are increasingly based on distancing. And there's also an increased mutual control among passengers. Um, and that the focus shifted a bit from distancing to mask wearing. And this is the comp comparison between the two world clouds that I put here. So the first round really has this distance and calm in the center, while the second word cloud on the bottom shows that masks and humans, these are the, the Estonian words, so, um, are more in the center of people's attention in the second wave. We also found some interesting social economic disparities amongst the users and the experiences that they attribute to it. So um, one of them on top is the ability to avoid public transport. We see that people with higher income and also higher education level, if we compare it to the other factors, were more likely to actually avoid public transport during the first wave um, of the pandemic. While people with lower income had less uh, um, availability of maybe other transport means at home or less the chance to choose to work from home and stay at home too. And similarly, or like in, in interesting regards, also the comparison of safety perception, we found that people who actually use public transport more regularly find it less or find it more safe than other public spaces that they had to compare in terms of um, contagion of the virus. Um, so we can come back to this later. And then I did my second study was on the question of fares or fare controls and evasion in Brussels. Um, for this, I did an in-depth interview with 27 evaders as well as observational studies in metro stations in Brussels and in the online environments. Um, this helped me to understand that fair evasion are kind of forms of bottom-up contestations of fair inequalities. However, in the existing literature, they're usually framed as uh, causing economic losses for transport company, a result of modernization and automatization of fair controls, a cause for vandalism or crime, a dysfunctional customer behavior, and free riding as kind of a breach of the social contract that is supposed to be um, upheld in the public spaces. So these observations and interviews with fair evaders gained some very interesting insights into how this space are used and practiced. So um, as the small sketch that we did at the, at the bottom of this slide shows, there are various practices that fair evaders adopt. This can be jumping, climbing over these fair gates. It can also be kicking some doors or bumping which means going through with another passengers. But they also use a variety of online platforms to inform each other, for example, about the real time, um, in real time where fare controls are taking place. The motives for evading are much more diverse. Most of the people I have talked to actually do it for financial reasons that they cannot afford the transport tickets, but also sometimes rational opportunistic reasons or ideological reasons that they are not happy with the services they offer. Fair evasion practice are very intense embodied engagement with the infrastructure and they actually cause encounters between strangers in these places. And they need a very in-depth knowledge around the transport networks. I will come back to this also at the end again. And the third study was on care mobilities in Tallinn. I did a study um, with 22 regular transport users who also filled in a seven day travel service. The idea was to understand how they use the transport network because 
for 10 years now in Tallinn, there's a fair free public transport network. So any registered resident in the city doesn't actually have to pay um, or pay directly through fares for using the transport networks. I relied for this on the concept of care mobilities because it offers an alternative to compulsory mobility and it subsumes all the journeys that are made for household or care responsibilities. This can be grocery shopping, childcare, healthcare, or administrative errands. And these insights from these interviews also showed that the constraints that the people encounter on a daily basis are very varied. So on the top right, we see, for example, the seasonal constraints because of the snow over there in, in the case of Tallinn. Um, and these constraints lead to passengers actually adopting avoidance strategies and having much more longer and waiting and travel times. Um, similar to existing research on gender mobility, these uh, care mobilities are also coined by a lot of short, multi-purpose and chain trip. Um, they are very dependent on the care relationships. So the relationship between a caregiver and a caretaker are interdependent and affect the way people travel around. And regarding the fares, um, this in this study, I found that they're actually more of a variable factor for modal choice. So it's not definitive, the only factor that people base their decision on what mode to use, but the absence of fare allowed the respondents to increase their activity spaces, to participate in more diverse social and economic urban lives. It also facilitated the travel, so the ease of travel of not having to bother to purchase or validate a ticket, and with this also the care practices. And interestingly, I found that the absence of fare also increased the use of both services, so ride hailing or ride sharing options. Um, so the overall insights that I gained through these three studies are that users encountered various capacity coupling and authority constraints that are often also interlinked. To overcome these constraints, passengers adopt various tactics um, that rely also on diverse networks of care. And by engaging with these constraints and making it work for them, they kind of practice what can also be termed as accessibility as a doing. The passengers rely on diverse networks of care. This can be networks that happen online um, for sharing knowledge and, the, for example, the fare control inspections, but it can also be offline networks of care that include other passengers, neighbors, family members that help people access and use public transport as they need it. Um, and yeah, these digital media technologies enable the creation and the sharing of knowledge that is created through these practices. So what in the end have I found so far that makes public transport a public space? Well, on the one hand, it's the visibility and exposure to urban diversity. So a lot of different people converging in a very small or in a closed space for temper for, for a certain time. It is also the prevalence of rules of conduct. A lot of respondents mentioned that in contrast to private spaces like home or a car, they have certain ways of how they expect it to behave in these spaces. And there's formal and social control between passengers and the place itself offers a space for negotiating these differences amongst passengers. Then public transport as a public space also has an intricate connection to urban processes. In the one hand, how the transport infrastructure shapes urban processes, for example, like gentrification. I think this also came up before in the question with land use patterns but it also intricately shapes how people access and use and participate in public life. And lastly, of course, also the questions of ownership and financing structure that can make mobility services like public transport more or less public in this way. Thank you. Here, I will stop sharing because I can't actually see otherwise the room. All right. Thank you very much for the presentation. Thank you also very much for timing. We have solid nine minutes for discussion. Uh, Jakub is now rotating the camera for you to see the huge audience. Oh. Uh, oh, yeah. Good to see you. 15 people watching you online, so no worries. Uh, 
So, any questions? If you're online, please raise your hand. If you're here, start talking. I will just note down everyone who wants to ask. So, yeah, first, Veronica, second. Okay. I have a very basic question. Why do you suppose public transportation is in public space when it does not really fit into general definition of public space? It is paid. It is one. It's purpose. The public space of public transportation is built for purpose to transport primarily. Uh, even though I admit that there are a lot of activities that are not really uh, is the goal to transport, uh, but maybe to some social activities. But uh, it does not, for me personally, it does not really fit in public space. Mm -hmm. uh, well, that's a very good question, and I must say also this. This project, well, the project I'm in, as well as my PhD project, it started off with the question, is public transport a public space? And now we've discussed this for like four years. And I think the idea was to exactly understand in a way what, what actually, how do we define public space in cities? So to question also this definition that, of course, we can assume that on the one hand, there's a kind of, as you mentioned, a financial accessibility that needs to be and provided or even a physical accessibility that is not there, but a lot of other definitions also take on, for example, this communal aspect that we say, okay, a public space is where different people from the city come together. They can kind of be visible to each other or exposed to each other. And if we see it from this perspective, we can actually understand public transport as a public space. So it offers a space of shared use. And I think there are just a range of different dimensions or and notions that we can use to to define public space. And I think our task or my task was also to find out which notions work. And I think if we I mainly base it on this communal aspect, then from this we can argue that it's a public space. But I think on the other hand, if we look at, for example, ownership structures also, that public transport in many places is only kind of semi-publicly owned or even privately owned, but under kind of a public private um, how do you say, uh, contract, contracting agreement, everything. So there are other aspects that we can definitely also criticize this question, whether it is actually a public space or not. So for, for me, I focus on this communal aspect and see what, what of this communal aspect makes it public space um, with the limitations here that it definitely doesn't, isn't considered public space if we look at it from, from the different, from a different angle, probably. Okay, thank you. Okay, Veronica. Thank you. Uh, Jakob stole my question, but I, I will I, I will link to Jakob's question uh, because my dissertation was in the topic of system of public spaces, the definition of system of public spaces. And uh, uh, your first slide uh, contained the, the, the hypothesis uh, if the public transportation is public space. And I was totally missing the definition of public space because if you if you if you would like to 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 answer this question, you you must know what is public space, what is public public transportation. But my question is to your methodology: if you if you work on the verification of this hypothesis, if if or this this question, this research question, if the uh, if the public transportation is public space or could be public space, because in your presentation was. In fact, nothing about this this crucial question and its verification. Yes. Um, sorry, if I understand the qu question right, is it about the link you, of how you, how with the methodology that I use? If you if you work on the verification of this research question, then the trans public transport is public space or public space is public transport. Uh, yes, yes, in a in a conceptual way, yes. In how? I mean, in, in which way? Which in which way? So, I mean, as I mentioned, this is also I basically I work with qualitative methods, so I don't have a quali quantitative assessment or a system that I adopt to use public space to define public space. But what I have done so far is that, from a conceptual side, I looked at the existing literature and brought together these different notions of public space and then kind of ask these to the users I've engaged with and figure out how does this perception 
of them also, of the space they use, how they engage with the space, how they engage with public transport and their experiences. How does this translate into what the literature has as ideas of public space? And for example, what I found so far mm -hmm. is that a lot of, well, uh, most of the, the respondents that I've talked to, they actually consider it a public space. They also would say that they haven't thought of it in the first place of a public space. But when we discuss what, what they do in it, how they engage with it, what precautions they take, how they engage with other people in this space, they would consider it as a public space, but more from the way of how they engage, how it enables them to engage with the city in a way that they can access other public spaces, but also that they actually meet a lot of different people, that they take other measures of like they're being very careful. So kind of translating their experiences and practice that they have into every day into what is assumed of the concept of like an ideal communal public space. If we talk of spaces like shared spaces that foster this conviviality and are meant to create encounters between citizens, whether this reflects what the users that I've talked to also experience on a daily level. Okay, thank, thank you very much. Right, yeah, um, I have a question about uh, so first of all, I'm really happy that you work with the uh, atmospheres because usually I'm on that, but I'm dealing with this stuff. Uh, but my question is, uh, how do you decide to do that? And if it is theory driven or you decided to work with atmosphere after uh, entering the field work uh, and uh, working with uh, especially interviews also, but also the observation. Yeah, I think this uh, this atmosphere focus definitely came more from the observations. Well, we we started with the theory with public space theory, and we figured, okay, of course, if we take this communal public space as a basis, then atmospheres play an important role. But it mainly came up when we started with the research on the COVID pandemic that we realized that there's this narrative of, oh, now public transport is like dangerous, people don't want to use it and should not use it because of contagion of the virus. But when we did the survey, actually, we found out that they, the experiences or like the keywords that people attribute to these atmospheres are very different. So this is where we got this sensitivity towards atmospheres. And then we went into kind of more theory and try to try to understand, okay, what is it between the the built environment, the uses of the people and the atmospheres that comes together and how they can mutually influence each other. Good. Thank you. We spot on the time. So thank you very much, Louis, thank again. Uh, yes. I now ask Pedro, who is a PhD student, fellow from uh, our school, Faculty of Architecture. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Pedro. My topic uh, is about investigating sound escape references, evaluation, and their role in um, advancing urban mobility. Uh, this is the overview of my presentation, which I am going step by step through that. And I start with a problem a statement, uh, basically, uh, the problem is that, uh, statement is, is, is divided in three main parts, challenges, uh, research focus, and object. Mainly, uh, the, the, the research uh, focus is about urban mobility, sound escape prefer uh, pre uh, preferences, and sound masking, uh, masking techniques. The, uh, sound masking techniques is, is a definition which is made in, in 80s and it's started from interior actually uh, places. But in recent it is getting more and more trendy, especially after the, the COVID, when we spend our time in our, our flats. Uh, this this topic is getting getting more trendy, first of all, about the, the quality of sound in our uh, or running environment, and uh, secondly, uh, how we can use sound masking techniques in our urban environment as uh, urban designers and also as uh, urban planners. <laughs> so the challenges which we have is is uh, traffic uh, con uh, congestion and, and environmental 
uh, sensors and um, also uh, overlooked of sensory experience. Uh, how people react in, in, in uh, urban environments. How is that? How did the uh, how is uh, the process performances change? Most of our, our research research uh, researches they were mostly focused on a uh, visual aspect of our behaviors in in urban environments, but some research shows that people actually have better performance, and um, in in combination of audio and visual together. It's, uh, it has several researchers and, and, and performance of uh, students in, 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 uh, kindergarten, in kindergarten and also in schools, and also wayfinding techniques in, 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 in uh, wayfinding uh, behaviors when we have audio tree and also uh, visual actually Ability, the performance is much more better than one of if you have only one of them. So the background of the, the research uh, is basically uh, the background of research can tell us the city are getting easier, as we know, and we need to think about uh, the sand in, 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 in the cities which affected on, on, on people when they move around. And uh, this research aims to help make cities more comfortable and enjoyable for uh, considering the sound which people hear, basically. And state of the art is, 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 is basically this combination of uh, five different, actually, definitions. Most of uh, I started with uh, with urban mobility and 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 and, uh, and urban environment research and then uh, soundscape studies and also sound masking and masking techniques and also mixed method approach and VR research basically. I have to add that uh, my actually previous researches which I did in in, in well, my research was about. Uh, sound escape, uh, the effect of uh, sound escape in, in, in landscape architecture. And the knowledge gap, which basically the knowledge gap is, is, is trying to, to cover the, the, the three different aspects. One is uh, the lack of uh, comprehensive, actually, understanding of urban sound escape. How we, we we can we can actually think about sound escape of our uh, our cities and um, most of the previous research and research and researches uh, it shows that we need to to, to work more on quantitative metrics and uh, frameworks. But my my research is mixed method approach. So it's, it's, it's basically is 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 a mix of qualitative and quantitative research. And also we need to, to work on the interdisciplinary actually approaches. Aim of the research basically in easy term. The research wanted to make city life nicer and and and, and nicer for everyone everyone by thinking about sounds you hear when you are getting around and they wanted to talk about seeds when they plan, uh, plan how the city should be for for uh, strategy makers for 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 urban um, designers and urban urban planners and basically the research question is, is cover three main question. How different uh, environments actually, what kind of a strategy we need for, for, for different actually urban environments? And also how um, our, 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 our 
how we can analyze actually our, our, our behavior in urban environments and uh, based on performance of, of individuals and what kind of challenges we have in, in, in urban mobility and urban environments. The methodology which, I, which I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm following basically is started with collecting sand and archiving sand and in which uh, in makes virtual, virtual reality actually atmosphere and add those sounds and, and, and participants actually um, uh, performance in that uh, uh, simulations and their, their feedbacks and also collecting data, data based on their, 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 their performance and uh, analyzing the uh, feedback base. The case study is uh, in Namiste Republic. It's, it's located in, in, in a center of Prague, one of the uh, um, busiest actually uh, squares in Prague, which is uh, basically a mix of different uh, activities and also uh, different type of people, group of people, locals, and also tourists. And also we have a uh, different actually type of architecture altogether. Uh, now I'm, 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 I'm recording sounds and uh, measuring sa uh, sounds level of actually the, the, the space. We have two, two different numbers about uh, this. Um, uh, which shows that the standard actually uh, the quality of the sound of our, our, our city. One is from uh, who, which is the mention that 45 decibel during the night and 50 decibel during the day, and also European actually number, which is uh, 45 decibel during the night and 55 decibel uh, during the day. Uh, I just noticed that the, the, the sound level of this, uh, this place is more than a standard and it's, it's something between 65 decibel in, 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 and, uh, uh, some, at the beginning of the week and in, 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 in busy days, it goes to 75 decibel, but the number which is, we have in, in interior spaces is, is, is uh, 45 decibel. We know that we, we are using uh, different materials and then different isolation to, to decrease our, 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 um, our sound pollution. But on the other hand, the quality of uh, urban uh, areas is uh, still the same. And I just noticed that how the, the different material and, and pavement, for example, can increase actually sound pollution because as we know that, for example, in, in, in this uh, um, photo, most of the, the square is covered by actually uh, stones, which basically is in, increase actually um, uh, sound, le uh, sound level of uh, uh, cars and also buses, which is I just found that it is increased 10 decibel. And as we know, a uh, decibel number is logarithmic number. So if we, for example, if we talk about 40 decibel and 50 decibel, 50 decibel is 10 times actually uh, stronger and uh, louder than, than 40. So we, uh, if we know that uh, this pavement uh, can increase the, the uh, sound level of our, our vehicles is, is one of the negative things. On the other hand, uh, for example, the, 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 the vegetation, trees, and, and, and also noise barriers actually can, can, uh, can um, increase, uh, decrease actually uh, sound level of the uh, I don't know, I don't know, sound level of environments up to 20 decibel. And for example, in my case, we don't have that much trees, basically nothing. 
and I want you to, 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 to analyze it and also add, for example, trees and also water features, which is one of the common actually way of uh, controlling and using sand, sand masking technique in urban actually uh, studies. So the, the next part is expected actually outcomes to, 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 to enhance acoustic comfort and privacy in urban mobility, optimal sand masking strategies for urban mo mo mobility and quantifiable assessment of sand masking benefits. And the next slides are about the references. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Basmet. Okay, so again, questions from here, you can just shout, Veronica will start. If you would like, please raise your hand or write it down to the comments, Veronica. Petran, thank you for presentation of your case study on NAMI's airport backing. Uh, will you continue with another case study or will you base all your research on, the, on this one case study? Um, actually, I just came up with, uh, with this case study, but we, uh, but uh, my supervisor and we decided to, to to find another one because I just noticed that uh, this square it has so many problems and it's obvious we have to to find a little bit more flexible actually. Uh, cases that you done not mystery public. Definitely, it's it's very it's a very specific topic. Yeah, and uh, I would also like to see another case study from totally different type yeah. of topics, right? Mm -hmm. the, the different types of, or for example, transport and sources of, of noise. Yeah, not only the train traffic and so on. Exactly. It's only yeah. methodological <laughs> question. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Other questions? Yes. Uh, we can talk about also uh, creating like uh, reproducible maps of the, uh, the, the soundscapes that you uh, observed. Well, basically, uh, we have actually noise map of all actually uh, cities in, the, in, in Europe. And I just check it. And my actually uh, data with with their data, and I just noticed that it's basically the same. So, and thankfully we have exactly the the, the noise map of this actually uh, um, region in in our our, our um, noise map actually system in, in Europe. So you can check it, um, and there are many actually other cities which you can check and and, and you can control it. The, the noise map is, is in, in two versions, during the, the night and during the day. May, may I just ask about these noise maps? Uh, that is the reason that your results are actually very similar to what you can see in the noise map that the Namiesti Republic applies is included as a measurement point where the actual noise is indeed measured and for the rest of the city, the noise is modeled. Is that it? Could it be the reason why your measured results match uh, matches the uh, what is observed in the in the data of the noise map? Well, I'm I'm using actually same actually method of recording basically and analyzing uh, sounds. Basically, I have uh, sound recorders and also sounds measure uh, devices. So I think. When you are using both of these these devices and and you have the capacity of of uh, recording and work on the the, the the measuring the, the 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 sounds, I think that the result is could be some very similar. Maybe in in, in two or or three different de decibel, but it's reliable and 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 I just noticed that. By accident, when I choose the 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 the, the, the case I said it, also because because the 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 noise map of uh, um, um, Europe basically is not covered whole of the city, 
I think the, their focus is more about uh, city centers and then cr and crowded actually places. That's for, for example, su uh, suburb areas or something like that. All right. Thank you. Uh, since I see no other questions online and here also satisfaction with your answers. So uh, thank you very much, Pedram, once again. <laughs> I'm gonna ask Arindita if you ready to present like eight um, minutes. Um yeah, yeah, just <laughs> a minute. I will share so, my screen. Yes, yeah, sure. Yes. Uh so I am uh, a PhD student at the Lulia University of Technology. And uh to be completely honest, this is based on a paper that I'm still writing and it's um it's a work in progress. So so I have some preliminary results and I will try my best to explain it to the best of my ability. Uh, so um, as you can see, my, my PhD is about understanding the impact of built environment on uh, pedestrian behavior. And so I am uh, trying to understand how theory of planned behavior can be used to explain this effect of built environment on walking. Um, and I talked about the aim, so I will skip it. Mm -hmm. So I am using uh, the theory of planned behavior. And for those who are not familiar with it, it's a social cognition model, uh, which basically extends the theory of um, reasoned action, which is uh, basically saying that our behavior is um, governed by um, three belief systems, which is the behavioral belief, which is our attitude, the normative belief, which is what we think other people think of us and control in sense of how much control we think we have over our surroundings and our activities. So I use that to next. How do I do? No. Hello. Yeah. Okay. Uh, <laughs> sorry. No, no, I went too far. So, yeah, sorry I'm, again. Ah, uh, my my screen has. Ooh, that is too far. Okay. One, Fine. two, three. Yes. So this is um so based on the theory of planned behavior, and I am from an architectural background. Uh, so using uh, my understanding of built environment from an architectural and urban planning point of view. Uh, we kind of worked on this model, which um, unites these two understandings, which is uh, from the planning point of view that we say that built environment directly affects our behavior. And there are lots of studies which kind of study that. And then there's this psychological point of view, which says, no, it's our attitude and our control, which governs our behavior. So we are trying to incorporate these two together um, and what we understand so far from the literature is that uh, the psychological constructs have a moderate mo moderating effect on this relationship between the built environment and and the walking behavior and our built environment itself can be measured in two different ways which is the objective measure that we measure the width and the uh the build building heights and all all of that kind of uh, physical attributes, but there is the perception, which is basically what I feel when I am in the environment. Do I feel safe? Do I think it's pretty? Do I um, think it's um, it's it's nice to walk in this particular environment? So there is the perception, and most of the studies so far have looked at only the perceived environment. But what we are trying to do is look at the objective environment at the same time. Uh, so for us, the gaps are like, how are our perception forms and how do we choose to walk in and where do we choose to walk? So that is what I'm trying to understand. Um, so having said that, we have kind of formed our um, own questionnaire for measuring the psychological constructs, obviously based on the existing literature. But um, the existing literature, like I said, looks at just the psychological constructs uh, from the psychology point of view. So they look at um, attitude uh, towards walking and at the perce perceived control towards walking. What we are trying to include in the study is our attitude towards the built environment also and our 
sense of control over the built environment that we are walking along. So, and, and for that, we look at the routes specifically and not uh, the neighborhood, which most planning studies do, or, or even psychological studies do. They look at the environment from a neighborhood point of view. So these are the key differences in, in this, or the key points in this study. Um, so we have selected a few of the built environment characteristics because there are, as most of you know, hundreds of them, and it's kind of difficult to get your hands on all the data, one of the reasons, and also that um, we try to select the ones which existing studies show to be the most relevant in terms of walking. Um, and then I would like to talk a little bit of how we collected the data because that is kind of important. So this uh, is like based on one of the cities. We are doing collection in three more. So this is in the city of Umeå, which is pretty much in the north of Sweden. And um, we initially, the study is part of a bigger, bigger study. So uh, there were some specific um, built environment features that were identified and therefore this particular um, area, okay, and this particular area of, um, this particular study area was selected, which is around the city center of Umeå. And sorry again, this is the center of Umeå. And we collected our data using a mobile phone app. So as to be able to collect um, <coughs> an objective um, travel data. Uh, most studies, again, would have uh, focus on asking people how much they have traveled over the week and things like that. And we have realized from the literature that there are a lot of shortcomings, for example, people's estimation and people forgetting to report certain trips. So we have gone for an objective measure for the this travel itself. Um, and this is the app that we use. Uh, and then uh, we were able to incorporate our questionnaire within this app, um, <clears throat> which had the possibility of asking two, two different types of questions. One is um, the basic uh, questionnaire that you fill when you are filling, like, like the background questions. And along with it, we added some of the psychological uh, questions also. Uh, but the more important part was that we were able to ask people question while they were walking. So every time a person walked like five more than 500 meters, um, a pop-up would come up and they would be asked very specific questions about the built environment that they are walking in. And this is where we focused on the their perception of the built environment and their control over the walking activity and the built environment itself. Um, and then uh, to describe the data that we kind of received, the way it was structured, is that um, every time a person walks, of course, the app records it. So uh, if I walk, for example, from my workplace to the bus stop and then take the bus and then walk from the bus stop to, for example, my daughter's daycare, um, then the work the bit I walk that then that it, it can be how we consider the trip can be different. So if we look at only um, at the travel element level, then it's like I walked and I took the bus and then I walked again. But that is really the level at which we make decisions. And since we are trying to study walking and how people decide to walk, um, we went for the next level, which is basically that if I walk the entire distance, then I consider that trip in my analysis. So if I walked and I took the bus, then it's not part of my analysis. So this 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 is the second level at which my analysis has been um, run. Then of course we collected uh, some data for the built environment and they were not very easy to get my, our hands on. Uh, so to give a basic uh, characteristics of the sample, this is what um, the trips look like. And we had eight, 108 participants and they recorded around 4,500 trips over the period that 
the app was available to them. Um, and then we had to, of course, clean the data because a lot of it was outside the boundaries. Some were not complete and all, all, all those kind of uh, cleaning activities. Um, but walking was about 40% of the, of the trips. And um, like I mentioned earlier, um, we had this pop-up level questions, um, which were specific to the control and um, to the uh, percep perceived perception of the environment. So in this analysis, we only consider the uh, people who are, we only consider the trips where people have answered this pop-up level question. So that brings our, that makes our data set quite small. So we have like now 60 individuals and 189 trips. So instead of 1,000, 4,000, 3,000 trips, it's come down quite a bit. Uh, and 64% female. But at, uh, well, well, what I'm trying to show here is that the breakup in terms of uh, the demographics is um, quite similar to most of demographic characteristics of Umeo. So the data not is quite representative in that sense. So I move on to um, the analysis part. Um, so um, again, like I mentioned earlier, we have asked questions um, which are at two different levels. One is the um, individual level, um, where uh, which is basically the attitude, the subjective norm, and the demographic characteristics. But there are some questions which were asked at the trip level, as well as the walking behavior itself, which is which we have measured here in terms of the trip distance, which is at a different level itself. Um, so. The reason that I said that my analysis is not complete, or rather, is is that um, I have a hierarchical data, and I have um, this um, uh, variables which lead to a cons to constructs, and then I'm looking for the relationship between the constructs. Um, so I started um, with the simple, re simply checking uh, the bivariate relationship uh, between walking and the different um, um, the, the different uh, variables uh, considering this hierarchical uh, nature. So um, using the uh, random intercept uh, regression model and the random coefficient regression model, depending on um, which level the variable is. <clears throat> um, so here is like one of the examples that if if you if I have attitude which is at the at, at level two and I have uh, distance which is at level one then then I need to do a different set of analysis and if I have uh, perceived built environment which is measured at the same time at, at same level as the trip distance uh, then it's a different set of analysis and the results that we um, have so far so this is basically um, uh, the direct relationship of walking to these particular variables is that um, um, the, some of the variables um, show relationship to walking, which is, of course, not all of them is possible. So uh, with respect to attitude towards walking, uh, uh, we have um, how much people like to walk. It was one of the questions. And um, Interestingly, uh, here the result is a bit counterintuitive. It shows a negative correlation uh, to the walking distance, and uh, we we think that this is probably because, uh, as we see further on, people don't really walk because they don't always walk because they want to walk, but because of many of other reasons, and one of them being uh, that uh, economics. So people who walk for economic reasons, walk longer distances. <clears throat> it shows a positive correlation. And uh, people who, uh, and, and uh, the in terms of barriers to walking, uh, um, physical environment, their perception of the physical environment has a positive correlation to the distance. <clears throat> um, 
Similarly, attitude towards built environment, we did not really uh, find any specific um, um, variable that, that showed any correlation and so, so did subjective norms. Uh, um, in terms of demographic characteristics, uh, the size of the household showed a negative correlation and we are looking further into it. More like um, bigger families with more children have fewer options to walk um, because of other constraints probably. But uh, everything else, access uh, like gender, age, education, they did not have any, um, did not show any significant correlation except um, for access to car and which has been emphasized in a lot of literature that people who have access to car tend to walk less or walk shorter distances or not take the public transport. So. Um, and in terms of perceived built environment, um, um, it's a sh short and direct connection to destination, um, showed a negative correlation and room for walking on the walking paths showed a significant positive correlation that is wider, nicer sidewalks encourage people to walk longer distances. Um, perceived control over walking, um, did not show any correlation in terms of the specific variables, but if we think of uh, control in as a as an aggregated um, a, a aggregated value um, based on all the <coughs> all the variables, uh, then the total control showed a positive correlation to walking distance. Um, but the control over the built environment showed no correlation irrespective of total or individual control. Um, and then uh, attitude uh, towards the built environment, uh, short and direct connection to destination, and attitude towards walking. Uh, the showed significant uh, the barriers to walking showed significant uh, distance showed uh, significant negative correlation. Uh, what I'm working on um, next is is um, the factor analysis and 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 uh, the structural equation modeling, uh, which, like I said, I have still to figure out, considering that this is a hierarchical uh, data, but like I mentioned in the very beginning, uh, the, the important aspect here is first, of course, to be able to identify the individual variables which are most significant, so that we can reduce the number of variables in the in in the in the model when we do the structural analysis. Um, but also to be able to understand uh, the moderating effect of this um, psychological. Um, of human psychology or the psychological variables on this relationship between perceived uh, between built between the actual built environment and um, walking behavior, and I have unfortunately not haven't got the results for that yet. I was hoping I would, but um, so uh, to conclude. Um, for distance walked per trip in terms of individual variables, <clears throat> attitude uh, had some correlation, subjective norms had no correlation, and perceived control um, sort of not 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 very great. Um, and um, this is like as an overall idea is not very surprising because that is uh, quite often how it shows up in most analysis that attitude proves to be the strongest um, um, construct that affects walking behavior. Um, uh, but for us, it is not just 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 the attitude, but also um, which aspects of attitude that kind of um, contributes towards um, uh, um, towards this relationship. In terms of perceived built environment, um, uh, for, for perceived built environment in terms of the individual variables, um, attitude has some correlation. Um, we were hoping for more, but I, I 
we 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 are again have like i said have tested it only for one city um and uh, we probably need to test it for um for a bigger data set or or like for for several cities to be able to really um confirm that this 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 is um um uh, yeah the, the the relationship um and in terms of uh, uh, walking behavior uh, could be measured uh, using, or for example, walking behavior could be measured using other variables uh, at, a, at, at, at a different level. For now, we have focused only on uh, the trip distance. Uh, and um, again, uh, one of like the limitations here is that, um, like I mentioned earlier also, was that um, um, not... Um, uh, uh, the, the length of one particular trip does not necessarily um, uh, reflect my entire um, walking behavior, um, and and not all decisions are kind of made at at the trip level. So um, maybe looking at the maybe looking at walking behavior at the individual level, which is um, the number of trips per person per day or the ratio of uh, trips, walking trips compared to all other trips um, would uh, help understand the behavior uh, better. So uh, to go back to the research question, I would say that um, uh, the theory of planned behavior um, has the potential, um, but of course I need to do more analysis to to actually have the answer. I don't really have it right now. So thank you. So thank you very much. Quite skeptical conclusions and interesting presentations. <laughs> so uh, we've got nine minutes till the coffee break. So uh, room for, nine, for your questions. Yes, uh, Shimon uh, first, a uh, just reminder, Online, if you raise your hand, you'll be also listed to the to the waiting list for the questions. Shimon. Uh, thank you, Anandita, for this uh, presentation. I was delighted to see that someone uses multi-level approach, uh, which is the which is my thing box also. And uh, I would like to ask you uh, whether you consider gathering um, any more samples into your uh, more uh, routine with your samples because. You have mentioned in your conclusion that uh, uh, you noticed that uh, significant correlations are, uh, for example, um, visible uh, for three of 15 variables in the uh, attitude part, mm -hmm. uh, one uh, of 15 for PBC. So mm -hmm. I have uh, many um, regressors in your models. But uh, as I uh, to recall, the sample was not very wide. So this this can be a uh, relationship between the sample size and the um, accuracy of measurement. So uh, I, I think that if you could uh, consider expanding your uh, research sample, this could be uh, very beneficial for the outcomes of regressions. Um, yes, I, I I completely agree, and that is uh, what I was highlighting in the very beginning is that um, the data set initially when we looked at it was like looked to be like yes, there are so many people and uh, not so many people, but well uh, over a hundred people have provided so many trip level data, uh, but um, because of the because the data was collect we needed some variables to be collected at the trip level. Um, the data set actually became quite small when we tried to run this particular analysis. Um, like I mentioned, we have collected data in and in two more um, Swedish municipalities. And uh, I do plan to run an analysis considering all, um, all, all the aggregated data. But um, it's just that uh, if I consider more cities, uh, that is like... Uh, putting in another level to my analysis. And I am, to be honest, um, not, um, 
well versed with running hierarchical analysis and and not definitely our st structural equation modeling that re requires that includes hierarchical data so i wanted to just test it out with with a smaller data set before i get into more complicated analysis that's great thank you good we have a question from uh, tanya she's mm -hmm. online hello yes hey. hello hi Hi. Uh, yeah, Tanya here from NTNU in Trondheim. Um, my question um, is uh, regarding the theory that you uh, chose, the theory of plant behavior. Uh, now, it has been applied like successfully and uh, many times in uh, travel research. And I was wondering, I mean, one of the sort of drawbacks of this theory is um, that it assumes that like decision making is like reason to like you it's like an active choice that you make every time now especially like walking and or like travel behavior in general is uh something you repeat in your everyday life so it's like there have been many studies and i think you know them that like find that a habit has a huge um uh, impact as well and sort of um limits the way that uh, the theory of plant behavior can actually predict um travel behavior oh. Like, what are your thoughts on that? Or like, um, did you take this into consideration? <laughs> um, that That's actually a very good question. No, I have not included um, habit into um, my questionnaire. Um, I, uh, let's see. Um, I wasn't, well, when I, to be completely honest, when I formulated the questionnaire, I was not very sure about the habit aspect of it, um, uh, because there, like you say, there there are quite a, quite a bit of discussion around it. Um, some people have insisted on habit being um, uh, governing quite a bit of the decision making, but having said that, other people have also talked about that decisions are, I mean, irrespective of the habit aspect, we are still making a decision. Uh, most of the time we do travel um, and um, uh, I, I for me I'm since I'm looking more for the built environment um, uh, part of it and and like apart from this particular paper I would also be looking at the um, the root the root aspect of it like how people cho choose the route for me it felt like um, it was it it was not the most important of the constructs to be included mm -hmm. i mean it, i i would say that maybe it would have been better to have have the data if 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 i wanted to do it but unfortunately i don't so yeah, yeah that, that that that's that's it <laughs> but i don't i totally understand your reasoning like um you at some point you have to choose the concepts that you include uh, into questionnaire yes yeah, that's very true like, like, i i i have I did my data collection using like a mobile phone app, which is like this kind mm -hmm. of a device. And you have like already a hundred questions that yeah. people are answering. And then at point, some point you have to be like, okay, this is, this is too much. Yeah. I totally agree. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Any other questions from online or from here, from room? No questions. So now who is uh, in person here we're gonna utilize uh the we're gonna utilize the opportunity to get a coffee and grab some uh, grab some cake and for those who are online uh please stay tuned um we're gonna continue i think according to the program in 15 minutes so hello welcome back everybody i hope you enjoyed our break we enjoyed our coffee and now we're heading to the second block of presentations, which uh, we're going to start with uh, David from uh, Vernon, which is the second largest city. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, my name is uh, David Gornay, and I am a PhD uh, student at uh, Masaryk University. I study social geography here, and I'm, uh, I focus on commuting, and uh, special temporal rhythms. Uh, so I will, in the few mi next minutes, I'll introduce my first uh, results uh, of the, my analysis in Bruno Metropolitan area. Uh, first of all, something um, 
about uh, the theory uh, because it's important to understand. Uh, currently visible ongoing process uh, is the flexibilization of working hours uh, and work locations. Uh, when we speak uh, about flexibility, uh, we mean flexibility in the scheduling of hours worked, flexibility in the number of hours worked, and flexibility in the place of work. Uh, it's common uh, that workers either must work certain uh, number of hours per week or per month uh, without any constraints. Uh, so the starts and the end of working hours may vary daily, uh, monthly, uh, from, indivi from individual to individual, or uh, they are required uh, to work certain numbers of hours per month, but uh, must be present at the workplace uh, during a certain core hours. Flexible employment uh, includes a wide range of uh, forms. Uh, one of the newly expanded forms are remote work, home office, or teleworking. There are slight differences between these terms, but it's not important uh, for us. But it was found that a large group of employees uh, alternate between remote work and on-site work within a week, and that higher desire to work uh, at home office is on Mondays and Fridays. Uh, commuting is a uh, such a uh, complicated process, uh, which is influenced by more factors than just working. Well, some authors uh, have observed that individuals with flexible working hours opt for more complex commute, including several uh, stops during the journey. Uh, Dorich, Churchy, and Rich, um, I argue uh, that. Uh, should be this that distinction should be made between morning and afternoon afternoon commute, and uh, number of studies uh, have focused on departure times uh, with various outcomes. Uh, researchers also highlight the existence of social norms and uh, habits that influence uh, the special temporal rhythms. The main aim of my research and this contribution uh, was to provide an answer to the following question, which current commuting characteristics have been typical of the Brno metropolitan area in recent years, and what special temporal practices uh, are associated with current um, commuting trends. Uh, my research is composed of two uh, interconnected parts, the first uh, contains of uh, quantitative analysis based on a questionnaire survey, and uh, the second consists of specific stories of individuals uh, that arose from uh, uh, semi-structured interviews. The research was conducted uh, in 2023 in the Brno metropolitan area, uh, the second largest city in the <laughs> uh, The questionnaire survey they conducted showed that uh, community or individuals most commute between uh, 7 and 8 a.m. and 6 and 7 a.m. Uh, so data show that, uh, that more than half of commuters admitted to commuting during this period. And data also indicate that times between this, uh, 5 and 6 a.m. and 8 and 9 a.m. are also very, very strongly represented. Although the high concentration uh, of commuters uh, in a short period is undisputable, from overall perspective, uh, we can uh, it's from overall perspective, it's apparent <clears throat> that the main flow of commuting uh, is uh, spread out over as many as four hours. When we look on the afternoon commute, <laughs> uh, we can see that the, the afternoon return commute is much more spread out in the time than the, the morning commute. Uh, the busiest times uh, include 3 and 4 p.m. and 4 and 5 p.m. Uh, but 
uh, increased uh, intensity uh, is visible from uh, 1 p.m. to 7 p.m. So there is some um, higher distribution in time. The collected data also demonstrate uh, that commuting does not have been uh, an everyday occurrence. Uh, for some respondents, commuting uh, commuting to work is no longer a daily daily uh, habit uh, based on a daily basis. Uh, it turns out that the growing number of respondents uh, going to work only on some days of the week. <laughs> And more than a third of respondents uh, commute less than five days to work, and one fifth of respondents commute at the most three uh, three days a week. Uh, we can also see that ten of uh, respondents uh, going uh, to go to work uh, on more localities, and the mo and the localities varies, and for 23 of, uh, on the, for 23% of all commuters, uh, it's typical flexible RV to work, uh, which depends on what time they get up at, at, the, at the day, for, for example, how much they spend at the gym that day. And it's also significant that uh, almost half leave work at slightly different times on different days of the week. The flexibility of work uh, is linked to the fact that every day is different and original. So it consists of different set of uh, work activities, which translate directly into the shape of a commute. Uh, Roman, I mean, Roman mentioned that his working days very takes the form he plays, uh, he plans in the morning. So this workday uniqueness is also reflected in working hours, which vary. So uh, it's uh, then uh, translates into the commuting. Special, special temporal characteristics um, or behavior characterize David. Uh, he takes an extra journey uh, with the child to kindergarten. Then he goes back home um, to pick up uh, necessary things for work and then go to work. So on some days, he makes a stop at fitness center on this journey. Uh, so he gets to the office later after a series of follow-up steps before work. And uh, this means uh, in different times every day. Another part participant, Lukash, uh, works in international company in full remote mode. Uh, consequently, he has no stable uh, workplace uh, to which he must commute daily. However, over time, he has developed a practices uh, which he implements on a daily basis and which uh, shape his uh, habit. And he uh, commutes to the cafe on the uh, in the morning to work. Uh, he works there. And sometimes he combines the one single journey with stop with lunch stop. And then uh, he goes back to work. So we can speak about uh, two constantly repeating uh, space-time rhythms that are realized uh, during his work days. And these rhythms can be described as being home, working from the cafe, going home, or being home, working from the cafe, lunchtime in the city, going home. Uh, Martina works in home office on uh, Fridays. Uh, and she has a friend who commute to her home uh, to work uh, several times uh, within a month. Uh, so her home uh, becomes the place of employment and friends uh, goes there. So her home is the center of commuting. And it's interesting that uh, they are not part of the same corporation. Uh, each friends work for uh, other company. However, since they have flexible working hours, it allows them to change their place of work during the week. So we can we can observe rhythm like being home, co-working with friends, at home being home. Uh, 
or the something like that. Home office uh, eliminates the need to leave uh, the place of residence, but, but some people, such as Dominic, uh, leave the house at traditional commuting times, even though uh, he has a home office day. And Dominic walk before uh, walk before walk before work, and the same experience was uh, was observed by another participant, uh, Patrick. And uh, they explain this behavior as the need to go through some trans transition phase between personal life and work responsibilities. Damian uh, lives in Tishnov, uh, but uh, he goes to Prague to work. Um, However, his job does not require daily commuting and personal contact with colleagues. Uh, therefore, he commutes he commutes to work only once a week. Uh, but uh, due to the longer distance, uh, he leaves for work in the early morning and go back uh, later in the evening. Rostislav, Rostislav belongs among uh, those who work. Uh, from multiple places, and he goes to various various places uh, from, uh, uh, like Glivice or High Tatras, uh, and he goes to various meetings uh, to a monthly frequency. So this implies that their commuting behavior differs from uh, the other individuals studied uh, in this research, and that there are rhythms that are uh, that are showed in uh, weekly or monthly frequency. Children are also essential factors uh, influencing commuting patterns. Uh, several participants reported that they do not drive directly to work, but drop their children off at uh, kindergarten, school, or somewhere in between. Uh, and again, realizing this rhythm, is allowed due to the convenient working hours of individuals, so more flexible with later start time. And uh, we can observe uh, many various uh, special temporal rhythm, uh, like being at work picking up children, arriving home, being at work pick, picking up children, purchasing time because uh, some people like uh, prefer shopping uh, after work and after them, uh, they go back home. My contribution indicates that temporal displacement and special unbinding of commute are signs of general trends in Brno metropolitan area. And in recent years, commuting has been undergoing uh, major changes related to the distribution of commuting flows in time and space. And first, the data um, the data show that uh, commuting is staggered over time. The morning journey is spread out of uh, four hours, and afternoon commute is spread out uh, more. The second phenomenon of daily commute is clearly vacant. So the three or four days of commuting within a week is become more typical. Third, the special dimension of commuting is also changing. Homes, uh, cafes, means of transport, and other originally non-working uh, places become conventional commuting centers. And this trends leads to the transformation of commuting flows in space. And last and not least, uh, another aspect of changes is increase in the new journeys that are not related to commuting, but taking place during the commuting peak, uh, peaks. So that is, that's very interesting that there are journeys, uh, but uh, they are not related with uh, commuting flows. So we can conclude that there are processes that can be described as temporal displacement and special unbinding. These processes are not only related to the 
special and temporal characteristics uh, of commuting pattern, but express uh, plenty of qualitative changes in commuting flows <laughs> that become visible at individual level. And uh, I try to show uh, the differences I try to show through specific commuting practices in Brno metropolitan area. That's all for me. Thank you for attention. Thank you very much. So as usual, if you have any questions, just raise your hand. It's also applying for online uh, passes, betas on Teams. Um, yes. Yes. Shemas. Uh, actually, question, but only comment. First of all, uh, I would like to say that I really love your, um, your methodology because it's, uh, I was really surprised that uh, some people, for example, uh, walk before uh, their work just to um, make this, uh, to maintain this uh, traditional habit of uh, transition between uh, home time and work time. So uh, we cannot find something like this using our traditional surveys, which are commonly established in, uh, in travel behavior analysis. So uh, my question is uh, whether you are planning to uh, to extend the methodological approach uh, basing on these findings, which are really interesting and important. For example, using uh, incorporating them into the surveys. It would be really beneficial to, to connect to these two uh, approaches, more qualitative and more quantitative ones. So you have, you have this perspective already? Also. Yes, it's a good question. and. Uh, walking before work um, surprise to me, and I I I have found uh, more more special examples. Some people go uh, go only to some park uh, to relax. Some people uh, walk with children, uh, and uh, there uh, I think there is a potential to focus on these uh, uh, flows, on this movement. Uh, I have I have read some articles uh, focused on uh, focused on workability walk and uh, walking to work. And yes, it's my next uh, goal uh, to look at the walking to work and uh, working before work, because it's important. For, when we speak about temporal displacement and special unbinding, it looks like uh, some positive effect for transport planning, but uh, because yeah. people say that goes to work at uh, 10 a.m. or later. But when we look uh, more, yeah. more, when we look at the other aspect, uh, we see that people are still part of the flows and it's important to urban and transport planners because uh, when we start to think that uh, uh, distribution of commuting can solve problem of uh, junction and uh, problem with transport, uh, the fact that people are in are a part of the commuting flows can change the situation because uh, there is movement, there is there is journey from home, but uh, it uh, cannot be be uh, there are journeys, there are journeys, and it's important to focus on this. Sorry for my English. No, it's not fine. Lukas? Uh, um, I have a question regarding some spatial heterogeneity in these commuting patterns. Like, uh, if you can analyze in your data, for instance, if travel behavior like a hybrid working or more uh, traditional five uh, days a week commuting to, to job differs, let's say, by location within a metropolitan areas, whether behavior of people living in, let's say, city center differs from behavior of people at periphery, let's say, in suburbs? Uh, yes, uh, from the, my 
from my questionnaire survey, um, um, it's complicated to uh, express uh, differences between centers and so, other parts of the cities. Uh, but uh, when I look on the context uh, on suburbanization, uh, uh, it's uh, more likely uh, probable that people living in suburban areas uh, are those who start, who commute later than some inhabitants in, in the inner city uh, because of the social demographical structure of population but uh, my research is more general and uh, the aim of the aim of my analysis wasn't to uh, describe differences between centers and some other sectors of the Bergen metropolitan area good yeah i think that uh interesting is that uh, this is a kind of trend uh it's, it's a very dynamic situation it started probably especially during the COVID 19 and now we learn how to work flexi time uh, partly all from home and so on so i expect that this is the kind of trend that will continue and i'd like to ask you about your work about your future work uh as i understood this uh, survey was done uh, by you, uh, by yeah, university, yeah. only for the purpose of this research. Yes. Right. Well, it's quite astonishing number of respondents. <laughs> and do you plan to repeat it uh, to, to get some of the data to, you know, to discover the giants? Uh, yes, or probably. Give probably. Now, data maybe to, if you, if you work uh, for the panel of respondents, when you want to get to now the data or data. Uh, yes, it's a good uh, idea, but I think there are limited. There are limits uh, because of the structure of economy, and I am not. Um, I think uh, we are on the limits. There are some articles uh, and findings that some people who work worked on home office uh, are planning go back to offices. So. Um, I don't know if uh, the if the trend will continue, but maybe it will be a good idea to repeat this uh, questionnaire survey or the research maybe five years later or ten years later. So, so, so the, the, the city does not plan the city no, as we does not plan to make some analysis, some surveys like like this. No, I, I, are, are there some uh, is there some potential to cooperate with the city to make uh, regular surveys on this topic? Yes, I I I, I agree. There is some potential, but uh, uh, it's a new analysis, and I discuss it only with my supervisor. So I submitted the article. I I I'm waiting for a decision. So it's uh, really in the beginning. And maybe uh, there would be good to contact some with Brno municipalities and discuss this topic. Excellent. Thank you very much, Jack. Yes. Did you want to move to Albertov? <laughs> to the water of uh, faculty of not geography, faculty of uh, science. Science. Sure, science. Nature science. So. Is he a cook from a uh, geographical geography from Prague? Um, so thank you for your uh, attention. Thank you, Monza, uh, for introducing me. Yes, I'm from Faculty of Science, and uh, I'm from the Department of Social Geography, or we say Human Geography. Uh, well, it's some historical heritage that the social geography is in the natural mm -hmm. natural science faculty. But <laughs> never mind. Uh, I really do like more. I'm, I'm more focused on on the uh, social aspect of of, of the geography. And uh, so it's good to follow after David uh, because we uh, do uh, literally similar topic. But yeah, it's a uh, there's like a strong connection of things and uh, the supervisor Mark. Uh, uh, Andrea Mulicek has also uh, influenced lots of my uh, my research. So what I'm going to present to you, it's a 
it, the, the research I conducted with my supervisor, Martin Oltenicek, um, from my department, it's about uh, regionalization, about the mobility in the suburbs of uh, Prague. So the research problem, uh, maybe it's especially for foreigners, uh, similar to other cities after transition or the cities in this area of Central and Eastern Europe, or you can say also post-socialist cities, however we want. Uh, Prague suburbs grown since the liberalization of the housing market in the in 90s, in mid 90s. And uh, so this caused a migration of people to suburban areas. And uh, so firstly, people moved, but this movement of people was uh, followed by creation of customer oriented services, for example, retail, uh, leisure services, and also uh, recently, quite recently, further job opportunities, in some cases, quite uh, sophisticated job opportunities. So this, uh, this development, this step by step development of uh, suburban area, which was very underfinanced during communism, led to creation, well, this is what we expect actually, uh, creation of local centers and uh, some kind of transformation of daily path uh, of peoples from the suburbs and within the suburbs. Uh, actually, this, this, this is something what was expected even before. So also from our department, uh, maybe Chuck Pitonez, uh, Professor Hampel, who recently died. So he was the mentor of, of Czech geographers, I would say, very important person. He predicted in even 80s, some, let's say, uh, transformation of urban areas according to, to, let's say, urban economy. And they expected the new, let's say, post-industrial cities will be more orga organic and the daily path will be uh, not only, let's say, centripetal from the suburbs to the city centers, as is like the classical model of, of suburbs, but it's going to be more uh, multimodal, more uh, so organic, so uh, more uh, not only the central path, but also the the, 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 the the commuting and the journeys from the center outside to suburbs, and also the commuting within the suburbs. And it's a thing that I'm interested in. Uh, so we asked basically about if, if, if there is any uh, local centers, there are any local centers in the suburban area of Prague, uh, what are the uh, commuting areas for those local centers? And if there are any special pattern of commuting to work and services, because two, uh, these two purposes are uh, quite different. So some theoretical background for this. So we started uh, based on the socio-geographical regionalization, also by, by Martin Hampel and his, and his uh, uh, colleagues. And this is important for me because it perceives the mobility as a special relationship. It's like a relationship of a function. So uh, the region in this perception is an entity. It's somehow, somehow like an enclosed, enclosed, uh, real, uh, enclosed entity where the, the most of the relationships are manifested inside of the regions. So this, this method that they developed for like all Czech Republic, uh, they, they, they use the census data about mobility. Well, huh. we're gonna see this. I a little bit adapted this method to use of mobile phone data. So, and secondly, uh, the second perspective was, is the perspective of, uh, of let's say, uh, time geography, which was the a, a, a theoretical current developed by Thorsten Hegestrand, the Swedish geographer. It's important for me because uh, it, it was thinking about mobility as uh, unsupported, like the, in two dimensions, that's a mobility through space and through time. And his perception, those two dimensions of mobility cannot be really separated because if you move in space, you also move time, in, in time all the actions take some time. So it means for me, it's very important uh, 
where we're thinking about region to think also about its uh, spatial dimension, uh, its temporal dimension. And uh, this time, the time perspectives. So uh, I also uh, was thinking about the, the idea of routines. What, what, what makes uh, uh, what makes the, the the habit of commuting? So, for example, as you say the mobility is a special relationship that that, that that integrates the the, uh, the space. Mm -hmm. What well, the condition is that the the movements are in some way rhythmical that they are repeating and that they have some pattern. And uh, as I say, uh, the the time can can be can, can be a big uh, game changer because the the pattern of commuting for, for work or for uh, different uh, services like a leisure or retail can be slightly different or can be very different. So uh, I used with two let's say time cuts uh, the working time and the late afternoon time because according to the theoretical literature and the empirical literature, we know that the these, these two times differ in the proportion of activities that they are they are done in this time. So, for example, during the work time, let's say about by noon, the work the work is the absolutely dominant activity, and or schooling or so, so on. But in the late afternoon, the spectre is much more complex. It's not only the work, but it's more, uh, as I said, leisure or retail or transport. So, uh, but some more. Uh, methods we use for this the mobile phone location data, and uh, because we think uh, that's a promising data source for uh, these the mobility algorithms because they allows us to study this special and temporal dimension both of them. For example, in census data we know the commuting between Czech municipalities, but we we can't really distinguish the purpose. Yes, so. Uh, well, here we, we also can't really distinguish the purpose, but we can estimate this according to the to the time uh, time frame that they are uh, conducted in. So I will not really uh, develop the idea how how the data are mined, but uh, so some 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 uh, uh, there's like a scheme to uh, if you are interested, the the, the the space is divided in cells, and you can triangle the position. And uh, you find the location of, of people. So, but this the data we had, uh, they were aggregated on the level of municipalities and in the level of commuting flow. So, for example, we knew the the number of people that they were present in some municipality, and we knew their origin. So, for example, we knew that, for example, in Yesenice, where in average. 25 person, uh, 25 people from Kamenice, for example, you know, to the municipalities. So <laughs> use the two sections, uh, the working, working, and uh, and uh, let's say service time. And uh, so we used data from T-Mobile, and it was processed by uh, the, uh, the the company CE Traffic, which is like the other company of of the provider, T-Mobile, uh, which holds like 30 percent of the chip market. And but the data were extrapolated for entire population and calibrated. The extrapolation is not really important because we didn't really use the exact numbers. I don't I don't think it's it's very um, it's very appropriate this extrapolation. But it's more about the this pattern. And so it was conducted. Uh, the data were from 16 November to 16, and we used the uh, ArcMap, ArcMap and MS Excel to uh, to do the analysis. So. This is how the, the commuting regions were delimited. So, as I said, the, the region in perception perception of socio geographical regionalization is like an enclosed area where most of the activities is conducted in. So, this is the case, for example, of uh, southeastern suburb of Prague, Yesenice, which maybe can be perceived as one of the biggest the suburbs in in Central Europe. Like maybe the worst case of of, of suburbs, one of the three, let's say. Okay, it's a twenty-three. Yes, uh, but this was a very very intense suburbanization, especially at the first phase of, of suburbanization. The the town grew like four times or something like this. So like very big in scale. 
yeah, not much really comparable to American or, or such as canal. And also we tried to, uh, to calculate somehow the, the, the strength of the, of the, of the, of the, of the link of the flow, uh, by the, this coefficient of local autonomy, which is basically the ratio between the people present in the home municipality and in the local center in the selected time. So finally, what we found, it's, it's going to be very, very, very short. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> oh no. So what is it? The first thing, the first thing is the graphics that I wanted to demonstrate the, the evolution of this coefficient of local autonomy. So all the dots, uh, they are the dots, uh, the, the municipalities in the suburban zone and in two time slices, the, 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 the first one and the later one, and you see, uh, the autonomy of the later one is much, much higher, which means uh, that the people are more, say, more present in their, their municipalities than in the real local center. And uh, yeah, and we see the development in the distance. So of course, so the most important thing is, in my opinion, that the, this this develop this function to, to distance. It's not linear, it's not linear one. And so I try to approximate this, like this, the, 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 this number of from near the random points, uh, I tried to uh, approximate with a curve. So you can see the, the linear curve, which does not, not much, just that the, uh, evolution is a little bit different with really the different distance in those both times, but most importantly, uh, I use this like six degree polynomial regression to demonstrate, uh, I think some, 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 uh, peaks of, of autonomy. And, uh, what does this mean? This peaks, it means this. So, uh, this is basically the same, same, uh, same coefficient local autonomy, but extrapolate, uh, but I think in this space, like a spatial regression, and you can see that the area of the metropolitan area is structured by the local autonomy it's like two zones the inner zone which is uh characterized by the higher autonomy and the outer zone which is generally the autonomy is lower but you can see the exceptions for example here is Kladno or or Beneshok, uh the, the or Mielnik, uh local centers that has quite a high autonomy well this is just like more like a methodological, methodological, uh, um, say, uh, framework, but the true empirical findings are here. And, uh, so that's the, the, the region regions we delimited, uh, during in this method. And, uh, so I will not really, uh, introduce every region, but what, what what about the, the, the general pattern? Let's say you can see, see two zones. So this is the, the the first time, yeah, the working time. This should correspond to work, uh, to, to, to commuting to work. So we can see two zones. Uh, the inner zone, which is in this distance, see that I manifested here, and uh, it consists of quite small regions, uh, and these these centers here. Usually, the, the uh, small towns that haven't been uh, the centers before, for example, Rubna or Kamenice, Yesenice, they're quite new centers. But apart from this, we, we got like centers that had this central fun function before in the past, for example, Brandis or Richemi, that were like center in history. But generally, we can say that this zone is characterized by the really new local centers. Of, of, of for work. This outer zone is consists of bigger, bigger regions and, uh, bigger re regions with, uh, much stronger, stronger centers. Uh, and also the municipalities in these areas are much less autonomous. So they're more depending on their local centers here, the autonomy in the zones, it's much bigger, but it doesn't really mean that the municipalities are autonomous, but they are autonomous on the local centers, which basically means that the centers are very weak and the connections of those municipalities still very, uh, connected to Prague. And this is the change in time. 
so we see that the number of uh, number of more, more uh, of, of regions increased also increased the uh, the autonomy as I demonstrated in the graphics before yes uh, so I would say that the, the general pattern is basically the same also these two zones but uh, the number of, of centers and uh, and the uh, yeah the number of centers and their regions increased yes uh, maybe one note I delimited the special, let's, let's say, special zones. You hear uh, Berenka River region or Botava River region. It was like zones of, of the, the, the mobility relations in these regions were so, so complicated that I, and then basically no clear center that I decided to, to, to delimitate them like a spatial, spatial, special region and, uh, you can interpret it a little bit differently, but generally the autonomy of those uh, or the, the the relations of those municipalities goes directly to Prague. Uh, I think the, the 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 role of the relief is is very important here. So that's basically all what what, what we found. So just uh, some highlights. We found like in total fifty three uh, centers of tangential commuting. Uh, the important thing is that it commute the the, the the delimitation is a little bit different in both time frames, which I think is very important when we think about the centrality of a place. So we have to ask what kind of centrality is it is. Is it is it for work? Is it or is it for services? Is it for both? Doesn't really mean that it's for both. And uh and the hierarchical position. Classification this was introduced, uh, yeah, and we adapted the method of the old method of regionalization to use for mobile phone data. Uh, some key, key key references we used. Uh, if you are more interested in, in in this research, or you will be interested in future, hopefully there's gonna be an article. It's already written, but not uh, not uh, published yet. So I expect the publishing inventor to. Uh, 20, uh, 24. So it's going to be like this. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for an interesting presentation, a bit longer. So, no, it's fine. So, we're going to have only four minutes to discuss, maybe five. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. So, I'm opening floor for discussion. If you're online, you can raise your hand virtually. If you're here, you can raise your hand physically. Shimon. Uh, I know that your data uh, were from 2016. Uh, do you expect uh, that uh, in, because of COVID, the teleworking can mm -hmm. one, uh, it's uh, changed drastically? I mean, it's not really, because we, we, we focused on the on the special pattern, which isn't not true. Well, it wasn't really uh, so, so, so. So we we didn't we didn't really uh, catch the intensity of the of the flows. So that's the thing that's definitely changed with with mobility uh, with, with COVID. But the intensity doesn't really make a uh, difference here. Yes, maybe in co what concerns the uh, the overall in autonomy, but it was, it wouldn't change the the structure of the data, but on, only like uh, the amplitude. Let's say. Yeah, so in this in this sense, no. What maybe change or, or would probably change? I would say uh, it deepened the autonomy of the hinterlands because as we as as we had to stay home, the the services that are close to us were more demanded. So I expect also the, even growing the autonomy. So this tendency that that we found. I think it's continued and maybe strange things. Yes. Okay. Anyone? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Can you show me what's more the uh, the formula for autonomy? Yes. Uh, yeah. So people. So this is a uh, how many, This is how many people is present, uh, regardless whether they live in municipality or whether they are just visitors. Well, the whole municipality. Uh, this was the. It's like it was the attribute of of, of the of a mobile phone, <laughs> and uh, we need. Let's say. It's the 
permanent residence is a, like a habitual residency. It means that if this this attribute was de uh, defined by your usual behavior in time in, in night. So if you sleep in a some municipality or the provider is going to be your home municipality. So this uh, we asked uh, how many people stayed home and how many people were in the local center in the time. Yes. So how, how important the center is for people from the municipality. So how many people in like the local center living in the municipality? No, uh, but they are present in the, in the time during the time frame. So we had like two time frames from the noon to 2 PM and the late one. So we asked how many people that live here in this municipality, how many of them are present in the local center okay. at this time and average, because it was like two, uh, two, two, two hours interval. So it was like an average, average number. Uh, which means also, so for example, the people who are in Prague, they are not in this in yeah. this formula. Yeah. So we had so completely the, neglected yeah. the, this relation, the primal relation to Prague. So we were, we weren't absolutely not interested in, about commuting to Prague. We we're only interested about commuting within the, the, the suburbs. So this was an important for us because it helps us nothing about discovering the local centers really. So we are interested in the secondary relations from municipalities to the local centers. Yeah. And also, uh, I, I was just uh, interpreting that for myself, that those uh, near centers near Prague, like I said, it's uh, yes. just integrated in the, into the polycentric system of Prague. Yes. Where everybody are commuting everywhere. Yeah. But uh, this is another, it needs another uh, interpretation. It really means that the local importance of the centers yeah. is yes. increasing. That's contradictory for me a little bit. <laughs> is it? Okay. Yeah. 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 Well, for example, this about about Yesenice, as you said, it says that Yesenice is a center for people from the municipalities around. So, for example, if you live in whatever Sari, yeah, here, so so you can be you can go to Prague for shopping, leisure, or so, or you can go to Yesenice. And now we see that people really are there; that they have any purpose to go there, not only passing on the way home, but stop there to do whatever shopping, you know. To go there for I don't know art art you know classes or uh, things like this. I understand that in, in afternoon frame. But yes. Frame, a little bit about studying what it, what it's during the food. Well, it, it must be somehow connected with uh, this uh, this uh, job. Uh, yes, yes, it, it 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 is. So it means that yes, in the essence, you said there are job opportunities for those people. Yeah. So, for example, if you have if you have services, you got you, you get also the job opportunities. So, for example, you can work in the supermarket or it's like just more cafes. You know, this 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 yeah. municipalities developed uh, uh, importantly. This is the case of Yesenice, which is a little bit weird. But next to there's Dolni Brezhane, which is like very uh, very progressive support, and you've got a lot of job opportunities there. So, yeah, I think it's like it, it proves that these these municipalities. Uh, developed also in the what, what concerns the jobs so they are not only the the places where we sleep or spend a later time but it has also some autonomy about the local life what would what be in my opinion interested to, to to check uh the the mobility flows according to their purposes for example how sophisticated jobs are there and and how be people commute the in function of of, of, of sophisticated sophistication of functions for example if you have very uh say very mm, like uh high high specialization if, if you are commuting within your region probably not because the the, the concentration or or the places where you can really work is very very limited so this concerns basically like let's say not really qualified Qualified profession, I would say. It's my, that's, my that's hypothesis. There. Because that's, that's could be such a yeah. municipality or, or some kind of high tech industry. Yes. Okay. Yeah. But it would attract people from all metropolitan region, even from Prague. Mm -hmm. Yes. I wouldn't really say that only, only from, from the, the, the region around. I mean, yes, for not really qualified jobs, but for the qualified jobs, probably, I mean, some people may, may move close to the stats. Some people are commuting, 
that's something that needs further further investigation. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we already missed three minutes from lunch break. <laughs> so I'll ask Federico, the last presenter before the oh, of the second block, to, to come and present. Um, hello again. Sorry, uh, we accidentally locked off, or I don't know what happened. So we're going to share the screen again for Federico. So if you want, you can start again, or you can continue. It's up to you. Uh, sorry, and sorry for. And I don't want to. Mm, I just go really, really fast. Um, oh, okay, okay. So I don't lose time. Yes. Uh, no, no worries. No worries. Like. Uh, so, so again, the, the sharing screen should work. Yeah. So uh, it's about. Uh, I was saying about what we can. We know about social distance and what we don't know. So actually, we can think about social distancing as a meaning negotiation process. Uh, how to deal with how to investigate social distancing we should uh, investigate sociological structures in the material choreography of face-to-face -face interaction but to have a mm, definition to find a definition or, or uh, an idea of what social distancing is we have to contextualize social distancing in uh, its practice um what i suggest here is to again uh, again because Fortunately, today we already spoke about atmospheres. Um, we, uh, I suggest to speak about urban atmospheres uh, in the sense that we have to have in mind that there is a, a low scape, uh, so um, a jurisdiction environment, ecological environment where um, social distancing take place, this phenomenon take place. Uh, urban atmospheres can be intended as this, the, the ecological air in which the interaction of social distancing take place. So in the end, the, the definition that I suggest for social distancing is that we should think about it as a mini negotiation process of normative and topological or geographical informations that take place uh, in the very urban atmospheres. So the broader project is of what is social distancing and is uh, a deep ethnographic investigation of uh, social distancing forms uh, and practice on the urban public transport of Milan. It's a comparative uh, research. It's not just on the um, on the on the case of Milan, but also uh, in comparison with um, with Amsterdam, with the public transport system of Amsterdam. Mm -hmm. Uh, methodologies, natural observation, um, participate out ethnography. Uh, I conduct uh, uh, also interviews, um, collecting documents. So it's a lot of um, data uh, that they try to put together and having these three main uh, uh, arguments that are privileged disposition and memories. Today I will speak about the dispositions. Privilege is more about the accessibility of public transport uh, as a form of distance, extreme form of distance sometimes. Uh, memories is more on the narratives of public transport and how they deal with uh, distance. Uh, and then dispositions, as we will see today. Why then? <laughs> uh, as we will see today, dispositional modalities in which we can uh, have experience of practices and technologies of distance. And uh, in this case, uh, especially is the, um, there are written in this position, I will show you. So first of all, how do social distancing practice emerge from face-to-face -face interaction? So these positions, as I, as I told you, is are different modalities uh, in which throw we uh, can see emerging the social distancing from the, the practice of interaction. I would prefer to speak about carriage interaction instead of face-to-face -face interaction because we have to, we must have in mind that in that case we are on a, on a box with a lot of people and is, I don't want to limit also the idea that is a face-to-face -face interaction between two, but it's uh, again, we, we speak about atmospheres, so it's something is related with uh, with the uh, with environment, uh, with all the people, with uh, with also the the collective action in that uh, in in that uh, place, space, and time. 
social position in this, in this case assumed uh, a material significance, a physical significance, uh, uh, and became a collective research also to uh, interact and analyze uh, uh, between uh, individuals. Uh, the structural power uh, is embedded uh, in the interaction and uh, uh, embodied within the, the dynamics of interaction. Um, disposition resulting of the generalization are written in disposition. Um, as we, so I, 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 I um, selected uh, the, the most evident uh, um, disposition from the generalization of the practice that I show you then. Uh, it's interesting because some of those uh, were already uh, new from the um, from the um, literature, uh, as the, the the case of passing and staying, but also I think that it's very important for the case of public transport uh, system uh, in Milan, returning and leaving, and we will go from it. Um, practice and technology. So, <clears throat> um, the, the the most important thing that I want. Uh, tell you today is that uh, I start uh, looking at the practice of social distancing on public transport as something really specific that mm, would be only of public transport and I failed because in the end public transport uh, as we already uh, heard today uh, can be intended also as a an agora where a lot of things um, happens and uh, also where the old human processes that we have in the city have a space uh, where they um, emerge. So uh, I uh, also selected some main practices uh, and technologies that can return in the different modalities. Uh, that are territorialization uh, intended as a, a, a way to uh, modify uh, the space uh, in order to uh, have it uh, more close to uh, the, the, the disposition and, the, uh, and also the, the, the uh, finalities that uh, individuals have. Avoidance that, uh, as the, the, the word says, to put more distance between individuals, between uh, classes, between categories. Uh, and then there are the, the, the technologies, what I call technologies that are, can be active and passive. So technologies that have the, the actant power to um, create distance or technologies that have to be, uh, need a technique to be, uh, to have this power. So, now I'll show you these techniques uh, and, and practices going through the different uh, dispositions. So we start with, uh, with passing. Passing is just um, a really fast uh, modality uh, where practice takes place. Um, what, we, what we have here, like what is the, the, main, um, the main process that we can uh, uh, analyze for sure the strangerness. So we, there are those interactions are really uh, superficial, are really fast, and so some in the, the majority of the time um, the practices are just uh, um, mm -hmm. intended to avoid, for example, clashing, to avoid the closeness with other people, but also sometimes it's reinforced closeness avoidance so for example when someone takes his distance uh for from another individual uh because of um racial or ethnic uh, uh, identity because of gender um identity and in these cases uh, uh there's also a communication from uh, from the people that is taking uh avoiding the other individual is commuting communicated to the other uh to the other audience that is in the in the in the carriage uh what is uh the the idea of uh or, or the, the the place uh, social place that is taking uh and this is the case for the for avoidance for terrorization practice uh is, is for example the the idea to uh okay claim the permission to pass so we are 
um, changing and modifying the, 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 the environment uh, around us, uh, just asking to other people, uh, creating a new environment, a, a disruption for, as um, Fine would say, um, also stigmatization um, is, a, is a process that we can observe. Um, for example, uh, I, I, what is, I, I suggest here, I also took a um, um, quotation for an interview. So stigmatization in this case of a neighborhood and specifically of a station, the station of Lampugnano in Milano, that is so uh, from the narratives, but also um, in the inter interview, these emerge a lot, that is so as a, as a dangerous place. So it stigmatized the, the neighborhood and the idea of um, changing strategically the, the way in which people is have, for example, the backpack on, on front to not be robbed. Uh, and in this case, these can be intended as a passive technology of, uh, of distance from uh, not, all, not, not only from the other individuals, but also from the, 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 the neighborhood, the, the station it's, itself. Moving to the staying, staying practices are, are mm, take more time. Um, again, we have the realization that in this case uh, is uh, the most characterizing um, uh, process, I would say. Um, I observe going to the metro, a lot of cases, uh, for example, very interesting is where uh, when we have like group of uh, young adults that claim the space in public transport, they occupy six seats instead of two, even if they are two, uh, but this is territorialization. They are completely modifying the, the power of the space uh, because they are claiming that, because they are territorializing that space. Um, scanning often because for sure, uh, if we think about public transport, that is all the, 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 the idea of cases and exchange of cases. Um, uh, and it was super interesting during the COVID pandemic, for example, because uh, with masks, the, 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 the gaze became more and more important to uh, interact to people. Uh, and then uh, gentrification because um, the point is also that uh, gentrification in this case uh, became a gentrification of the senses. So uh, the uh, noise that is too much um, uh, hurting, you know, or, or also the, the, the idea that there's a, a scent, uh, so smells that are liked or not, and that are good for a uh, um, precise neighborhood or not. So if you are from the in, in a gentrified neighborhood of the center, uh, you don't want to smell, uh, I don't know, like the scent of a um, peripheral station, how we can imagine a scent of the peripheral station. Or uh, for example, there are some neighborhoods like Paolo Sarpi, that is the, the Chime town of Milano, where uh, the idea of the scent uh, is completely embedded with the idea of uh, Asian cuisine, cuisine, for example. Uh, there are other cases uh, for what uh, for the technologies, but I, I want to um, also focus on uh, the approaching cases because they are uh, typical of this um, of this situation of this disposition, flirting and chatting. So. Uh, they are way in which people approach to others, to a stranger, and uh, flirting and chatting, as we can imagine, um, the, the social provenience, the social structure condition a lot uh, the way in which people uh, start flirting or start attaching to, uh, to others. Also, other characteristics of the situation, like the timing, and but in this case, uh, we can imagine that there is a strong social background. Returning, so that is something typical, no? because we, we, we spoke a lot about commuting uh, today, and I think it's, uh, it's important also to think about as a shared space, a public space, where we 
constantly go again and again and again. And this change also the way in which we um, enter in, in contact with other people. So um, there was a, um, a quotation for, from an interview where um, uh, Letizia, if I remember well, yes, uh, she's a commuter and she told me, uh, okay, sometimes I, I'm, I think I, I just took the wrong bus, but then I recognize the, the people, no? So I'm sure that is the, the, the right one. And so people became not only uh, passengers uh, that I, or strangers as before, but they became something, something more. They became also uh, a point of reference for the um, the travel uh, the the travel setting. Um, and the, here we have this uh, the, the the thing of private property and public service. And here the territorialization is is funny. Uh, I was um, even yesterday I was chatting with a friend, and this friend of mine was uh, was telling me, "No, yesterday I just uh, jumped on the tram, and there was someone seated on my on my seat." <laughs> and was this is how um, public space or shared space can became private um other way of uh, avoidance so avoiding rush hour um uh, again flirting because in this case we have the the coming back on on the on so multiple encounters uh i want to run fast a bit on this um so uh, you to arrive at, at the final um disposition that is leaving and uh, in this case we have other roles on public transport so for example uh homeless people seeking for shelter but also workers because we have to have in mind that um, public transport are not just for passengers are also for workers so there's people that every day uh, jump on the same uh, public uh, means of transportation, and for them that is the the, the workplace. And uh, also for us as researchers, sometimes I conduct a lot of hours of observation, so I was there every day, and I interact with the with the environment in ways ways that were completely uh, different. Um, other forms of leaving the public transport uh, um, are uh, in the space of public transport are, for example, the graffiti writing, because in that case, uh, the territorialization is taking a, a shared space and uh, tag it, so uh, putting my name on there. And that is important because in terms of distance, what changed is the, the relation of power. So having uh, my name written on uh, a public transport is not just uh, a, a, an a vandalic uh, act, but is also um, an, an idea of marking and try, try to become um, became it private instead of public in some ways. Um, yeah, other forms of under practice. Uh, so, uh, for example, um, way of leaving and avoiding uh, at the same time is switching the turn. Because, for example, for workers, they leave every day the same public transport, and they can can ask, for example, to to change to another time, to another work time, to another line. Um, and this is a kind of avoidance that we can have just. Uh, for people that leave the public transport every day. Uh, jumping on other, uh, so we, we finish with the with the with the, main, the three the four main dispositions, but I want to add something more. So there are hybrid forms of uh, of um, of these dispositions, uh, but the point important is uh, that what we can. Uh, what we can buy, what we can have, uh, what is really helpful from finding a rhythmical uh, forms, a rhythmical um, way of analysis, is that then we can use uh, some um, existing way of analyzing rhythms. For example, with Lefebvre, and all the way in which uh, he divided the, the, the different uh, um, kind of rhythms. And Though all those 
um, cases, polyarrhythmia, arrhythmia, uh, arrhythmia, isorhythmia, and dressage, we can find it in the experience, in the, in the um, practices. Um, so it adds another level of analysis uh, to, uh, to what we study. Uh, last, I would say, um, public transport hybrid field, uh, I didn't uh, focus so much during the presentation, but there are a lot of practices that are related to uh, the use of computers, the use of smartphones, and we should, and also oh, the app, no? the app that uh, where we can arrange our, our path on, on the public transport. Uh, also, a kind of professionalization of the, 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 and again, this is a kind of territorialization where people working on public transport, so public transport, but like with a computer, so remotely working. And, and in this case, uh, public transport became a, a working place for workers that are not implied on public transport. So we should, in my opinion, think about public transport as an hybrid field that is at the same time connected digitally, but physically uh, and uh, at the same time. So to conclude, as I told, um, social distancing can be think, thought as a mean negotiation process of a normal anthropological information that takes place in human atmospheres. The disposition that we uh, that I found um, are the different modalities uh, where um, in which uh, individuals engage in social distancing. The point that I want to stress again is that. Uh, what is important here? We saw how uh, social distancing emerged, uh, the different practices. But for me, the most important thing is that uh, these practices are not just related to the public transport, are not just related to distance. And so distance in some way allows us to define the metaphysics of uh, public transportation and also all those urban processes um, that are typical of the, the, the entire um, the entire situation of the city. So studying public transport is uh, a good way to explore and investigate the city more in general. And that's it. Thank you for uh, for your attention. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Federico. So let's have some questions. Uh, we a bit late, but definitely we will give you a room to, to discuss this interesting topic. So raise your hands or if you're online, raise your virtual hand. So, I see no one's here. Um, yes, Jakub? Nobody, nobody there. I think that uh, it's very, very interesting. Uh, San Francisco or topics study. Uh, yeah, completely. It's a uh, very interesting typology of uh, the strategies of individuals how to survive in in, in in just in space when there is a kind of they bubble uh, the privacy bubble is pickled and they have to do something is that a natural environment that you yeah. work from the point of view of privacy and uh, is there some way or uh, maybe a question is uh, how we will continue with this research, whether you will now go into ground of uh, more quantitative research, maybe to observe some plants, so uh, some light differences in time, both thinking or if you focus on certain strategy to study, to study it more closely. Yeah, thank you for thank you for the question because um, yeah, as I told you before, is a the project uh, the thesis project is broader. And uh, probably just having this, uh, in this case here, is uh, not keeps you the, the, the entire world, um, the entire world scenario, uh, because uh, the, the idea is to do just uh, an ethnographic work, so pretty qualitative uh, and and deep, also in the analysis. Uh, but yes, the, in my case, I think that the comparison between the case of Milan and the case of Amsterdam. Which I'm doing now, and I'm doing. Uh, I'm, I'm living in Amsterdam at the, at the moment, and finishing the fieldwork there. Uh, will uh, adding a lot of value to to, to the research, because 
um, not only cultural uh, differences uh, emerge from that thing, but also what are the processes that are beyond the, the, the borders of the, the, the mere culture that we can say. So, and also seeing how different processes there are, for example, the case of Milan, uh, it's interesting because in Milan, public transport are fundamental, are the skeleton of the city, and no one would imagine that that, that, that city without public transport. Actually, in Amsterdam, people don't care a lot about public transport, like the urban one, I would say. Uh, people love trains, people grow up with an, a specific identitarian idea of trains. The same is for bicycles, but not strongly with uh, with public transport. So all emerge uh, smoothly. Uh, also those um, those urban processes that I showed before uh, emerge, but in slight way. Uh, and I think it's also important because it shows how public transport and a public transport system can interact with a system of values uh, of, uh, of a country, of a city, of a specific place. Okay. Uh, any other questions before we run for last one? I see online there is no raise res, reason hand. No one type a quest dot typed a question. Uh, so if there is no question, we can uh, have a chat about it. Very interesting topic during the lunch. So uh, for everyone, now we finish. Once again, thank you very much. You're so we finished our second block and we're going to meet in uh, 55 minutes, 13.45. And we're going to start the afternoon program with a keynote speech from uh, Jonas de Vos, University College London, who's going to talk about the positive utility of travel and uh, travel satisfaction. So see you within less than an hour. Okay. So, um, uh, Time is up, so uh, let's start the afternoon session. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, could you just confirm if you hear me, please? Which I suppose you do. Yes, great. Yes, we do. <laughs> Thank you. I would love to introduce our second keynote speaker, who is uh, Jonas, Jonas Davos from University uh, College London. Uh, I'm very happy that he decided to to give us um, uh, give us insight in his work. And uh, I think, Jonas, you can just start. Okay. So you can you can see my slides? Yes, we do. Okay, perfect. Well, um, yeah, good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Jonas Vos. I'm an associate professor at the Bartlett School of Planning from UCL. And today I will give a presentation on the positive utility of travel and travel satisfaction. So I will try to stay within my 30 minutes time. Um, my slides are not changing yet. Okay. So I will start with well-being in general. So over the past uh, two decades, I would say there is an increased interest in subjective well-being. And mostly because academics and policymakers started realizing that there is a big problem with GDP as a measure of economic performance and social progress. So they sa say that we have to focus more on subjective elements like quality of life, uh, well-being, life satisfaction, and so on. And for instance, some countries started experimenting with gross national happiness as an alternative for GDP. So gross national happiness is also has objective elements like health, living standard, and so on. But it also looks at more subjective elements like culture, education, but also time use. So which activities do we perform? And finally, also psychological well-being. So uh, which emotions do we experience during the activities that we do? How satisfied in general are we with our life and so on? And also in general media, we see a bigger focus on well-being. So now we see a lot of books focusing on how we can increase our well-being, 
how we can become more happy at work and and so on and um this is a table from a very interesting study i think from uh, nature or science from daniel kahneman and colleagues so daniel daniel kahneman is a nobel prize winner and in 2004 he did a very interesting research where he looked at which emotions people feel during all kinds of daily activities so we have more social activities like intimate relations socializing relaxing uh non-mandatory activities activities like watching television and then more household chores and and mandatory uh other mandatory activities so he found for instance that the activities with the most positive emotions were especially the social activities and the non-mandatory activities and if you then go down to activities with uh with less positive emotions more negative emotions we get to the more mandatory activities household chores like preparing foods taking care of the children and then at the very bottom we have commuting so traveling to and from work is being perceived the least positive so when we commute we are not really happy we don't experience a lot of positive emotions and this can be quite problematic because, as you can see on the right, on average, people commute uh, 1.6 hours per day. So that's quite a lot of time that we spend on commuting. And of course, if we are not happy with this time, then this may have negative effect on our uh, life satisfaction, but for instance, also on our work satisfaction. And a possible reason why commuting may be perceived as relatively negatively is because travel time is travel is mostly a derived demand like if we commute we travel to work so we travel in order to reach a certain destination and because of that because travel is derived it can also be perceived as wasted time time that we want to minimize because we don't see a utility in it However, um, some studies indicate that travel has a certain positive utility. So, for instance, this is a study from 2001 from the US where they looked at actual one-way commute time versus ideal one-way commute time. So, if you look at the black bars, you can see that most people's actual commute time is between 15 and 40 minutes with some outliers with very high commute times. And if you look at uh, the, the wide bars, so the ideal commute times, you see that on average it's lower between 10 and 20 minutes. So people want to reduce their travel time, commute time, at least to a certain extent. But if you look at the far left, the, the far left wide bar, this indicates that only 2% of the people <clears throat> want to have a zero minute commute time. So although that people mostly want to reduce their commute time, there are not a lot of people who want a uh, zero minutes commute time. So this indicates that travel to a certain extent has a positive utility. So some studies uh, included the teleportation test in their uh, research. And this test asks people if you could snap your fingers or blink your eyes and instantaneously teleport yourself to the desired destination, would you do so? And mostly the majority wants to be teleported. So around 70% of the people want to be teleported, but this also means that around 25 to 30% of the people actually chooses to travel. So these people see value in traveling. And a relatively recent study has looked at who are the people who want to be teleported and who are the people who actually want to commute. And this study found some interesting differences according to different mode users. So for instance, the car users, the drivers and the passengers, and also the public transport users, they mostly prefer to teleport. So they don't want to travel by car or public transport. But the situation is different for the people who walk and cycle. So the majority of them actually prefers to spend some time commuting. So they see a certain value in 
um, walking and cycling. So there are differences according to mode and also uh, travel attitudes play a role. So people who think travel time is wasted time, obviously most of them want to teleport, while people who think travel time is useful or can be used in a useful way. A majority of these people um, wants to spend at least some time commuting. Um, here you can see a screenshot from a paper called The Gift of Travel Time. So a very interesting paper from the UK. And this study indicates that travel time can be can have a positive utility because travel time can be used as transition time, as time out, and as productive time. So with transition time, I mean that uh, people, when they are traveling to work, for instance, they can already mentally prepare for the meetings that they will have that day at work or prepare for a project that they're working on. And of course, when you're traveling back home, you can already start thinking about all the, the household chores you have uh, waiting for you at home. Uh, travel time can also be used as time out. So often when people are traveling, it's one of the only times a day that they are free from obligations. So they don't have to work. They don't have to perform household chores so they can relax. Um, if you use public transport, you can you can rest, you can gaze out of the window, you can read a book and so on. And finally, sometimes travel time can be used productively. So again, when you're on a train, you can use your laptop, you can work, you can you can read a book and so on. And this positive utility of travel suggests that people may enjoy travel at least to a certain extent and that they may experience positive emotions while they are traveling and that they may also positively evaluate daily travel patterns. And this can be referred to as travel satisfaction. So basically you have two types of travel satisfaction. You have satisfaction with one specific trip. So then this refers to the emotions that people experience or their mood during a trip and also the evaluation of that trip. But it can also refer to satisfaction with daily travel. For instance, how satisfied are you with your uh, commute patterns? Because commute trips are mostly very repetitive. And this trip satisfaction and also satisfaction with daily travel, which can be regarded as, as longer term domain satisfaction, can both have an effect on people's uh, satisfaction with life in general. Now, um, how can we now measure this travel satisfaction? So in 2011, Dick Atema, a professor from uh, Utrecht University and colleagues from Sweden, developed the satisfaction with travel scale. So this scale is based on uh, the Swedish core effect scale, which you can see at the top right. So this scale has two axes, one from unpleasantness to pleasantness and one from deactivation to activation. And when you do that, you create four groups of emotions. We have unpleasant activation, unpleasant deactivation, pleasant activation, and pleasant deactivation. So the six first items of the satisfaction with travel scale uh, refer to these emotions. So the first three go from negative deactivation to positive activation. So from, for instance, from bored to enthusiastic. Then the, the last three go from negative activation to positive deactivation, for instance, stressed uh, to calm. And then finally, there are three items referred to an evaluation of your most recent uh, commute trip or most recent uh, leisure trip. Um, a potential problem with measuring travel satisfaction is that it's often measured retrospectively. So in a survey, people are often asked how which emotions did you experience during your most recent commute trip and how do you evaluate that trip? But if you do that, there may be an overestimation of the links between effects, emotions, and evaluation. A possible solution for that is using smartphone surveys, which can measure travel satisfaction instantaneously. And here you can see an example from a study in Sweden where they used smartphone survey my experience, and they asked bus passengers how they felt right now during a bus trip, whether they felt passive, sleepy, dull, 
more active awake Pepe. And then after the trip, they were also asked um, what their emotions were, but also they were asked how they evaluated the trip that they just uh, performed. Uh, some other studies used uh, statements instead of the satisfaction with travel scale. For instance, here, a study asked people to what extent they agree with statements such as, such as I'm completely satisfied with my travel, my travel facilitates my daily life, and so on. And here, for instance, they found an average score of 3.7 and from 0 to 6, so indicating that on average people are relatively happy with their travel. And then finally, it's also possible to use um, national time use surveys. So here, for instance, um, you can see the outcome of the American time use survey. And this survey asks people on the scale from one zero to six, to which extent they experience uh, six types of emotions for all kinds of daily activities, including travel. And here we see that people were mostly happy. They found travel meaningful. They were mostly not tired, not in stress. They were not sad and also not in pain. But of course, you see that some of these emotions, such as sad and painful, may not be really good emotions to measure travel, because I would hope that when you travel, you're not sad and in pain. So that's the disadvantage of using uh, national time use surveys. So now, what what affects this travel satisfaction or what are the, the determinants of travel satisfaction so travel satisfaction is affected by a wide range of elements first of all a lot of studies have found that travel mode choice has a strong effect on satisfaction so here we can see the outcome of my own research which i conducted in belgium for my uh, phd um so this these are the average values of the satisfaction with travel scale and the green values indicate that the values are significantly higher compared to values of other modes, while red means that the values are significantly lower compared to other modes. So you see that walking is perceived most positively. So people who walk are enthusiastic, alert, calm, relaxed, and the evaluation is good. For cycling, it's a bit mixed. So cyclists are enthusiastic, but they're not very calm and confident or relaxed. So this may indicate that people who cycle, that they, uh, they think that cycling is a somewhat dangerous activity. Public transport is not scoring very well. They're not, public transport users are not enthusiastic, engaged, alert. Their evaluation is also quite low. And then finally, for car users, we see that car users are not enthusiastic. They are, however, engaged, confident, and um, the evaluation is a bit low. And the outcomes here are actually pretty similar to other studies that analyze the effect of travel mode on, on satisfaction. So most studies found that active travel, walking and cycling scores best, while public transport results in the lowest levels of um, travel satisfaction. Also, um, trip duration is found to have a very strong effect on satisfaction. So the longer a trip takes, the less satisfied people will be with their um, trip. So a lot of studies found this um, and, and found strong negative effects of duration on satisfaction. Here we can see again the outcomes of my research. Um, I actually only found modest effects. So on the left, you can see the positive feelings, and these are the average scores. So you see the differences are very limited and not significant. But for evaluation, I found significant differences. So short trips were evaluated more positively compared to uh, longer trips. So the, the results from my study uh, were focusing on, on leisure trips, not on commute trips. And we have travel distance and um, some studies have found that travel distance has a positive effect on travel satisfaction. And this was actually quite surprising because duration had a negative effect and mostly travel distance and travel duration are positively correlated. So the outcomes here were a bit surprising. There are possible explanations. So 
perhaps people may partly confound their liking for a distant and perhaps less common and more attractive activity with their liking of the travel required to reach that activity. Or another study suggests that longer trips may represent an escape from daily routine and therefore uh, longer trips are perceived more positively. Then we have uh, the residential location and um, most studies do not really find a clear effect of the residential location on satisfaction. So a study from France found that urban residents find trips less tiring but also less pleasant. I found that suburban residents were somewhat more satisfied compared to urban residents but after controlling for social demographics, especially age, the differences were not significant anymore. Uh, a Chinese study looked at how certain built environment characteristics affect commute satisfaction, but they did not find significant results. And a possible explanation for this weak effect is that people may select themselves in neighborhoods facilitating satisfying travel. So for instance, if you really like to cycle, you may prefer to live in an urban neighborhood where it's easy to cycle and where it's yeah possible to have satisfying cycling trips. While if you really like to drive, you have a preference for more suburban res um, neighborhoods where it's easy for you to drive and where you can have satisfying uh, car trips. So that may be a possible reason why the residential neighborhood does not really have a strong effect on satisfaction. However, there is an interesting study from uh, Norway that looked at it, not only at the direct effects of the built environmental satisfaction, but also the indirect effects. So here we see um, they analyzed distance, the effect of distance to city center and density on travel satisfaction. Here you can see the effects. So the effects are not significant. So there are no direct effects. However, they found that there are strong, significant indirect effects. So for instance, the distance to city center has a positive, significant effect on trip duration, which in turn has a negative and significant effect on travel satisfaction. So this means that distance to city center influences travel satisfaction indirectly because the further you live from a city center, the longer your trip duration will be. The same for density. Um, density has a significant effect on travel satisfaction, for instance, because the higher the density is, the more you will walk, and the more you will walk, the, the, the more satisfied you will be. And we also have companionship. So um, I found that when you travel alone, this results in lower levels of satisfaction compared to when you travel with other people. And so for the emotions, traveling alone results in significantly lower levels of positive feelings compared to traveling with partner, friends, family, colleagues. The same for evaluation, albeit a bit less strong. So here I only found that traveling alone will result in lower evaluations compared to when you travel with your partner and friends. And travel satisfaction is also affected by the activities that you perform during trips. So um, when you take public transport, you can sleep, you can rest, you can gaze out of the window, sometimes referred to as anti-activities. You can do social activities, making phone calls, talking to other passengers, uh, entertaining activities, listening to music, playing games, although that's some studies found that they that these may be attempts to abate boredom and do not really improve satisfaction or sometimes you can work and study when you use uh with transport and of course um elements that affect travel satisfaction are mode specific um and for instance travel satisfaction of car drivers is affected by congestion annoyance with other road users uh, travel time, reliability, lack of freedom to choose speed and lane. And you see that a lot of these elements are actually related with congestion. So when there is congestion, you also have more, yeah, there is a bigger lack of freedom to choose speed and lane, travel time, reliability will go down. So this suggests that congestion has 
a strong negative effect on uh, car satisfaction. Travel satisfaction for the transport user is, is affected by a lot of different elements. Uh, for instance, it's negatively affected by crowdedness, unexpected events such as delays, uh, and positively affected by um, talking to other people, cleanliness, comfort, punctuality, and so on. And here, for instance, this is quite an interesting study from the US indicating that um, if there is no congestion and if there's no crowdedness, then driving and public transport use does not score that bad. It's lower than walking and cycling, but it's still positive. But once there is congestion and also for public transport, when there is crowdedness, you see that the values drop significantly. So indicating again that congestion and crowdedness really have very strong negative effects of um, on satisfaction with car use and with transport use. And then we have walking and cycling. So satisfaction with uh, active travel modes is negatively affected by bad weather conditions, the presence of slopes, and positively affected by good uh, infrastructure. So for instance, separated bike lanes. Uh, personal fitness levels, uh, aesthetic appeal, and so on. And then the, the last part of my uh, presentation, so the last couple of slides. Um, travel satisfaction is also influenced by attitudes and preferences. And it's mostly not the attitudes themselves that affect travel satisfaction, but it's more whether or not your attitudes are in line with your behavior. And this is um, based on the cognitive dissonance theory. So an old theory from the 50s. And this theory indicates that an inconsistency or a, a mismatch between attitudes and behavior results in psychological discomfort and feelings of frustration and dissatisfaction. And we can also apply this to travel. So travel satisfaction is likely to be low when travel attitudes do not match with travel choices and patterns. So here, for instance, I looked at um, people's travel modes, so car, public transport, cyclists and pedestrians, and their preferences. So I looked at the number of positive elements that people link to car, public transport, cycling and walking. And based on that, I, I could um, measure their preference. So for instance, we have 880 car users and 305 of them have a clear preference for using a car, while quite a lot of them actually want to walk or cycle. For public transport, we have 117 public transport users and only 16 of them have a preference for using public transport. So this means that most of the public transport users actually want to use another mode. So quite a lot of dissonant public transport users. And then cyclists, for instance, we have 337 cyclists and the majority of them wants to cycle. So these are consonant cyclists. So overall, you can see that there are quite a lot of dissonant travelers. So people who actually want to use another travel mode. And this has a effect on satisfaction. So for instance, um, consonant car users, so car users who like to drive have higher values of evaluation and positive activation compared to um, car users who actually want to use another mode. The same for public transport users. Public transport users who like public transport are have a higher evaluation and also experience more positive activation emotions compared to public transport users who actually want to use other travel modes. And then another example, looking at actual versus ideal commute time. So this is a study using Chinese data in which I was also involved. And here you can see uh, how actual commute time and ideal commute time are related to each other. So you see that you have quite a lot of people who have an actual commute time, which is longer than the ideal commute time. So this 45 degree line indicates uh, ideal commute time being same as actual commute time. But here you see that a lot of people have a longer actual commute time than the ideal commute time. And there are some differences according to the used mode. So for active travel, walking and cycling, 
Um, most people have an actual commute time pretty close to their ideal commute time because active trips are mostly relatively short. But for public transport and car, we see that a lot of people actually have longer commute times than the, the actual commute times. And then we looked at commute satisfaction and we see that um, people who have an ideal commute time, which is the same as actual commute time or an ideal commute time longer than actual commute time, these people are pretty satisfied with their travel. So they have relatively high scores. But if you then look at the right, we have people who have an actual commute time, which is considerably longer than their ideal commute time. And for instance, the, the two groups on the right have pretty low levels of satisfaction. So this indicates when there is a mismatch or an inconsistency between your actual and ideal commute time, then this will negatively affect your uh, travel satisfaction. So that was the end of my uh, presentation. So here are uh, most of the references of the studies that I mentioned. And um, yeah, thank you for your attention. And um, if you have questions, I don't know uh, if there is still time for questions, but um, yeah, thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jonas. You can also see your uh, a small audience, more people are online. Uh, so let's have like two questions because we then need to move on. But it was a very interesting presentation, so I'm going to give some room for questions. Um, so I see that the very first to raise an, uh, raise an hand is from uh, Tanya. So Tanya. Hi. Yes, I hope you can see me now. Yeah. OK. Hi, I'm uh, Tanya. I'm from NTNU in Trondheim. Um, and my question would be, I mean, when we talk about mode choice, we also always have in the back of our mind that we maybe want to impact or influence people's mode choice uh, from the car to public transport, walking, cycling. Would you say that um, like when satisfaction and mode choice or like mode and satisfaction that they like, I mean, they are linked. Um, if we make some modes more satisfying that we can also make people change or is there or are there other barriers that we might have to overcome? Um, yeah, I think we could we could try to uh, stimulate people to walk and cycle. Um, of course, this is also affected by the built environment. If you don't have compact mixed use neighborhoods, then walking and cycling is not always an option. So I think we need to make changes to the built environment, focus on transport planning. Um, and besides that, uh, I think, yeah, a problem here is that public transport is not scoring very well. So I think if we want to convince people to switch from car to public transport, we have to make sure that, um, yeah, public transport becomes more satisfying. So, uh, I think that's something public transport operators should focus on not only on the uh, frequency and, and things like that, but also elements that can improve satisfaction with public transport. And if that happens, yeah, hopefully um, people may switch from car to public transport. Um, but again, yeah, it's not easy because um, travel behavior is very habitual. People use the same mode they did the day before. So, um, in order to break certain habits, we, we often need like, um, yeah, big improvements in public transport services or like restrict car use to a certain extent by, um, road pricing, uh, mobility plants. So if we, if we do that, if we change the context and if we make public transport more enjoyable, let's say perhaps we're hopefully we can see a model shift um, away from car use. Thank you. Okay, good. Uh, so, uh, Jonas, uh, you, you one more question? Or okay, we have one more one more question from Shimon and from Apple. So, two more questions. Please be brief. Okay. And then we need to move on. Uh, thank thank you. you for this presentation. It was very thought provoking for me. And uh, I'm concerned about the measurement of this uh, satisfaction because it's quite the concept of utility, which is not like, 
quantifiable in this very strict uh, way. And uh, I wonder whether we can uh, think about the uh, maximization of this uh, satisfaction or the optimal level of satisfaction, which would give some uh, policy implication. Could you comment uh, uh, on, on this a little bit? Um, yeah, I didn't fully understand. So you talk about maximizing yeah, um, in the, uh, uh, I mean the, the issue of measurement because uh, there is not a uh, I don't see the strict measure of uh, of this uh, of this phenomenon. So uh, I wonder whether we can actually maximize it or are we able to find the optimal level or the characteristics of this uh, optimal level satisfaction? Um, and how does it transfer to the policy? What can we do? Uh, from the urban policy making perspective to to, to obtain maximization. Um, yeah, it's not an easy question. Well, yeah, the scales that that are now used often often come from um, like the psychology field. So it really refers to emotions that people uh, experience. Um, you talk about like optimal emotions or perhaps like threshold emotions. Yeah, some like that. Um, yeah, I guess, I guess there are some kind of thresholds that people are willing to uh, have. For instance, you may be somewhat dissatisfied with your car trip, for instance, but you are okay with it because you really like your job and your job is only uh, accessible by car. So, um, yeah, I think it depends on a lot of, on a lot of things on the on the activity at the destination, and also, I think it may depend on your travel options because, um, as I have shown, um, in the end, you have quite a lot of, for instance, public transport users who actually want to use another travel mode, and these people are often referred to as as captive public transport users, so they use the public transport because they don't have other options. They don't, a lot of them don't own a car. Uh, they cannot cycle to work because it's too far. Um, so then you have people who are actually forced to travel in an undesired way. Um, so yeah, it's, it's difficult to, to say what would be like the threshold level that, that people are willing to to have so how how low can travel satisfaction be yeah it's difficult to say um depends on, on dif different uh factors um and in terms of policy yeah i would say that that it, it's important that we try to maximize travel satisfaction because uh, i didn't show it in this presentation but travel satisfaction um just as satisfaction with other activities can have an effect on people's life satisfaction it can affect people's job satisfaction. So, of course, if we try to maximize travel satisfaction, it will also have positive elements, positive effects on other types of well-being and also on, on people's uh, physical health because the happier you... Okay. <laughs> I'm just wondering if it's out of sight or we should be honest. Uh, very smoothing. Can you hear us, please? Anyone in the audience? I hear, and I also lost the connection to London. All right. <clears throat> so, thank you, Mar uh, Martin. Okay. Okay. Uh, so, I think <laughs> it's mean that we should move, unfortunately. So, sorry, <laughs> your question will not be answered, at least not now. Um, Sorry, I won't sleep. You won't sleep. I know. But I'll drop you an email to Jonas. <laughs> uh, Jonas? No. Okay. Uh, so, uh, I think we should start our afternoon block with Lukash, right? So, Lukash is... Uh, is it a... Oh, maybe? Hello. Yeah, I'm back. Yeah, yes. I was, I was uh, kicked out uh, suddenly. Uh, I, I don't, did you did you hear my uh, answer? I think I was almost at the end of my uh, answer. So 
Shimona is looking that he's satisfied yeah. with your answer. Okay. So, <laughs> so okay, thank great. you very much, Jonas. We we need to move now. So uh, our block of presentations will start. You're absolutely welcome to stay after each presentation. This is a PhD conference. So after each presentation, there is a discussion, very short one. So you're absolutely welcome to engage into the discussion. Uh, so now we're going to go. Now we're going to continue, and we're going to continue with Lukas from uh, University of Reading. By the way, you are not PhD, you are postdoc or? No, actually I'm like in the, in between of being a PhD student and lecturer because I've already submitted my PhD thesis and I've already started my new position as lecturer, but I haven't uh, had my viva yet. So so I haven't defended my PhD thesis yet. It's scheduled only one month. Oh. Okay, uh, thank you, Raj. I'm very happy to present this paper that's actually not part of my PhD thesis. As a, it's a new project I start uh, started quite recently. So, is the mixed use uh, city of short distances equally shorter for everybody? Uh, the thing is that over uh, over several past, uh, several past decades, there are principles of new urbanism that uh, tend to design uh, mixed use city form that's combining. Uh, uh, residences and job opportunities and services. And uh, it's believed that these neighborhoods have uh, many benefits, including benefits to commuting. And uh, there is uh, already existing evidence uh, showing that uh, these benefits are really there. However, if we look at uh, one specific concept of these, uh, 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 of these uh, new urban cities, let's say the 15 minute city concept, it says that uh, these neighborhoods uh, uh, allows a decentralized urban uh, and more polycentric structure that uh, allows walkable, self-contained and mixed-use neighborhoods uh, that work, uh, that mix working, living and leisure together. This is from UN Habitat uh, recent report. However, in the report, they also mention that uh, still this concept hasn't been, that there is not yet much of a uh, evaluation of this concept, whether it's really feasible. And that's something that I'm in particular looking at because it really remains an empirical question whether, especially large cities, this concept is, uh, is viable. So my research question in this project is that we do know that commuting behavior is uh, uh, differs significantly by commuters' demographics and some other aspects. And what I'm particularly interested in is whether a functional mix of neighborhoods that I'm, I, I model as a proportion of jobs to residents, so that's how I define uh, whether a neighborhood is mixed use, whether what's the proportion between jobs and residents. Actually, I can, I've plotted this for the case of Prague. So the taller the columns are, the more of jobs are per residents living there. So the orange areas are residential, the blue ones are mostly uh, job uh, areas, and you can pass it to you, so you can look at it. Uh, and I'm interested in whether this proportion of jobs to residents affects commuting behavior differently for low-skilled and high-skilled people. So there, if there is some heterogeneity uh, for these people, because this is a really interesting policy uh, relevant question, because over time in developed countries, skills of people are gradually increasing. So maybe some concepts of urban design that were relevant, let's say, 50 years ago, might not be relevant anymore. So methodological approach. First, I propose a very simple theoretical model that looks at uh, workers' heterogeneity and their commuting behavior. And then secondly, I analyze uh, real data from the Czech Republic and show how this uh, commuting behavior, uh, behavior differs for uh, different skill levels of workers. So. The research contribution. So it's already known that people from mixed use neighborhoods commute for shorter uh, on average. And it's also known that high skilled workers commute uh, longer than low skilled. However, I'm interested whether there is some interaction between these two. Okay. And it, it expands uh, our understanding of uh, very local labor markets that's also relevant for the labor uh, literature. And as I've already mentioned, uh, there are some policy implications because uh, maybe some designs might not, not be as effective as we believe they are.
So the rest of the presentation is divided into uh, these five sections. And I will start a little bit with the commuting city form and functions. Let's say it all started in late 80s, and it said that this uh, uh, this article by Newman and Ken Worsby is really one of the most influential charts in the planning literature. It shows how urban density is related to annual consumption of a gasoline uh, per uh, per worker. So they show that the denser city is the lower is uh, energy consumption. Also, there is some critique regarding this framework. It was, let's say, some like path-breaking paper uh, where this kind of literature started. So since then, there has been many papers looking at these, these factors that are affecting commuting, like density, diversity, design, and many others. I'm especially looking at diversity that is typically conceptualized as this uh, ur uh, urban functions, like proportion of jobs to uh, uh, to residents. And uh, uh, let's say the key findings have been already reviewed in meta-analysis. And it, as I've already mentioned, it has been shown that uh, more skilled people commute on average longer, and also that mixed-use neighborhoods uh, uh, have a shorter commute. Also, regarding heterogeneity in commuting by skills, there is literature going already back to 50s that has shown this regularity that more skilled people commute on average longer however most of the literature is from the us uh, or canada and uh, there, there are some nice empirical observations that uh, we do see this is taken from the check data that we do see that low skilled uh, jobs are less spatially concentrated than high skilled jobs if we would take uh, jobs by elementary statistical unit, that's a unit uh, of a subdivision of the Czech Republic, there are some more than 20,000 uh, elementary statistical units in the Czech Republic. If you would take number of jobs in these units and uh, calculate the Gini coefficient, for low skill, we do uh, we do get a coefficient of 0 0.75, for medium skill, 0 0.81, and for high skill, 0 0.87. Uh, so the higher skilled jobs the more concentrated are in particular elementary statistical units. And there are two ways how to rationalize this. Either, let's say, uh, within the conventional thinking in urban economics, that high agglomeration, that, that there are actually high agglomeration economies that are rising with skills. So it means the higher skills jobs you have, the more they're derived higher productivity from concentrating in one place. There are already some papers by either my supervisor and I've uh, written one paper myself in my PhD thesis that they are showing with some new data that this is really true both for Germany and Czech Republic. Or there is an alternative thing how to look at it, and that's uh, substitutability between jobs. If you have low skilled people, maybe they are more substitutable. If you are, uh, let's say, uh, uh, a shopkeeper or you work in elsewhere in retail, or uh, in other amenities, maybe you are substitutable as a worker with another worker. If you are highly specialized, you are less likely to find a good, a good job match in your own neighborhood. Maybe you have to commute further. So that's alternative way how to explain why uh, this might be uh, more concentrated. And uh, uh, because they are concentrated in discrete number of firms that are scattered across a city. And the second case, I'm going to model with a simple theoretical, uh, simple theoretical model. So now let's go to the model. Uh, I will just start with the diagram. So, so let's imagine that you have non-specialized workers uh, with an orange color, or you have a specialized specialized workers in two colors. So you have two types of workers, green and purple. If you have monocentric city, in all cases, all people commute the same distance because they all commute to the center. Now, in case of a single type of worker, if you subdivide this into multiple centers, all workers are gonna have shorter commutes because they commute to their nearest uh, job location. But it's different for uh, specialized workers because if you do have two employment centers and if people live random lake or city, some will have very long commutes while some have shorter. But on average, the shortening of commutes does not hold for a specialized workforce. 
Now let's look at it more formally. So imagine the city is aligned from minus A to A. So in case of non, uh, non-specialized workers, if you add more uh, subcenters, you really decrease the distance of commuting. So it can be formalized with this formula, but the interesting thing is that if you take a first derivative of the length of commute with respect to number of subcenters, the result is always negative. So the thing is that if you increase number of subcenters, commuting distance decreases if you have a single type of worker. Now, when you have multiple number of workers, and in the formula, I will extend it to, in, let's say, up to infinity number of times, things get more complicated. It's not anymore possible to take analytical solution, the first derivative of this term. It's, it's simply too complicated, but you can show it graphically. For no specialization, if you are increasing number of cl job clusters, average commuting distance just falls. But if you have multiple types of jobs, initially, if you increase number of subcenters, you have a region of parameters where you increase your commuting distance. And typically it started to decrease when the number of clusters is much higher than number of jobs types. So up until some region, actually changing a city structure from monocentric to polycentric increases your average commute length. And it starts to decreasing when really the number of job clusters is super, super large. Okay. Uh, sorry. So that was the theory section. And now I'll try to relate it to data. So what I work with are census data from 2011, and I use individual level cross-sectional data. Uh, and what these data, uh, the, the, let's say the, the, the portion of data I'm using is for each individual, I observe their place of residence and place of work measured at this level of elementary statistical unit. Also, I'm using uh, additional data from Czech Stat uh, Statistical Office for, for buildings, but these are less important. So let's go to the empirical analysis. So I do have this individual level data for almost 2 million uh, individuals uh, and aggregate, I aggregate them into commute flows between uh, these other statistical units and I aggregate them by uh, education. So for primary, secondary and tertiary education, I refer to them as low, medium and high education. Now, as a dependent left-hand side variable, I, uh, I use either Euclidean distance between uh, population centroids of these elementary statistical units or commuting time that is aggregated from original 15 minutes uh, bands. And as a right-hand side variables of interest, I do have this categorical variable of education, either low, medium, or high, and uh, also I define variable of functional use. So it's proportion of residents to, uh, to jobs. And I do have some discrete thresholds that some neighborhoods I classify as residential and some as uh, mixed use. Uh, this is very important because uh, for identification purposes, really to measure likely the uh, causal uh, impact of mixed use neighborhoods, I create matched pairs. So each orange area is a mixed use area and uh, the brown area is residential. I take in very close, uh, very close neighborhoods. So they are assumed to be all else equal uh, in, in all respects other than their status, either mixed or residential. Here, this is shown for Prague, but I do it for the whole Czech Republic. So the analysis, uh, it's done for the whole Czech Republic. This is just uh, plotting the case of Prague. This is uh, the estimation equation. And really what I'm interested in is the interaction of level of education and whether the area is mixed or, uh, or residential. And now I can show you the results. Uh, let's look at column four. That's uh, my preferred specification. So what we can see here, that if you look at type two, that's for mixed neighborhoods, for low skilled uh, workers that uh, are my baseline, if you are living in mixed use neighborhoods, on average, you are commuting some 14% shorter. But 
if you are uh, medium educated, so it means you completed your high school, this effect is reduced by some 3.7 percentage point. So it decreased roughly by one third. And if you are high skilled, it decreases even more, really to more than uh, one third. So the effect is really mitigated by, uh, by your level of education. And the reasoning is that really it seems that uh, people who are low skilled, they are more uh, able to find reasonable jobs closer to their residence, unlike people with high skills. For, uh, and, and for these, it seems that having more jobs in their proximity doesn't truly really play uh, 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 that much uh, of a role because they have much more complicated matching with preferred uh, employer. Okay. So just to conclude, I I do find results that are consistent with uh, theoretical assumptions, and uh, really uh, the baseline result is that mixed use uh, in city decreases commuting by some 13% for low skilled but this effect is lower by 5.2 percentage point for a high skill. Just, just to compare my result, if I look only at uh, skills or income and how they affect commuting, my results are very similar to results of Lee and Lee for the United States. That actually my high skilled uh, workers in my sample commute on average 68% longer than low skilled. And that's exactly almost the same figure as for people earning less than $20,000 a year in the US or is it a year? Yeah, it's probably a year or people earning more than 80,000. So, so these are really consistent and surprisingly, well, that's something I didn't look at it that much, but there seem not to be any effects on commuting time because of uh, probably commuting uh, technology. So implications are that over time, if people are getting more and more skilled, uh, maybe the effects of urban mixed use going to be slightly mitigated on or nuanced because people are more picky or they have a much higher requirements regarding matching their skills with employers. So maybe the urban mixed use going to have a, a lesser importance than, than nowadays or let's say during the era of uh, industrial cities. So that's all from me. Thank you very much for listening. Yes. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. Thank you very much also for keeping the time. Um, questions? Raise your virtual hands if you're in Teams, if you're in a room. Raise your hand. Veronica and then Carol. Thank you for your presentation. Very, very brief question. Methodically, uh, could you go back to the case study of that? Sure. Uh, you mean? Uh, the... super, yeah, super. Perfect. Only a very brief question. Uh, how do you define the mixed use area? I mean, did I understand how you, how you, yeah. Uh, so it's really given by proportion of residents or working residents to, uh, uh, to, to jobs. So, so if there is a, uh, if there is a more than, uh, uh, four, four jobs per six, uh, workers, six, uh, living, uh, like, uh, living six. Yeah, living workers, mm -hmm. then it's defined as a uh, mixed use up until six to four. So the threshold is four to six and up to six to four, because I really wanted to exclude purely uh, working areas where the, the share of workers might be 80%, 90%. So it's really looking, the mixed use are around 50, while the residential neighborhoods are the ones that have uh, lesser than three jobs per seven residents. So, so this is given arbitrarily, but now I'm I'm thinking of extending the specification to uh, to use more like a, a continuous scale and, and analyze the data in a slightly different way. So, so far it's really uh, it, it's given by these uh, uh, these thresholds. And from which evidence uh, you you get data for for the yeah it, 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 definition it, it, of the proportion. Yeah, it, it's it's really using the the census data because in the population census there is a uh, uh, there is whether you are worker, whether you are regular commuter, and uh, what, uh, what 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 is your education. So it's all derived from the population census. Thank you, Carol Mayer, Professor Mayer. Okay, uh, first uh, it was about so fifteen minutes a day. And if, uh, in fact, you reduced it to uh, jobs and then residents. No, no, no. Uh, it's important to to uh, to say that this is not 
uh, all work. Uh, no, no, you are right. Uh, that's actually something where I would like also kind of like extend the paper or comment on it more. That actually originally the papers coming from early 90s, they didn't really speak about bringing jobs closer to residences. They were all about more bringing services and amenities closer to residences. But the thing is that over time, it seems that the planning field or practical planning field kind of like twisted the concept. And now they are talking about bringing jobs also closer to uh, to residences. And in this specific uh, uh, respect, the concept doesn't seem to work that well. And, uh, and, and, and to address your point, I'm kind of like uh, uh, trying to negotiate with a Prague Planning Institute to get uh, cell phone data where I can measure not only commuting to work, but also other uh, mobility implications that, that's going to be more related to, uh, let's say, leisure activities uh, uh, and, uh, and amenities consumption, where actually for, for, for these purposes, the mixed use city is probably more working much better, but, but not really for the regular commutes uh, uh, that's connecting residences and jobs. But, but, but you're right, this should be emphasized. And, uh, so with relation to jobs, uh, how uh, this can be um, conceptualized if we admit that uh, on average, uh, every working people would change their jobs. It on average, it is awesome. I think my mm -hmm. time is very terrible. Every day or four years. Well, it, it depends, uh, like, if, if we assume that you change your type of career, but you still remain, let's say, low-skilled worker, or or if you, if you are a high-skilled worker and then change your career, then if it's possible to remain high-skilled worker and change career, so, so it would affect this concept of substitutability. But the thing is that maybe people are changing careers, but they still remain highly specialized and they, they cannot really, let's say, uh, I might change a career between firms, but probably I will never become a medical doctor. So still a lot of high skilled jobs uh, will never be open to me as a high skilled worker. So, so I do not really have a good answer to that because it's, I, I think it's easier to answer it from the perspective of low skilled workers, but from the perspective of high skilled, it's much more difficult, I would say. So I have uh, so I have the first question common. How about uh, low skilled workers who live in uh, areas with uh, lack of uh, job opportunities, like construction workers, who commute not within uh, one city, but uh, who commute one distance, cross border? Yeah, uh, actually these are included the, in the analysis. So, so here are all workers of all kinds. Uh, it's The truth is that they are workers with regular commutes, so it means they have a regular workplace. If they are these kind of workers that do not have a regular workplace, maybe like construction workers that are just hired to different, uh, uh, different construction sites, these are omitted in the sample, and it's possible that uh, uh, these workers have different uh, uh, travel patterns that are unfortunately not captured in census. So, so maybe these specific workers with with irregular commutes, they uh, okay, uh, they, uh, they might have uh, for for them the implications will be different. But like from a theoretical perspective, these workers would be very likely not to reside in large cities. They have really high housing costs, and their competitive uh, advantage is actually being very close to central business district or to these high-paying jobs. So, so let's say uh, I cannot say based on data, but the theory would imply that these workers with very Ill Ill irregular or random location of uh, of workplaces would not be likely to reside in city center. Actually, it could be tested because uh, I can see in the data whether, for instance, a class of construction workers is more likely to reside farther away from city center. It's a uh, that's a one way how to how to test for uh, for this. 
Okay. <laughs> uh, sorry, Yusuf. Uh, Jakub, and then we need to move on so you can grab uh, Lukash later. If Yusuf want to ask. You haven't questioned the days. Yeah, you were asked earlier. I don't ask uh, in person. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, right. <laughs> my question was in general because uh, I used to say in Italy that there are a lot of corporates, like big corporates like Microsoft, Unit Rocker, their uh, offices are not based in city centers or in cities at all. They are in the village. It's uh, many times in the, in the middle of the field. And uh, I was thinking this outside like other countries like Israel, and I was just wondering if this might give you some different results studying this type of countries where there are totally different trends. Yeah, like, 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 let's say these uh, edge cities uh, where you have employment centers outside of traditional central business districts. Uh, for for these cities, still, uh, it's. It's it hard to, 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 to conclude based on Czech data, but, uh, but, 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 but still a theory would predict that uh, uh, even in these places, you have a good mix of low-skilled and high-skilled professions. And it's, it's kind of like more likely that the high-skilled people are hide from, from larger labor market because you simply have a lower probability of hiring a uh, highly uh, specialized person for a given position very uh, uh, in, 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 in close uh, uh, neighborhood, let's say. But uh, it's true that for, um, so for, for these places, uh, I'm not really sure what the, what the implication would be. I, I can just relate it to like one of additional slides I had uh, uh, in appendix that if, if, if we would omit the, or, or if we wouldn't look at these uh, uh, edge cities campuses and look something uh, like uh, anecdotal evidence from the Czech Republic, I picked this Czech Technology University campus and uh, large office center called BB Center, both in Prague, let's say at the outskirts of central Prague, and they have this, the, same spatial, uh, the, the same pattern. If you look at for how long people commute to Czech Technology University, on average, for uh, 10 kilometers if they are low skilled, uh, for uh, for 1.4 more kilometers if they are medium skilled, or for 4.3 more kilometers if they are high skilled, they are not statistically different uh, different from from 10. But but uh, some evidence is here, and the same holds for for the uh, for the office center. That is a very different type of jobs, but the same holds that. The more skilled you are, the more likely you are to commute for further, uh, further uh, uh, distance. Okay. Uh, okay. Okay. Uh, good. So we need to move on. Thank you very much, Luca. Thank, Thank you very much. Okay. So uh, now we should move to Beijing. Lou, can you hear us? Are you here? Yeah, I can hear you. Can you Hello? hear me? Yes, we hear you. I, I'm Lu from China. I'm a PhD student in Tongji University in Shanghai. Uh, today, I will share my uh, research on the walkability of urban public facilities in Northwest China from the perspective of Life Circle. It's a case study in Karume City. Uh, from uh, from 15 minutes to the walkable city, uh, many cities around the world has the 15 minute city planning, like Barcelona and Paris. In their 15 minute city planning, the mobility usually refers more than just walking. Bicycle and public transportation are also included in to help people get public facilities in less than five minutes. Uh, since walkability has become an important director direction for urban planners around the world, Chinese government has promoted the convenient and the walkable 15 minutes community life circle in major cities since 2017. Uh, the life circle concept uh, mm -hmm. uh, was initially used to explore the interactive relationship between the residents' behaviors and the living spaces which is mainly popular in Asian countries such as Japan, South Korea, and China. Uh, the life circle allows people to get daily public services 
easily, which means a functional neighborhood environment should enable residents to get public facilities on foot, especially for the children and the, the elderly. So life circle plan in China requires organizing various types of public facilities in five to 15 minutes walking ranges to create a walking friendly and age friendly neighborhood environment. Uh, so in my research, I, I took the Caramel City as an example to figure out the shortcomings of public facilities distribution in neighborhood level in Northwest China. Uh, the Caramel City is located in Xinjiang, the Northwest of China. It is named after its oil industry. As of 2022, the permanent resident population was about uh, uh, 500,000 people and with an uh, organization rate of 99%. There are a total of 66 community neighborhood committees and more than 300 residential areas with a population about uh, 270,000 uh, in my research area. Uh, the whole research area can uh, be divided into three parts, the old town area, the new town area, and the new development zone. The old town area are established during the 1960s, and uh, uh, the residents were mainly old oil field workers. There were still about uh, 100,000 people lived in this area. The new town area is a newly developed area established in the 1990s, and at the present, uh, uh, the residents have gradually shifted from old town to the new town, and it has about uh, 150,000 people. The new development is planned as a CBD and, uh, for the new industries and uh, immigrants from nationwide. Now it uh, only has about uh, 20,000 people there, but uh, uh, with a uh, 60 thousand people in the future as planned. So my uh, technical approach is about uh, to evaluate the walkability with GIS system and uh, based on the PUI, PUI data. The uh, study is mainly carried out in the following four steps. The step one, using the networks to PUI data and outside the research to acquire social locations or public facilities in the research area. The second part is to construct a GIS visual information database by combining PUI data, the traffic network data, and the residential land use data. Uh, step three, use the network analysis to analyze the special location of facilities with ArcGIS software. Uh, the step four is matching the service areas with residential land use and uh, calculating the walkable coverage ratio and the supply demand special matching degree of different facilities. So in the data collection, we mainly collect four or uh, three types of data, the PUR data. The PUR data of public facilities include uh, the kindergartens, primary schools, training high schools, community health centers, elderly day care centers, neighborhood communities, administrative office, culture uh, facilities, sports facilities, and the green space. All of the data mainly comes from the internet and the urban road network data is obtained from transportation departments, including the main roads, the side roads, and the walking paths in residential areas, and the survey in the residential land use data. Uh, it comes from the third nation land survey data. Uh, in this study, the data used to characterize the population distribution, and uh, the table the table shows the walking time and less in different levels, which means the five minutes uh, means about uh, 350 meters, and the 10 is equals to 700, and the 15 minutes is about one kilometer. So 
uh, there are many methods for accessing the work accessibility of public facilities. Uh, based on a comparison of the uh, applicable scenarios and the calculation accuracy of these methods, these studies select the service zone, which calls uh, the network analysis method. This method takes facilities as a starting point and calculates the proportion of radiation land area that can be reached by working within the corresponding time frame. This method can examine the matching degree between facility distribution and the uh, residential demand, which is beneficial for planning adjustments in facility location and the land use layout. Uh, and the, the disadvantage of this method is that it cannot reflect the difference in population size among different building densities nor can it reflect the characteristics of residential walking willingness as distance decades. Uh, so uh, after the this data collecting with and the these types of uh, facilities, so let's get the readouts. Uh, um, the walkability of the primary healthcare centers. We can see the walking coverage ratio is about uh, 68%, and the old town area is higher, it's uh, 78 and the new town area is only 60%, and the new development zone is only 55%. But if we add five more uh, PHCs, we can make the but the uh, ratio goes up to about 80%. And uh, the elderly care facilities uh, coverage rate is uh, about 71%. Also, if we add eight more facilities, we can get uh, 82%. And the um, administrative facilities, the working coverage is about 81%, which is fine, I think. And the open green space is about 88, it's good. And for the kindergartens, the walking coverage is only 42. So we need to add about nine kindergartens to get uh, the ratio up to 52. It's, it's still low. And the primary schools, the walking coverage rate is only uh, 35%. If we add uh, seven primary schools, we can get a uh, 43. And the middle schools, the walking coverage is uh, about 40. If we add um, four more and to get a uh, five, 51 percent. Uh, so not just the, the coverage, we also found the mismatch of the special uh, supply and the demand of facilities is relatively high. This means the values of the uh, the matching degrees between 5, 10, 15 minutes living circles are only 50%, uh, 40%, and 30% of social rooms uh, have the special distribution that match with residential land use. Uh, the insufficient matching of special supply and demand led to lower actual utilization efficiency of facilities, which uh, it results in a coexistence of waste of resources and uh, inadequate coverage of facilities. So the, conclu uh, the, the mainly conclusion of my study shows that the main shortcomings of public facilities in the neighborhood level are education and elderly care facilities. The five minute level facilities and uh, facilities in urban fringe areas are high and high tech areas are the worst. In addition, there are a problem of low efficiency in allocation of facilities due to the special mismatch of supply and demand. So if you want to know more information about the study, you can find them on these papers below. Uh, and in the 
a special accessibility and equity of primary health care facilities in Northwest China. I submitted to the SOP Congress uh, in Poland. I did a further search on the special accessibility and equity of PHS by using the GOSEN to SFC method in Kerma City, which is, this method is common used in uh, research uh, by single uh, facilities, but not like uh, this research, there are various uh, facilities. So I didn't adopt the, uh, the two SF methods. Oh, uh, okay. That is my presentation. Thank you. So thank you very much, Luke. Uh, yes, yeah. now is the room for questions. So reminder, if you're in a room, raise your hand, physic hand physically. <laughs> and if you're online, raise your hands uh, through MST. So. Yeah. Yes, yeah, sorry. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't notice you. <laughs> somehow consider also uh, residential density. Uh, Luke, can you hear us? Yeah, yeah, I can hear. Maybe, maybe I'll uh, repeat my question. Did you somehow consider also residential density? That means uh, how many people are living within one hectare or something? Uh, as I mentioned in my research, that is the disadvantage of my research when I use the land use as the uh, population data, which may come in. Let me see. As in this case, the Karma City, the the density population of the residential areas is about uh, 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 one uh, FAR, which means the uh, every single land use. Can you hear me? Yeah. 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 Uh, I mean, uh, as you mentioned, the the residential land use data we are you I choose to use the. A, a land use shape to represent the uh, population in population density. It has its disadvantage that it could uh, represent uh, the high density and the low density in one single land. Uh, but uh, in uh, in China or in this city, Karma City, the population uh, and uh, oh, 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 no, no. the land use is uh, 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 the range is about eight. Uh, uh, it's about one uh, FAR. So I don't uh, like uh, uh, other high density cities like Shanghai that have a uh, five or ten FAR. So I choose to use this uh, uh, data to represent. Uh, I admit that it is it is not to it cannot. Uh, uh, describe the population density uh, 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 in a perfect way. Yeah. Uh, uh, what uh, does it mean? High tech zones. How it is? How it is differ from new towns? Uh, the high tech zones in China is really common in a lot of cities that the government decided to build like an, a new town and near the original old town near the city uh, uh, before uh, the, the, the high tech zone in Karma City is built. It started uh, in uh, not not uh, more than 20 years. So it started in the uh, 20th century, uh, 21st century. And uh, the government will uh, uh, select the area and uh, uh, to do the infrastructure construction and uh, building lots of uh, uh, residential houses and uh, the public service infrastructures 
then the people from other regions or from old towns they will move there to find jobs or to uh, have a better quality of living. So in China, the high tech zone is uh, from top to down uh, by the government uh, uh, supplied. Uh, uh, it, 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 we can call it a new town or as the government all already have a new town. So uh, to change the industry, uh, developing the, the developing, uh, how, how to say, uh, yeah. yes, the, ask you why why it's so bad that coverage in those high-tech uh, zones whether uh, yeah. the development of residential development is mostly in, in private in, in in china and public facilities are financed by by the state or province yeah so uh, yeah yeah i i can get you the the answer uh as i mentioned the high-tech zone is all constructed by the, funded by the government. So the government uh, uh, to have the finance by selling the uh, land. Uh, uh, the government sell, sell the land to the uh, uh, residential companies to do the uh, construction and the companies is run by uh, the private businesses they would like to build the houses more than the uh, public facilities. So that uh, it that's uh, become a phenomenon that uh, in the high tech zone, the residential land uh, are easily to be sold and uh, get constructed, but the public land for the public buildings are uh, usually delayed delayed until the government has the money to build. So it's common in China that uh, the high tech zones uh, is uh, aimed to be the best uh, part of the city, but always becomes uh, only the people lived there with not so many public facilities and uh, uh, it's quite common in China's cities. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, last question. Yeah. Where are we from? Hello, Lu. Uh, very, yeah. very, very brief question. Uh, do you have in China or in your province or in your city uh, any rules, planning rules, binding or recommendatory for planning of uh, optimal location of the basic public facilities like in the gardens, primary schools? so that they are uh, in the best way uh, pedestrian accessible from from the residential areas do you have some rules for that how to plan it yeah we have like uh, you mentioned in the primary schools we have two rules one rule is about the people lived in the area like uh, 5000 5, uh, people or 20000 people with a primary school or a mm -hmm. kindergarten and the second rule is the uh, primary school serves more, no more than 500 meters and the kindergartens can serve no more the 300 uh, meters. If the rule number two can be well adopted, there will be no problem. But the fact is uh, the government only consider the rule number one. That means you can go to school, but you have to go a long distance. You have to commute a long time to school. That's my Super. answer. Super. Thank you very much. Okay, excellent. Okay. Thank you very much again. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye. Or maybe you can stay with us, but I suppose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You could, <laughs> you could, no, no, you're not forced. I know you've got like nine o'clock in the evening or something. So. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So see you. And then yeah. we're going to move on to next presenter, who is me. <laughs> yes, who is Jan Bittler. Uh, so I'm going to start share, sharing the screen.
So once again, hello, uh, my name is Sian. I'm the, or the organizer of this conference and also a PhD student. Uh, my supervisor is Veronika Schindlerová, who is also here. So um, I'm going to show you my, my thesis working on a, uh, trying to uh, verify relation between accessibility of local amenities and the residential transport behavior in Prague, or we may also say influence. Uh, first of all, I'm going to say why we so much concerned about built environment. Uh, in the Czech Republic, as in many European cities, there is suburbanization developing around metropolis. It's well measured by our colleagues from geography, for example, from, from uh, Charles University. Also, unsurprisingly, suburbanization causes problems. These problems are very well uh, researched across the globe and also on the national level. Uh, calls to, for a solution of these problems can be heard globally or at the you know, European level or within individual states. There are like only very short paragraphs for many from various politics which are trying or uh, aiming to, to tackle, to seek solution to, uh, to suburbanization problem. The connection of significant part of suburbanization problem with the transport is also well documented. We can see like problems, environmental, social, uh, social problems, health problems, landscape, urban problems, administrative, economic, many problems which is caused by increased or by specific traffic demand in suburbs, which has negative consequences. Although the Czech scientific discourse reflects the connection between suburbanization problems, uh, transport research is fragmented into the very, very specific and discrete topics, considering geographical regional research is describing the current state, mostly like you've already seen by, uh, presented by colleagues about uh, transport, daily mobility patterns, and etc. Also, we have some behavior uh, studies which are mostly concerning uh, transport as a part of some wider social uh, research, social research. And we've got also other influences like impact of, impact of transport to, to health and etc. However, the research between the built environment and transport is marked. We can see traffic engineers which work with the transport with, uh, with built environment characteristics. We can also see some works which are trying to access new, uh, access new benefits of new infrastructures. However, the, so the urban planning discourse or research lacks essential knowledge that could contri uh, contribute to solve some suburbanization problems at the local level, may say by spatial planning. So my research question is mostly coming from a background because we are in a department of spatial planning and a check in a check planning system the the, this, the basic framework, the, the, the basic tool, which is the area influence, the built environment is a uh, is a uh, local zoning plans uh as an urbanist there's been a since 80s 70s tendency to slow all journeys that are made to as also lukas mentioned before to decrease distance between facilities and home so we can see for example from urban task force 99 very very uh, famous scheme from uh, i think uh, architect rogers so I was focused, or I'm focused, mainly concerned about amenities on a local level. My research question then, thus is, does the accessibility of local amenities influence residential transport patterns in a Prague metropolitan region? Um, my hypothesis is yes. Uh, and the, my work should verify that, or sorry, or falsify. I have two hypotheses. The first says that the total volume of residential transport is decreased by accessibility of amenities. The second is that the car share is reduced. Let's say people tend to travel more sustainably and the car dependency is lowering. If we talk about methodology, uh, what's the problem in a classical research, transport research is that although uh, there are very, very nice, very, uh, very complex schemes of, uh, of a transport models. They're working on an aggregated level. And we already seen today some uh, researches on a behavioral level, on a level of 
uh, agents, agents, let's say, but in the chat, this is something which is not well uh, well discovered now uh, uh, nowadays. So my basic framework is uh, is derived from a activity based modeling, which is based on a, on the Hagestrum as uh, time space mobility already mentioned by uh, by uh, Yakub, which means that there are agents which has their constraints and they are uh, that they are um, uh, into uh, they are uh, influenced by the by the built environment. Built environment is represented by activities which are spread in space and in time. What is important to say is that these uh, that these uh, agents has their own set of activities they want to do through the day. They put place and they put time. These agents also interact between each other. What is um, sorry? What is typical for uh, for such an attitude is measuring utility from each agent. And there are some uh, there are some uh, economic econometric uh, econometric methods how to how to quantify this utility. Anyway. I decided not to not to slip into uh, detailed modeling. I decided first of all to to make a diagram diagram of all factors that could influence the transport behavior, and then I'm just going to be uh, focused on a quantifying few of these parameters that I'm able to measure and collect from the data I'm going to describe in a minute. So I'm just going to very briefly introduce you the 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 diagram showing the, the transport um first of all we start we start with i'm going to show you by yes by the cursor we're going to start with the activity which is a type of activity time for activity and duration and also activity sorry and also activity availability which means what you're going to do where you're going to do it how you're going to get there literally then uh the model says that each of us uh cognitively think about the scenarios in our different possibilities and then access which is the most suitable or gives the biggest utility i don't always to slip in sorry which at the end of the day or at the beginning of the day i may say you're going to decide that you're going to go by tram to school then you're going to walk then you're going to then you're going to go for shopping and extra so you generate transport demands and uh, after using the transport or when using the transport you also meeting the transport supply, but your activities are not only influenced by the place where they are. They are influenced also by social economical factors, which could be uh, an environment where you are, which could be your motivation, which could be your resources, and then activities are influenced where they are. Which kind of activities are there? Uh, the typical, uh, the typical framework is to distinguish to. Uh, assistance activities which you do every day, then uh, some cares and needs which you also do every day, and then uh, optional and uh, optional activities that uh, you do you do not regularly or not every day. And according to the positional activities which you see here, which could be influenced by built environment, you influence type of activity, location, and also availability. But when you go somewhere, usually not walk or fly. So you need to know how you're going to get there. And then we get into the transport supply, which is working with the uh, technical factors like uh, transport, uh, which is like uh, commuting time, frequencies, anything which is well known as a classical transport science. But then also we've got a uh, we've got a uh, availability of the system. And a geographical the geographical uh, scale, and the last thing, but very important, is also individual subjective factors like how you feel in the transport, how uh, what's your requirement, if you feel it's safe, and etc. and etc. So, if we look at this quite com complicated diagram, my work is literally to assess the second branch, which says the location and type of activity. How does it influence? The, the how does it influence transport demand and transport supply, which are grouped together. And I'm going to control this, sorry, I'm going to control this relation by controls which are social, economic, and are also transport. My basic data I'm working with is the travel survey from TSK, 
you can see here that uh, here you can see all the journeys which uh, I'm working with. It's a uh, 3,339 journeys. Uh, you can know uh, these journeys are filtered from the bigger data set and they're concerning only those who are living in uh, suburbs. As a definition of suburbs, I used from uh, OGD Czech uh, Suburbanization Zones 2016, which you can see here, which are placed below the lines. Uh, this is a basic structure of my data. So my data are divided into two parts. The first is social economic characteristics. And uh, sorry, the first part is personal characteristics, which could be social economic characteristics or travel behavior, which says uh, which person is it, how old is it, what kind of education does it does the person has, um, which household they, they uh, he or she come from, uh, how big is the house, and etc. And then some travel behavior: if they have a car, if they have a if they have a motorcycle, and also how often they the person use. Uh, car or public transport and etc. And then we've got a data of every trip I mentioned, which I, which we have for three three thousand. And for each trip, we know which time it happened, where did it go, uh, which way, um, what was the purpose, and also um, which trans which vehicle was was used, um, how these vehicles were occupied, and etc. 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 So. What's my work in progress is that I'm, what I'm going to do is basically to use a regression modeling, which tends to have two variables, total distance traveled and to distance traveled by car. Uh, these variables, which you can see at the, at the top of the table, are independent variables and uh, should, be, should be scrutinized by independent and uh, control variables. The independent variables I'm concerned about are basically walking time to the nearest facility, which is considered, sorry, I don't know why is it this still slipping, uh, basic facilities or amenities, which are considered to be local, which is typically kindergarten, primary school, uh, post office, um, park, open landscape, and et cetera. And I'm measuring literally an uh, influence of these variables, which we can, like, which we can as, uh, as urban planners, influence if does it decrease the total length of the journey or road chair we've got a set of control variables as i mentioned before as a type of respondents uh the demographic social economic social economic backgrounds and also built environment where they are coming from i do apologize i don't know why is it still so what is the first step and was the problem i faced is that these kind of uh, variables are unsurprisingly very correlated. Uh, who has money usually use more car or tends to have, tends to have a bigger house and etc. So when I put it into a single simple regression, uh, basically it wasn't it wasn't relevant for me. So what I did now, or what is my stage now, is that I put the each branch of variables i started with the social economic characteristics into the component analysis which tells which variables tends to be grouped together and what which influence other or which is uh, it doesn't seem to be influenced so the results say if we talk about uh, if we talk about social economic variables that unsurprisingly house size and house income is uh, correlated and also a person in the household and children household. What is interesting is that uh, household and size is not correlated with the education level and also not correlated with a, with a child uh, in a house. These social economic, social, uh, uh, or social economic variables are not that interesting alone, but I will show you, I will show you in a combination with, uh, with a transport uh, variables. This is just some technical things about about uh, component analysis. Uh, what is important for me is that if we look at the variables and also if you look at the points which are representing each observation, it says that these variables are spread, which means that I've got data which are consistent and which represent each type of urbanization zone, which doesn't mean that the zone one which is closest to the Prague doesn't necessarily uh, cluster around one variable, but is evenly spread. 
if we consider travel, sorry, my time is getting, getting over. If we consider travel behavior, we see that again, and surprisingly driving license and car use is heavily correlated. What is interesting is that the public transport use is not related or it seems to be independent to car use. Uh, also, distance to crowd seems to be in a in a indirect relation to public transport use, which means further from Prague you are the uh, more public transport use. But uh, it's not correlated with the car use, which means that if you have a driving license or if you drive a car, it doesn't necessarily prevent you from using a public transport. But also it means that further you are from Prague, it doesn't mean necessarily that you have a you have a car. Yeah, there are also some uh, technical things about about uh, component analysis. Also, you can see that the data are quite evenly spread, especially if we talk about urbanization zones. And if we put all of these variables together, which decrease our which decrease our uh, components below below fifty percent, unfortunately, about the variation captured, we still can see that most groups were preserved, especially about driving license and car car use, which is also now clustered with uh, education level. And then we can see that the household size and the income is also clustered with uh, with the car's car usage. We can also see that the uh, that the public transport use is losing its uh, significance, but still it remains uncorrelated to to car usage. Uh, to car usage. Uh, distance from Prague seems to be getting uh, getting uh, insignificant, and uh, also the sex of the respondent remains insignificant or not strongly uh, not strongly significant through the all three analyses. Yes, and you can see also the the distribution again. So, my next steps literally are going to be to put into these uh, to into these group these variables or to select the uh, variables that I could combine with a uh, built environment. I'm, what I'm working on now is the quantification of built environments. Uh, uh, if you look into the abstract, I've got like table of uh, three or five D methodology, which choose the, uh, which choose the density, diversity, and uh, uh, I forgot what is the third D, but uh, these variables, which I used for such a modeling, and also categorize respondents by amenities accessibility. Uh, I would love to, according to my uh, preliminary findings, I would love to uh, do some uh, case studies, just literally to visualize data from the uh, from the data survey that I've got in a GIS. Uh, so to wrap up, I, I showed you my my framework, my research question of my thesis, my uh, diagram that I made from a literature review, which uh, which uh, shows uh, groups of factors that I'm. That I'm trying to discover or that I'm trying to research, and now the data that I'm working with and the, and the initial step of statistics that I'm working with, especially with the grouping variables of controls. That's it. Thank you very much. Questions? Yes, sir. <laughs> yes. Uh, and so, so. Uh, you, you plan to use that component analysis to select some dimensions which are uncorrelated and then use them yes. for prediction dependent variables. Yes. Another another possibility would be to use that in kind of information to segment the sample, subsamples. Hence, for example, you can the car ownership and then inside working with those some, some subsamples independent. Because I think that uh, later you will find out the same problem that you will have a correlated independent variables with the uh, uh, with the accessibility of uh, local amenities. Um, so uh, I think that uh, there will be another problem of fostering the correlation. So maybe just come up on my mind if it will be. Because when we did uh, our research with uh, hydronic prices, we also, I find out that this is very extremely, extremely fragmented uh, sample, extremely fragmented uh, characteristics of the population of the area. And the best place to segment 
just to accept the segmentation and to work with subsamples. Uh, you totally right because that, that's the same we talked with uh, Veronica and according to uh, my uh, consultation with uh, Sikura that he said that the sample is not that big that I could just use it only to is so heterogeneous so you would he also the, uh, he also recommended to to frame it or to, to 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 pick some samples which are meeting some criteria for example if I checking accessibility or measuring accessibility of kindergarten is influence on a commuting literally if the uh, respondents have no children that it would be uh, ir irrelevant for me to, to put it into the question okay uh, yes <laughs> I'm afraid <laughs> no, no 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 I uh, I think it's very nice I, I think in, in these settings, it's always also kind of like a problem of how to deal with possible selection of households mm. that you might be unable to observe some household characteristics. And because of these characteristics that you are unable to observe, they might sort into places that are more car reliant than others. So then you might overestimate the effect of the built environment itself, but because there are some types of environments that attract some types of people, but you are unable as an econometrician to observe the type of people. So I, th I think for for these settings, let, let, let's say the optimal design would be to observe amenities changing over time and having the same respondents. And let's say if locally some new amenities like shops or, or restaurants uh, start and some uh, some uh, uh, stop operating and you see differences in, in responses in behavior that would be uh, the, uh, the perfect design because because you can uh, you can take this difference over time and if each individual uh, adjusts his or her behavior based on changes of uh, immediate environment you are able to really uncover the causal causal effect otherwise I think it's it's very problematic you're right but the, the problem with that is uh, obviously time and uh, data <laughs> unsurprisingly like uh because uh the, this data were collected by tsk they've got a different data from a different times uh only for different years the thing is uh like uh I, I, we, we had a discussion about year ago about it uh, the first problem is it's about path dependency that uh, perhaps could be very strong and the time frame that pe there should be much bigger than two years, let's say, because when you build a new facility, you know, it takes a long time or there is an assumption that it takes some time that the locals start using it or etc. The second thing is a, is, a, is a data usage. Anyway, uh, my, my initial or like the thing I'm going to work with is that I suppose that the built environment also, of course, this data is heavily selective, but maybe I could just use, you know, the preliminary results from regression to test it on a case study that I could describe more, I wouldn't say qualitatively, but not only on a, on a hard regression that I put everything together, if you, if you, if you get my point. Yeah, maybe uh, just to comment on it, uh, it's true that there is a, also like if you, if you would like to stick like to hard econometrics, there is an approach of uh, instrumental variables that you would try to find some other variable that is a good predictor of amenities being located uh, uh, in areas, but they are uncorrelated with this uh, residential choice. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and then there is a second thing. It's true that this, it, 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 I've seen several papers that argue maybe for, for these purposes, it's not necessarily important to find out the causal effect. It's still very interesting to see association that if you create these better served neighborhoods, there, there is a demand uh, existing and people are going to just travel less. And that's a, that's an important finding by itself. Mm -hmm. And it's not necessarily have to be perfectly causal estimations. I understand. Okay. I'm afraid we are already uh, over time. So uh, thank you very much for your question. I'm just going to check if there is no online question. There is no. So thank you very much for your questions. And uh, let's have like 10 minutes uh, coffee break and then we will have last two presentations. Okay. Thank you.
Okay, uh, it's time to just start last two presentations. So, love to welcome Shimon from uh, Wood. He, he came to to join us uh, in person, and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Let's see. Okay, thank you. Uh, hello, my name is Shimon Wojcik, and uh, I represent the uh, a field of econometrics. But uh, in order to get my PhD a couple of years ago, I decided to hop in into the uh, field of uh, transport studies. And uh, well, I'm still there. And uh, today I would like to share with you uh, the outcomes of my recent studies regarding uh, travel behavior and um, air quality, but through the lenses of multilevel uh, analysis. Um, my research objective uh, uh, is to identify the uh, travel behavior um, proxied by uh, typical travel mode choice uh, with the uh, particular uh, focus on um, the factors uh, related to air quality. Uh, and the uh, idea is to, um, to conduct it uh, internationally. So I uh, consider a um, couple of uh, European cities. Um, the, the research agenda uh, consists of four uh, main uh, steps. Uh, first of all, uh, I wanted to compare the different uh, approach to uh, air quality measurement. So I have uh, perceived air quality declared by the respondents and the uh, actual air quality measured uh, with PM10 emission uh, levels. Uh, according to the method, uh, I wanted to include the uh, local homogeneity to my models. Uh, so uh, mm, I analyzed whether um, living in the particular city itself mm, affects the uh, travel mode choices. Uh, I conducted this analysis separately for three different uh, travel modes, main, uh, namely car, bike, and public transport. And uh, I wanted to identify the, uh, the, uh, also the relationships between perceived noise levels and uh, public uh, transport characteristics. Uh, the um, literature regarding uh, determinants of uh, travel behavior is quite broad, and so uh, we can say that uh, uh, this, these factors are, can be grouped into uh, four, uh, four levels, four, uh, four main groups. Uh, the first one is very common, uh, social demographic factors. Uh, typically, these are the mm, control variables in regression models. So. Uh, nothing fancy here. Uh, some studies uh, are focused uh, more on spatial factors. Um, in my case, uh, it was not uh, uh, available uh, due to the uh, data I, uh, I utilize. Um, Social psychological factors are uh, are the group which is uh, uh, difficult to be to be measured, uh, but. Um, I, uh, I consider the perceptions regarding or the um, assessments regarding the noise levels and uh, ambient air quality. And if we are uh, capable of uh, analyzing uh, the data at trip level, uh, we can uh, include trip characteristics. Uh, in my case, uh, it was not possible because uh, I don't analyze, I don't have the data regarding the trips themselves. Uh, if it's about the air quality and travel behavior. Uh, there are some uh, recent studies presented here. Um, as I looked through the, the literature, I noticed that it's mainly related uh, to uh, leisure traveling, uh, not strictly uh, commuting. Uh, these first two studies are related to, to tourism uh, mainly. Uh, sometimes the, uh, um, the researchers are focused on very specific groups of uh, of people. For example, in this uh, Rodriguez uh, study, uh, they analyzed the uh, people with uh, particular diseases. Uh, the third, um, uh, the, the fourth studies, uh, study uh, presented here uh, is more related to the reverse 
situation, whether uh, in which uh, mobility uh, decisions, mode choices uh, affect air pollution, not the air pollution affecting the, the choices like in my uh, idea. And uh, I think the study which is uh, the most uh, um, similar to my approach where the air pollution is a regressor in the in econometric model uh, considers travel distance and travel area uh, as the travel behavior uh, measure. So it is not the mode choice study. Uh, so I think that there is still a, uh, a space in the uh, in the literature to be uh, filled, and uh, uh, I hope that my findings uh, can uh, do this. Uh, if it's about the the data, I utilize the uh, publicly available data from uh, quality of life uh, perception survey. This data, uh, this uh, this survey was conducted uh, in, by European uh, Commission in 2019. Uh, we have the data regarding uh, 83 European uh, cities, uh, representative samples around 700 respondents per city, which gives me roughly. Uh, nearly uh, 50,000 uh, observations in estimation sample, which is uh, quite good for regression model. Uh, and in order to capture this effect of uh, air quality, I merged this, uh, this database um, regarding quality of life with the data provided by World, uh, World Health Organization uh, regarding the uh, air pollution measured with a PM10, uh, uh, which is the annual mean concentration of particulate uh, matter less than 10 microns. And uh, it's worth noting that these data uh, are not um, timely um, similar. The, uh, the majority of data is from 2016, but still uh, the, uh, these are the only data uh, I'm aware of which measure the uh, um, ambient, door, uh, ambient outdoor air pollution at, uh, at the city level, and it's publicly uh, available for all the cities I consider. Uh, here we can see that uh, this uh, uh, ambient air pollution is uh, fairly diverse. Uh, the, the most uh, polluted cities are the uh, cities from Turkey mainly, uh, and uh, the less polluted uh, from the British islands uh, and also Tallinn here. Uh, Praga is somewhere in the in the middle. Uh, and if it's about my dependent variables, uh, in the proxy for travel behavior in my study is the um, is the share of people who uh, typically declare that the uh, private car, uh, public uh, transport or bike is their uh, most often uh, daily choice uh, for commuting. And we can see that uh, the, the share of respondents who use cars uh, is uh, very high in uh, Malta, Cyprus, Lithuania, Portugal, uh, and the, the lowest levels uh, observed uh, in uh, Switzerland, UK. Uh, Norway, but I would like you to, to pay uh, you to pay the attention for the differences between the cities within the country. For example, Copenhagen had a very low level of uh, car use, but Hamburg, which is also in Denmark, had this 50% of share. So the differences uh, can be uh, can be uh, high. If it's about the public transport. Uh, well, the highest share uh, of public transport use is visible uh, for the citizens of Prague. Uh, and uh, as far as I know, the Prague was uh, was said to have the second best uh, public transport system in the world, uh, in, the, in some magazines. Um, but uh, still we have uh, France, uh, Sweden and, um, uh, and Austria at the uh, at the highest top levels of public transport usage, uh, low levels in uh, North Macedonia, in Albania, in uh, Iceland, uh, Montenegro. And last but not the least, uh, biking, uh, obviously a high uh, share of bike usage in Netherlands, Denmark, then Sweden, 
uh, it's good. It's, it's going to be an expected course. Uh, if it's about my uh, my method, uh, as the data are grouped within the city, people peoples are grouped uh, um, within the city. I uh, decided to utilize uh, multi-level uh, binary logic model, uh, where my dependent variable uh, states whether someone uses car uh, as the most often. Um, mode of transport or not uses uh, trans public transport or not, or uses bike or not. Uh, I cannot merge these uh, three categories together, so I uh, decided to uh, conduct three separate analyses for every uh, mode of transport. Uh, and the choice of multi-level uh, approach uh, allowed uh, me to consider random intercept or in the, each and every city, which um, gives us some insight to this local uh, homogeneity, which I mentioned at the beginning. And these are, uh, these are the outcomes of the uh, regression uh, I, uh, I conducted. Uh, the first part um, from, the, from the beginning uh, until here, these are typically control variables, not very uh, interesting, but in line with the literature. Uh, the most important regressors for me are these uh, satisfactions with uh, air quality and uh, noise level, for example. And as you can see, the satisfaction with air quality significantly determines uh, the choice of car. The, the better uh, the uh, ambient air quality perceived by the respondents, uh, the higher chances uh, to use uh, the car on a daily basis uh, for public transport and we observe negative relationship, but uh, it is statistically insignificant. Uh, also, noise level uh, seem to be not the uh, important predictor here. But please note that these are the perceived uh, air qualities and noise uh, levels. Uh, Satisfaction of public transport uh, seems to negatively influence uh, the uh, the car use. So people who are satisfied 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 with public transport, they tend to uh, use it uh, on a daily basis. And uh, people uh, who claim that accessibility uh, is um, important uh, trait and they are satisfied satisfied with this accessibility, uh, they tend to and choose public transport on a daily basis more. And uh, if the, they um, claim that the reliability of public transportation is, uh, is good, they uh, tend to uh, quit the uh, or um, quit the car uh, usage or simply have the uh, uh, lower probability to, to choose a car on a daily basis. And uh, last but not the least, uh, the most important uh, variables for me is the um, emission level actually measured. And uh, opposite to the outcome of this uh, perceived air uh, quality, it seems that if the emission uh, PM10 emissions uh, level goes up, people tend to use public uh, transportation more likely, and they are less likely to uh, use bike, which could have been expected, uh, because the bikers are the most uh, prone to the ambient air inhalation, and uh, it's, uh, it seems that it's uh, statistically does not matter for the choice of cars. So we observe that uh, the way we try to uh, proxy air quality and me uh, or measure air quality uh, significantly affects the uh, our outcomes. Uh, here we obtain very different outcomes from the, uh, if we take the actual measurement and uh, if we compare it with the rough opinion of, of the respondents, the, just their feelings. And as I said uh, before, my, uh, my method allows me to analyze the uh, local homogeneity. So these, these random effects uh, can be interpreted as the um, rising or decreasing uh, probability 
uh, stemming from being the uh, inhabitant of a particular city. So we can see that uh, living in Oulu, Palermo, Reykjavik, Braga positively stimulates the uh, choice of car while um, being uh, the uh, citizen of Copenhagen, Amsterdam, Groningen, and Stockholm uh, reduces it. And the Prague is uh, also in this uh, negative tendency to pictures uh, to choose car. If it's about the public transport, we can see that that's the, the best outcomes for, for this, uh, the, the, the highest stimulants uh, are in, uh, visible in uh, Bucharest, London, Istanbul, and Sofia. Um, Praga also with this uh, positive part here. And if it's about biking, uh, it is not very surprising that we observe uh, strong positive effects in this uh, Copenhagen, Amsterdam, in London, exceptionally positive and it, it could have been expected. And just to conclude my presentation, uh, I would like to sum up with the findings that uh, we should measure the accurate, uh, we should use the most accurate measures of the uh, air quality if, uh, if we can, in order to uh, model the, uh, its influence on travel behavior. It, it plays an uh, important role, especially for public transport and bike choice. Uh, in this perceived air quality noise level uh, also perceived, and this, this significance is, uh, is not so high. And uh, we, we should also consider the satisfaction with uh, the quality of public transport. And uh, this local homogeneity uh, is is also an uh, important part, should be an important part of travel behavior analysis. Well, I think that's fantastic. Thank you. Thank you very much for interesting presentations. And uh, now it's a uh, place for questions. So, yes, I saw you. <laughs> Sorry, your face before you raise your hand. <laughs> so, uh, I, I just would like to ask one thing. Uh, maybe it's not a real issue, but uh, maybe uh, I think it might be discussed whether there isn't a concern of reverse causality between PM10 and uh, car or public transport usage, because because it's it's really hard to distinguish like like whether one is driving uh, the other or vice versa. Yes, yes, uh, this is the issue I'm struggling with uh, to uh, some somehow uh, explain that uh, the oh, in a, in other words, how to um, account it in my model, uh, I consider seeking for some instruments, but it's really hard to find any clues in, in the literature how to do it properly. But still, thank you for this uh, for, for raising this issue because it's uh, really, really important. Uh, I'm open to, to all suggestions if, uh, if, if it's about these this instruments here. I think we can discuss it later because I do have some ideas. Maybe it might be interesting That's to discuss it later. Great. Right. That's the reason why I <laughs> like the program. <laughs> yeah, and why why we here. So is it okay now to discuss? Yeah. It? Good. We have a question from Tanya, who is the not the only one. Okay, Tanya and Martin are only two people who uh, remains. Uh, so place yourself for your question. Uh, yes, it goes into the same direction about uh, because I was also surprised that the satisfactory with air travel like is positively correlated with car use or with uh, choosing the car. Um, yes, if you go back, yeah, perfect, thank you. Um, because I mean, at first it's it's a bit contradictive, but then maybe I mean, where do you have like where are people satisfied with air quality it's maybe like in residential areas which are not very dense which are maybe a bit uh, further outside of the city center or something and then those are also those people who we know are very car dependent so maybe this is why they chose to choose the car so i'm also like i think yes you have to be really careful about the causality here um and the same then also with the uh, the measured um Emission, uh, emissions that they um, positively correlate with uh, public transport use. Yeah, well, this could also be because public transport coverage is better in city centers where you have worse air quality. 
and this is why people use public transport, not because it's not as a direct effect of the um, like pollution in the air. So it's, it, I'm also struggling to find a way to, to solve this issue, but it's uh, it's there, and I think you have to be really careful there. Yes, yes, of course. Uh, um, the problem is that uh, the data uh, I utilize uh, does not give me any information about the special distribution of respondents. Uh, I don't have uh, uh, the, any information regarding the district uh, where they live. Uh, so it is really hard to, uh, to account for this uh, special density you mentioned. But uh, still, uh, we've got what we've got. And these are only uh, data which are uh, available for so many cities. And uh, I totally agree with you that uh, we have to be careful with the interpretation of this outcome. And I have to be careful with stating very, um, uh, very strong um, conclusions regarding them. Thank you for this comment. Okay. Uh, good. Any, any more questions? No. I just commented on the two persons who remained online. <laughs> so. If no questions, thank you very much. Thank you. And now we're going to ask Tanya <laughs> in revenge to, to present her <laughs> presentation, which is the last presentation. Still, you have Martin, who is uh, watching your life. <laughs> so you have at least uh, 10 of us here, so so you definitely are presenting for for end of the room. So floor is yours, 15 minutes, right? Yeah. Thank yeah, you. thank you. Um... Last but not least, and uh, it's nice to know that I still have some audience. <laughs> um, I'm Tanja Scheffler. I'm a PhD student at uh, the Norwegian University of Science and Technology, or also known as NTNU in Trondheim. So I'm here in Norway. Um, and I'm also part of the research project, um, the Research Center for Zero Emission Neighborhoods in Smart Cities, or uh, short SEN, here at our university. Um, today, I want to talk about what I titled uh, the role of energy and transport related built environment characteristics in residential location choice. It's sort of a like first insight into uh, or some first results from the study that I'm doing for my PhD. Um, so yeah, I'm, without further ado, I'm going to jump right into it. So what's the motivation to look at it? Um, yeah, our biggest uh, motivation here uh, for our also overarching research project is uh, to reduce global emissions uh, with um, designing um, sustainable neighborhoods. Um, and if you we look at uh, global emissions, we can see that on uh, a laser pointer, perfect, uh, households account for about two thirds of uh, global emissions or um, two thirds of the global emissions can be attributed to somewhat household uh, consumption categories. And 33% uh, are linked to uh, mobility or to shelter, uh, either directly or indirectly. So why do I point exactly those out? It's because those emission categories are linked to where you live, to your residential location. Um, because um, the home is where you consume energy, where uh, where you like, yes, you heat your home, um, you have light on, you use appliances, you cook, etc. Um, and the home is also starting point for uh, travel. Um, and we also do know that um, built environment characteristics impact both energy consumption and travel behavior. On the side of energy consumption, for example, the spaciousness uh, on uh, how many square meters you live. Uh, the type of dwelling that you live in, energy efficiency of your dwelling, etc. And on the side of travel, um, how close you live to your destinations, which uh, modes are available. Then uh, also those uh, three to seven Ds uh, that uh, exist um, that we also heard uh, sometimes today. So in other words, by choosing a dwelling or a residential location, households predetermine their carbon footprint to a certain degree for the future. So it's very important to um, look at those aspects and how much households actually consider um, yeah, those built environment characteristics that's la that later impact their uh, carbon footprint when they choose a residential location. A little bit of background on residential location choice. Um, 
in residential location choice models, uh, there are various uh, characteristics that are regarded. Um, for example, um, characteristics of the residential unit itself, then build environment measures um, of the neighborhood or the uh, yeah broader surrounding, which are mostly related to transport because uh, transport or transport research is uh, yeah looking also a lot into residential location choice. Um, then we have the proximity to points of interest and also socioeconomic household and location characteristics. Uh, among those, um, the proximity to points of interest have uh, interestingly been found to be like uh, the least influential on residential location choice, uh, at least when you compare it to the others. Uh, one other factor that uh, one has to consider is the role of the previous residence where you lived before. And this is uh, studied to a lesser extent, but um, there are tendencies that households move within a or with a spatial bias based on their former residence, that they, for example, uh, tend to stay relatively close to their former residence, that they move in a certain angle between their former residence and their workplace, uh, such things. Um, and then their um, research has also found a sort of loss aversion, for example, uh, regarding the number of bedrooms and open areas in their neighborhood. So people don't want to downgrade in those categories. Mm, so what is the research gap? What I want to look at um, today is that the role of energy related characteristics in location choice is understudied compared to transport related characteristics because transport re research has looked much more into uh, location choice than uh, research on energy consumption behavior. Um, then the role of the previous residential location has been studied only to a limited extent, uh, yet um, like looking in, into location choice always um, in relation to the previous residence can give further insight into some self-selection mechanisms. Um, and then thirdly, transport and energy related characteristics, they are not independent. So, for example, um, when you go further out from the city center, you have less density, which is um, influential on uh, travel behavior, but also comes along with different dwelling types um, and square meters per person, which is very influential on the energy consumption. So it's uh, like if one wants to look into how the residential location affects um, household emissions, we have to sort of combine those aspects. Um, so the research questions uh, that I pose today is uh, to what extent does the rated importance of energy and transport related build environment characteristics influence the residential location choice regarding those characteristics? Um, so the rated importance, how does it uh, impact the characteristic at the new residence? And the second one, to what extent does the previous residential location and its characteristics have an additional influence on the residential location choice? Mm -hmm. For my study uh, or for my whole PhD study, I'm collecting data in the uh, extended Trondheim region. Um, so where I'm at also now today, it's in uh, middle Norway, um, where um, I contacted households that recently acquired residential property and invited them to a quantitative online survey. At the moment, my sample contains 333 um, relocating households in the Trondheim region. Um, we, I have quite a uh, broad share of where they come from and where they moved to. Um, and my results are a bit um, preliminary because um, the data collection is still running. So I'm still hoping to increase my uh, sample. Um, as I mentioned before, this is part of a bigger study that I'm doing uh, where I'm looking into how uh, much um, the travel behavior and energy consumption changes with relocation. And then I'm also including an intervention later. But the data today is only taken from my first questionnaire because the others uh, are sort of uh, coming um, as the next steps. Um, uh, I'm looking uh, today uh, at uh, some uh, multivariate uh, regression analysis and as dependent variables, um, so I have six models and as dependent variables, I have chosen, chosen three that are related to energy consumption and three that are related to travel behavior. Um, related to energy consumption, I've chosen the dwelling type uh, as a binary variable, whether you live in an apartment or some type of house, um, detached house, row house, semi-detached house, um, and so on. 
and then the energy standard of the dwelling um, that you would or that people choose, whether it's a good energy standard uh, rated between A and C or a bad energy standard between D and G. Um, and then the floor area per person as a continuous variable. Uh, and regarding transport, I'm looking into whether um, the chosen dwelling has an included parking spot, um, whether it's close to public transport uh, stops within five minutes walking distance, and then um, the distance to the city center, again, as a continuous variable. Mm. As, as independent as variables, I have the level of the same characteristic at the former residence where they moved from, and additionally, the rated importance of those characteristics that I mentioned, um, which they rated on a scale of one to seven in the questionnaire. Um, the first are very like closely linked to actually also the characteristics for the distance to the city center. Um, I have uh, chosen three to look into the rated importance of proximity to the city center, proximity to open nature and the workplace. Why I did this, I will uh, show you in a second in my results. Um, but first, I want to look into my four logistic regression models and the results. Um, so here you can see my one, two, three, four models. Um, and uh, I always have those two predictors, once the rated uh, or above the rated importance and below whether you had the same characteristic at your old, old residential location. And what you can see is that, for example, for dwelling types and um, the people who choose an apartment, they um, significantly rated the importance of dwelling type lower. So they definitely had, like when they said a uh, dwelling type is important to me, they had rather some uh, like a, some, a detached house, for example, in mind. Um, and whether you lived in an apartment or house before didn't have an additional impact. <laughs> then for the energy standard, whether you choose a house with a good energy standard, it's both the rated importance, but also whether you lived in a house with a good energy standard before or not. That is significant or um, for the um, probability or here reported the odds ratios of um, choosing a location with good energy standard. Mm. For parking spot at the dwelling, it's the same. It's also like whether you rate it high and also whether you had it before. That is significantly influential. And for uh, whether you live close to public transport here, it was only whether you lived close to public transport before and the rating didn't have an additional uh, significant effect. Um, if I now go further to my two uh, linear regression models, the first one here is uh, the floor area model. Um, I had to uh, log transform the floor area to fulfill some model assumptions. So the estimates themselves are a bit hard to interpret. But what one can see is that also the importance of the usable floor area for the people in the location choice and also the floor area per person before relocation are both uh, significantly positively um, uh, associated with um, the floor area per person later, which can also be seen here where I um, retransformed and predicted um, the floor area per person after relocation. And it goes uh, both up with uh, rated importance and with how spacious you lived um, before relocation. Mm -hmm. uh, it looks uh, quite differently for um, the mm -hmm. distance to the city center here. Um, yes, uh, here you can see the distance to the city center before relocation. This is uh, positively associated. Um, here, by the way, I had to do a square root trans uh, transformation. So again, inter interpreting the estimates is not very easy, but um, we can look at the significance. And yes, people who did live further out of the city center also tend to live uh, further out um, after the relocation. Yet um, the rated importance of the proximity to the city center is not significant. Also not whether they re rated important to live close to open nature. But what was significant is whether they rated it important to live close to their workplace. So this actually impacted uh, the location choice. And we also did find um, um, a moderation effect, which was um, significant, uh, which shows that uh, for those people who lived um, further out before relocation and rate um, workplace proximity as very important, um, they tend to move uh, closer to the city center. Um, while those people who uh, are already live quite close to the city center 
um, they are not impacted by this rated um, importance of proximity to the workplace. So, yes. Um, yes. <laughs> Um, I think I will, uh, yeah, directly um, jump to what I think we can conclude from this. Um, we do find uh, strong self-selection effects for both energy and travel-related characteristics because for almost all of the um, characteristics that I looked into, um, the rated importance or the higher people rated the importance of this characteristic, the um, more likely they were to um, also, yeah, have this characteristic later or have um, yeah higher floor area, etc. Except for the uh, dwelling type, no, there was no except for the um, public transport proximity and for um, the distance to the city center. But here we did find that the proximity to the workplace, uh, whether you find this important, is um, a significant predictor then uh, we can also see that all characteristics uh, except for the dwelling type are significantly related to the former residents. Uh, so you sort of uh, judge um, or make your residential location decision based on what you had before and also tend to stick to what you had before, mm -hmm. uh, which shows that self-selection is sort of a multifaceted um, phenomenon uh, which does not only depend on what you say is important for you, uh, but also what you experienced earlier. So we have a, a sort of um, very um, active choice, but also sort of maybe a more subconscious choice um, what you experienced before in your residential uh, environment. Mm -hmm. um, so as I said, this is uh, like preliminary, um, just like some first variables that I looked into. Um, some limitations uh, that I know are uh, included in this is that um, firstly the importance ratings they were queried after the residential location choice was already made. So I do have a sort of self-report bias. People might uh, sort of um, yeah just maybe justify almost their residential location choice by saying that this like what they now have was important for them sort of to self-justify. Um, and also some of my models, I didn't look at, uh, like uh, pointed out in the results, but some do have quite a low model fit, which indicates that the, there is uh, an absence of very important predictors, uh, for example, socioeconomic predictors. Uh, so if I look into what I want to do further is for sure in, look into socioeconomic predictors, both for the importance ratings and for the location choice. So which households uh, are, is it uh, that uh, make certain choices and rate certain uh, characteristics high? Uh, then I also want to explore the interrelationship among the examined characteristics. As I said before, um, like dwelling type and floor area, they are very much correlated with the distance to the city center. So um, take this into account as well. Um, and also uh, then as a next step, as I said, um, I'm also querying their um, travel behavior and energy consumption before and after the relocation. So actually look whether a change in those characteristics also induced a change in um, the emission level. Yes. Mm -hmm. So this was uh, everything from my side. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and now I'm happy to uh, hear your questions. Thank you, Tanya. Mm -hmm. Last set of questions for the last person. Mm -hmm. yeah, good morning. Very typical for uh, those uh, relocation household relocation uh, housing choice studies is uh, that uh, they are made on, on the level of households, but then we run into the problems because we have uh, two uh, employed uh, household members which are working in different places how they decide. So you operationalize, uh, you operationalize it uh, in terms of uh, having one head of household. Uh, and in regard to the another one, right? Um, I did ask how many of the household members do have a job, and uh, then also um, like the proximity, like like this rated proximity to the workplace, uh, how important it is. I rated it for both uh, 
household members if they are uh, two earners and also like the travel behavior i also queried for all the household members of course you always have one who sort of reports for the others so it's a bit biased as well but i'm trying to take this into account i'm just not sure yet how in this residential location choice model i'm going to do this but i'm very aware of that that it's like not one uh like most of the time not one workplace that is uh, considered in those choice models Mm -hmm. okay. um, I'm, uh, first, uh, I support uh, your intentions to consider also social economic factors. And I uh, think that they can uh, respond to um, the logic question to which extent the inertia of choice is being often using, uh, to which extent this voluntary or is uh, determined by separate by social and uh, economic situation with us. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. yep. Yeah, that's very true. I really have to take this into account, especially income, because I mean, you can't afford every dwelling that is on the market and that you might want to have. Yep, that's very true. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Lukasz Markowski, uh, I would like to ask because I, I think you did not mention it, but I think it's possible with the structure of your data, if it's possible, uh, because there is a lot of self-selection as you uh, as you've shown. If you can just comment, it it would be very informative to show how much of a res residential choice variation is explained by the self-selection, like to to what extent self-selection is actually driving uh, a residential choice. Mm -hmm. I can try to navigate back in my slides, um, mm -hmm. especially here um, in the logistic regression models, you can see that um, here for like the dwelling type, my model fit is quite poor, but for example, for the energy standard, it's like surprisingly high and the same for like the closest to public transport. Again, for the parking spot, it's uh, rather low. So yes, it is um, true that like the self-selection also does uh, only explain a certain share and also very different share in my in the different models. Yeah. If this is what you refer to. Yeah, um, yeah, 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 yeah. On one hand, uh, this is informative, but uh, I was wondering because there might be some other issues that are not measurable by econometrician. So I was wondering if you, if it's, it would be possible to compare, let's say, root regression with this uh, model that includes past decision, because there might be many things about preferences for specific amenities that you are unable to measure. So, so to provide like overall difference between, let's say, pooled model and uh, model controlling for uh, for a household uh, 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 preferences. Mm, yeah, I mean, it's a bit, yeah, it's difficult. Like, I'm not quite sure which uh, additional um, like characteristics you refer to. Yeah, uh, it, I, I, I. I I can imagine like a lot of things like a specific types of amenities, like particular either specific park or it might be some some types of shopping. So mm -hmm. I, I don't know that there, there, I can imagine there might be like a lot of other features that uh, uh, households uh, uh, do consider in their in their utility function and they are yeah. like not not observable. I do have uh, like a broader list of those uh, preferences, so not only proximity to workplace, but also like to, yes, um, uh, grocery shopping, other shops, uh, etc. So I can definitely look into that. That's, uh, that's true. And also how often they um, visited uh, certain um, points of interest. And what I'm also like um, very happy to have is really like the exact location where they where they moved to. So I can definitely look into like with uh, GIS also in, in more measures um, that they might not have reported upon, but that I can look into um, in, in Trondheim and where they moved there. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Mm. Good. No more questions. <laughs> Good. Tanya, thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you. Uh, so, yes. 
so we got to the end of the program so i'm gonna ask the world to say a final word and uh then we free to go where we want <laughs> no i think that the final horse will be sent by uh Jan, my thumbs up and uh, i will just uh, try to make some very short uh, summary because i think that this conference was very interesting it was first one and it was very interesting therefore maybe i don't know uh there is no clear general theory of course that there is a virus uh, various questions various approaches they are mostly explorative and mostly correlational but very corrupted in uh, trying to find search correlations with uh, many different environmental variables spatial distribution of activities uh, and build actually the characteristics of build build up areas so it's uh it's, it's very very interesting that we are searching a uh, kind of open mind uh, search mm -hmm. there is a tendency to activity-based approaches that uh, regards the transport activities to be organic part of our activity chains that's another Thing that I that I expected personally, but uh, I I just confirmed my my expectations. Very interesting findings, at least for me, was that the the uh, transport activities had uh, some intrinsic uh, values, uh, as was uh, presented with our second uh, uh, keynote speaker. That uh, approaches are mostly actor centered; they focusing on behavior, on behavior research which uh, is really related to activity-based approach, activity-based approach and behavior research is very close to each other, of course. Mm -hmm. There is a tendency to individual approaches, uh, which is uh, logic because there is uh, abundance of data and there will be more and more data. So probably this is the tendency that will, people will expect and this, this will help us to, to uh, go you know, to reflect the individual context and the individual characteristics of people and to get closer to uh, maybe to review, to review some questions, uh, to get some, uh, answers to some questions. And also it was surprising for me that re revealing power of qualitative ethnographic approaches, we had uh, two or three, three uh, interesting presentations, which uh, especially uh, shows us that the transport activities creates new types of social interactions, but uh, maybe it does not overlap with this, uh, this normal general definition of public space, but it is a kind of public space or space for public interaction that creates some specific interactions and they are also work of, uh, of uh, research and study. So those are my conclusions. I mean, uh, those conferences are especially about knowledge transfer, which is individual, of course. So we will make your own conclusions. So uh, the materials will be posted on uh, our web page. Uh, maybe Honza will tell us some more about that, so uh, more details. So it's uh, open for you. We are, we are also available for you. Please, please contact us uh, if, you, if you need. And I hope that this conference is in your um, mental map so that you will go back to us in one year and uh, you are allowed, of course, to present your work again, show us your advances, or just to uh, join us. So thank you very much. Thank you.